Introduction and Preface of Human, All Too Human, A Book for Free Spirits, Part 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Aaron Rivera. Human, All Too Human, A Book for Free Spirits, Part 1, by Friedrich Nietzsche. Translated by Helen Zimmern. Introduction and Preface Introduction Nietzsche's essay, Richard Wagner in Bayreuth, appeared in 1876, and his next publication was his present work, which was issued in 1878. A comparison of the books will show that the two years of meditation intervening had brought about a great change in Nietzsche's views, his style of expressing them, and the form in which they were cast. The Dionysian, overflowing with life, gives way to an Apollonian thinker with a touch of pessimism. The long essay form is abandoned, and instead we have a series of aphorisms, some tinged with melancholy, others with satire, several, especially towards the end, with Nietzschean wit at its best, and a few at the beginning so very abstruse as to require careful study. Since the Bayreuth festivals of 1876, Nietzsche had gradually come to see Wagner as he really was, the ideal musician that Nietzsche had pictured in his own mind turned out to be nothing more than a rather dilettante philosopher, an opportunistic decadent with a suspicious tendency toward Christianity. The young philosopher thereupon proceeded to shake off the influence which the musician had exercised upon him. He was successful in doing so, but not without a struggle, just as he had formerly shaken off the influence of Schopenhauer. Hence, he writes in his autobiography, footnote, Eke Homo, page 75. Human All Too Human is the moment of a crisis. It is entitled, A Book for Free Spirits, and almost every line in it represents a victory. In its pages, I freed myself from everything foreign to my real nature. Idealism is foreign to me. The title says, Where you see ideal things, I see things which are only. Human, alas, all too human. I know man better. The term, free spirit, must here be understood in no other sense than this, a freed man, who has once more taken possession of himself. The form of this book will be better understood when it is remembered that at this period, Nietzsche was beginning to suffer from stomach trouble and headaches. As a cure for his complaints, he spent his time in travel when he could get a few weeks respite from his duties at Basel University and it was in the course of his solitary walks and hill-climbing tours that the majority of these thoughts occurred to him and were jotted down there and then. A few of them, however, date further back, as he tells us in the preface to the second part of this work. Many of them, he says, occupied his mind even before he published his first book, The Birth of Tragedy, and several others, as we learn from his notebooks and posthumous writings, date from the period of the Thoughts Out of Season. It must be clearly understood, however, that Nietzsche's disease must not be looked upon in the same way as that of an ordinary man. People are inclined to regard a sick man as rancorous. But anyone who writes with and conquers his disease and even exploits it, as Nietzsche did, benefits thereby to an extraordinary degree. In the first place, he has passed through several stages of human psychology with which a healthy man is entirely unacquainted e.g., he has learnt by introspection the spiteful and revengeful spirit of the sick man in his religion. Secondly, in his moments of freedom from pain and gloom, his thoughts will be all the more brilliant. In support of this last statement, one instance may be selected out of hundreds that could be abduced. Heinrich Heine spent the greater part of his life in exile from his native country, tortured by headaches, and finally dying in a foreign land as the result of a spinal disease. His splendid works were composed in his moments of respite from illness, and during the last years of his life, when his health was at its worst, he gave the world his famous Romancero. We would likewise do well to recollect Goethe's saying, Zart geitich wie Regenbogen, wird nun auf dunkeln Grün gesogen. Footnote 2 Tender poetry, like rainbows, can appear only on a dark and somber background. J. M. Kennedy Translation Thus neither the form of this book, so startling at first to those who have been brought up in the traditions of our own school, nor the treat all men as equals, and proclaim the establishments of equal rights, 
So far as a socialistic mode of thought which is based on justice is possible, but as has been said, only within the ranks of the governing classes, which in this case practices justice with sacrifices and abnegations. On the other hand, to demand equality of rights, as do the socialists of the subject caste, is by no means the outcome of justice, but covetousness. If you expose bloody pieces of flesh to a beast, and then withdraw them again until it finally begins to roar, do you think that the roaring implies justice? Theologians, on the other hand, as may be expected, will find no such ready help in their difficulties from Nietzsche. They must, on the contrary, be on their guard against so alert an adversary, a duty which they are apparently not going to shirk, for theologians are amongst the most ardent students of Nietzsche in this country. Their attention may therefore be drawn to aphorism 630 of this book, dealing with convictions in their origin, which will no doubt be successfully refuted by the defenders of the true faith. In fact, there is not a single paragraph in the book that does not deserve careful study by all serious thinkers. On the whole, however, this is a calm book, and those who are accustomed to Nietzsche, the outspoken immoralist, may be somewhat astonished at the calm tone of the present volume. The explanation is that Nietzsche was now just beginning to walk on his own philosophical path. His lifelong aim, the uplifting of the type of man, was still in view, but the way leading towards it was once more uncertain. Hence, the peculiarly calm, even melancholic, and what Nietzsche himself would call Apollonian tinge of many of these aphorisms, so different from the style of his earlier and later writings. For this very reason, however, the book may appeal all the more to English readers, who are of course more Apollonian than Dionysian. Nietzsche is feeling his way, and these aphorisms represent his first steps. As such, besides having a high intrinsic value of themselves, they are enormous aid to the study of his character and temperament. J. M. Kennedy Preface 1. I have been told frequently, and always with great surprise, that there is something common and distinctive in all my writings, from The Birth of Tragedy to the latest published Prelude to a Philosophy of the Future. They all contain, I have been told, snares and nets for unwary birds, and an almost perpetual unconscious demand for the inversion of customary valuations and valued customs. What? Everything, only human all too human. People lay down my writings with this sigh, not without a certain dread and distrust of morality itself, indeed almost tempted and encouraged to become advocates of the worst things, as being perhaps only the best disparaged? My writings have been called a school of suspicion, and especially of disdain. More happily, also, a school of courage, and even of audacity. Indeed, I myself do not think that anyone has ever looked at the world with such a profound suspicion, and not only as occasional devil's advocate, but equally also, to speak theologically, as enemy and impeacher of God. And he who realizes something of the consequences involved in every profound suspicion, something of the chills and anxieties of loneliness to which every uncompromising difference of outlook condemns him who is affected therewith, will also understand how often I sought shelter in some kind of reverence or hostility, or scientificality, or levity or stupidity, in order to recover from myself and, as it were, to obtain temporary self-forgetfulness. Also why, when I did not find what I needed, I was obliged to manufacture it, to counterfeit and to imagine it in a suitable manner. And what else have poets ever done? And for what purpose has all the art in the world existed? What I always required most, however, for my cure and self-recovery, was the belief that I was not isolated in such circumstances, that I did not see in an isolated manner. A magical suspicion of relationship and similarity to others in outlook and desire, a repose in the confidence of friendship, a blindness in both parties without suspicion or note of interrogation, an enjoyment of foregrounds and surfaces of the near and the nearest, of all that has color, epidermis, and outside appearance. Perhaps I might be reproached in this respect for much art and find false coinage. For instance, for voluntarily and knowingly shutting my eyes to Schopenhauer's blind will to morality at a time when I had become sufficiently clear-sighted about morality. Also, for deceiving myself about Richard Wagner's incurable romanticism, 
as if it were a beginning and not an end. Also about the Greeks, also about the Germans and their future. And there would still probably be quite a long list of such alsos. Supposing, however, that this were all true and that I were reproached with good reason. What do you know? What could you know as to how much artifice or self-preservation, how much rationality and higher protection there is in such self-deception? and how much falseness I still require in order to allow myself again and again the luxury of my sincerity? In short, I still live, and life, in spite of ourselves, is not devised by morality. It demands illusion. It lives by illusion. But, there, I am already beginning again and doing what I have always done, old and moralist and birdcatcher that I am. I am talking unmorally, ultra-morally, Beyond good and evil? 2. Thus, then, when I found it necessary, I invented, once on a time, the free spirits to whom this discouragingly encouraging book with the title Human, All Too Human, is dedicated. There are no such free spirits, nor have there been such, but, as already said, I then require them for company to keep me cheerful in the midst of evil. Sicknesses, loneliness, foreignness acedia, inactivity, as brave companions and ghosts with whom I could laugh and gossip when so inclined and send to the devil when they become bores, as compensation for the lack of friends. That such free spirits will be possible some day, that our Europe will have such bold and cheerful whites amongst her sons tomorrow and the day after tomorrow, as the shadow of a hermit's phantasmagoria, I should be the last to doubt thereof. Already I see them coming, Slowly, slowly, and perhaps I am doing something to hasten their coming when I describe in advance under what auspices I see them originate, and upon what paths I see them come. 3. One may suppose that a spirit in which the type free spirit is to become fully mature and sweet has had its decisive event in great emancipation, and that it was all the more fettered previously and apparently bound forever to its corner and pillar. What is it that binds most strongly? What cords are almost unrendable? In men of a lofty and select type it will be their duties, the reverence which is suitable to youth, respect, and tenderness for all that is time-honored and worthy gratitude to the land which bore them, to the hand which led them, to the sanctuary where they learnt to adore, their most exalted moments themselves will bind them most effectively, will lay upon them the most enduring obligations. For those who are thus bound, the great emancipation comes suddenly, like an earthquake. The young soul is all at once convulsed, unloosened, and extricated. It does not itself know what is happening. An impulsion and compulsion sway and overmaster it like a command. A will and a wish awaken, to go forth on their course, anywhere at any cost. A violent, dangerous curiosity about an undiscovered world flames and flares in every sense. Better to die than live here, says the imperious voice in seduction. And this here, this at home, is all that the soul has hitherto loved. A sudden fear and suspicion of that which is loved. A flash of disdain for what was called its duty. A rebellious, arbitrary, volcanically throbbing longing for travel, foreignness, estrangement, coldness, disenchantment, glaciation, a hatred of love, perhaps a sacrilegious clutch and look backwards to where it hitherto adored and loved, perhaps a glow of shame at what it was just doing, and at the same time a rejoicing that it was doing it, an intoxicated, internal, exulting thrill which betrays a triumph. A triumph? Over what? Over whom? An enigmatical, questionable, doubtful triumph, but the first triumph nevertheless. Such evil and painful incidents belong to the history of the great emancipation. It is at the same time a disease which may destroy the man, this first outbreak of power and will to self-decision, self-evaluation, this will to free will. And how much disease is manifested in the wild attempts and eccentricities by which the liberated and emancipated one now seeks to demonstrate his mastery over things. He roves about, raging with unsatisfied longing. Whatever he captures has to suffer for the dangerous tension of his pride. He tears to pieces whatever attracts him. 
With a malicious laugh, he twirls round whatever he finds veiled or guarded by a sense of shame. He tries how these things look when turned upside down. It is a matter of arbitrariness with him, and pleasure in arbitrariness. If he now perhaps bestow his favor on what had hitherto a bad repute, if he inquisitively and temptingly hot what is specially forbidden, in the background of his activities and wanderings, for he is restless and aimless in his course as in a desert, stands the note of interrogation of an increasingly dangerous curiosity. Cannot all valuations be reversed? And is good perhaps evil? And God only an invention and artifice of the devil? Is everything perhaps radically false? And if we are the deceived, are we not thereby also deceivers? Must we not also be deceivers? Such thoughts lead and mislead him more and more, onward and away. Solitude encircles and engirdles him, always more threatening, more throttling, more heart-oppressing. That terrible goddess, and matter seva cupidinum, but who knows nowadays what solitude is? 4. From the morbid solitariness, from the desert of such years of experiment, it is still a long way to the copious, overflowing safety and soundness which does not care to dispense with disease itself as an instrument and angling hook of knowledge. To that mature freedom of spirit which is equally self-control and discipline of the heart, and gives access to many and opposed modes of thought, to that inward comprehensiveness and daintiness of superabundance which exudes any danger of the spirit's becoming enamored and lost in its own paths, and lying intoxicated in some corner or other, to that excess of plastic, healing, formative, and restorative powers, which is exactly the sign of splendid health, that excess which gives the free spirit the dangerous prerogative of being entitled to live by experiments and offer itself to adventure, the free spirit's prerogative of mastership, Long years of convalescence may lie in between, years full of many-colored, painfully enchanting magical transformations, curbed and led by a tough will to health, which often dares to dress and disguise itself as actual health. There is a middle condition therein, which a man of such a fate never calls to mind later on without emotion. A pale, delicate light and a sunshine happiness are peculiar to him, a feeling of bird-like freedom, prospect, and haughtiness a tertium quid, in which curiosity and gentle disdain are combined. A free spirit. This cool expression does good in every condition. It almost warms. One no longer lives in the fetters of love and hatred, without yea, without nay, voluntarily near, voluntarily distant, preferring to escape, to turn aside, to flutter forth, to fly up and away. One is fastidious like everyone who has once seen an immense variety beneath him, and one has become the opposite of those who trouble themselves about things which do not concern them. In fact, it is nothing but things which now concern the free spirit, and how many things which no longer trouble him. 5. A step further towards recovery, and the free spirit again draws near to life. Slowly, it is true, and almost stubbornly, almost distrustfully. Again, it grows warmer around him, and, as it were, yellower. Feeling and sympathy gain depth. Thawing winds of every kind pass lightly over him. He almost feels as if his eyes were now open to what is near. He marvels and is still... Where has he been? The near and nearest things, how changed they appear to him. What a bloom and magic they have acquired meanwhile. He looks back gratefully, grateful to his wandering, his austerity and self-estrangement his far-sightedness and his bird-like flights in cold heights. What a good thing that he did not always stay at home, by himself, like a sensitive, stupid tenderling. He has been beside himself, there is no doubt. He now sees himself for the first time, and what surprises he feels thereby. What thrills unexperienced hitherto, what joy even in the weariness, in the old illness, in the relapses of the convalescent. How he likes to sit still and suffer, to practice patience, to lie in the sun. Who is as familiar as he with the joy of winter, with the patch of sunshine upon the wall? They are the most grateful animals in the world, and also the most unassuming, these lizards of convalescence, with their faces half turned toward life once more. There are those amongst them who never let a day pass without hanging a little hymn of praise on its trailing fringe. And speaking seriously, it is a radical cure for all pessimism, the well-known disease of old idealists and falsehood mongers, 
to become ill after the manner of these free spirits, to remain ill a good while, and then grow well, I mean better, for a still longer period. It is wisdom, practical wisdom, to prescribe even health for oneself for a long time, only in small doses. 6. About this time it may at last happen, under the sudden illuminations of still disturbed and changing health, that the enigma of that great emancipation begins to reveal itself to the free and ever freer spirit, that enigma which had hitherto lain obscure, questionable, and almost intangible in his memory. If for a long time he scarcely dared to ask himself, why so apart, so alone, denying everything that I revered, denying reverence itself, why this hatred, this suspicion, this severity toward my own virtues? He now dares and asks the question aloud, and already hears something like an answer to them. Thou shouldest become master over thyself, and master also of thine own virtues. Formerly they were thy masters, but they are only entitled to be thy tools amongst other tools. Thou shouldest obtain power over thy pro and contra, and learn how to put them forth and withdraw them again in accordance with thy higher purpose. Thou shouldest learn how to take the proper perspective of every valuation, the shifting, distortion, and apparent teleology of the horizons and everything that belongs to perspective, also the amount of stupidity which opposite values involve, and all the intellectual loss with which every pro and every contra has to be paid for. Thou shouldest learn how much necessary injustice there is in every for and against, injustice as inseparable from life and life itself as conditioned by the perspective and its injustice. Above all, thou shouldst see clearly where the injustice is always greatest, namely, where life has developed most punily, restrictedly, necessitously, and incipiently, and yet cannot help regarding itself as the purpose and standard of things, and for the sake of self-preservation, secretly, basely, and continuously wasting away and calling in question the higher, greater, and richer. Thou shouldst see clearly the problem of graduation of rank, and how power and right and amplitude of perspective grow up together. Thou shouldst, but enough, the free spirit knows henceforth which thou shalt he has obeyed, and also what he can now do, what he only now may do. 7. Thus doth the free spirit answer himself with regard to the riddle of emancipation and ends therewith while he generalizes his case, in order thus to decide with regard to his experience. As it happened to me, he says to himself, so must it happen to everyone in whom a mission seeks to embody itself and to come into the world. The secret power and necessity of this mission will operate in and upon the destined individuals like an unconscious pregnancy, long before they have had the mission itself in view and have known its name. Our destiny rules over us, even we are not yet aware of it. It is the future that makes laws for our today. Granted that it is the problem of the graduations of rank, of which we must say that it is our problem. We free spirits. Now only in the midday of our life do we first understand what preparations, detours, tests, experiments, and disguises the problem needed before it was permitted to rise before us and how we had first to experience the most manifold and opposing conditions of distress and happiness in soul and body, as adventurers and circumnavigators of the inner world called man, as surveyors of all the higher and the one above another, also called man, penetrating everywhere, almost without fear, rejecting nothing, losing nothing, tasting everything, cleansing everything from all that is accidental, and, as it were, sifting it out, until at last we could say, we free spirits, here, a new problem, here a long ladder, the rungs of which we ourselves have set upon and mounted, which we ourselves at some time have been, here a higher place, a lower place, an under us, an immeasurably long order, a hierarchy which we see, here our problem. 8. No psychologist or auger will be in doubt for a moment as to what stage of the development just described the following book belongs, or is assigned to. But where are these psychologists nowadays? In France, certainly. Perhaps in Russia. Assuredly not in Germany. Reasons are not lacking why the present-day Germans could still even count this as an honor to them. Bad enough, surely, 
for one who is in this respect is un-German in disposition and constitution. This German book, which has been able to find readers in a wide circle of countries and nations, has been about ten years going its rounds, and must understand some sort of music and piping art, by means of which every koe foreign ears are seduced into listening. It is precisely in Germany that this book has been most negligently read, and worst listened to. What is the reason? It demands too much, I have been told. It appeals to men free from the pressure of coarse duties. It wants refined and fastidious senses. It needs superfluidity, superfluidity of time, of clearness of sky and heart, of odium in the boldest sense of the term. Purely good things, which we Germans of today do not possess and therefore cannot give. After such a polite answer, my philosophy advises me to be silent and not to question further. Besides, in certain cases, as the proverb points out, one only remains a philosopher by being silent. Nice, Spring 1886 End of Introduction and Preface First Division, First and Last Things, Part 1 of Human All to Human, A Book for Free Spirits by Friedrich Nietzsche, translated by Helen Zimmern, 1846 to 1934. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Aaron Rivera. First Division, First and Last Things. 1. Chemistry of Ideas and Sensations. Philosophical problems adopt in almost all matters the same form of question as they did 2,000 years ago. How can anything spring from its opposite? For instance, reason out of unreason, the sentient out of the dead, logic out of unlogic, disinterested contemplation out of covetous willing, life for others out of egoism, truth out of error. Metaphysical philosophy has helped itself over those difficulties hitherto by denying the origin of one thing in another, and assuming a miraculous origin for more highly valued things, immediately out of the kernel and essence of the thing in itself. Historical philosophy, on the contrary, which is no longer to be thought of as separate from physical science, the youngest of all philosophical methods, has ascertained in single cases, and presumably this will happen in everything, that there are no opposites except in the usual exaggeration of the popular or metaphysical point of view, and that an error of reason lies at the bottom of the opposition. According to this explanation, strictly understood, there is neither an unegotistical action nor an entirely disinterested point of view. They are both only sublimations in which the fundamental element appears almost evaporated and is only to be discovered by the closest observation. All that we require, and which can only be given us by the present advance of the single sciences, is a chemistry of the moral, religious, aesthetic ideas and sentiments, as also of those emotions which we express in ourselves, both in the great and in the small phases of social and intellectual intercourse, and even in solitude. But what if this chemistry should result in the fact that also in this case the most beautiful colors have been obtained from base, even despised materials? Would many be inclined to pursue such examinations? Humanity likes to put all questions as to origin and beginning out of its mind. Must one not be almost dehumanized to feel a contrary tendency in oneself? 2. Inherited Faults of Philosophers All philosophers have the common fault that they start from man in his present state and hope to attain their end by an analysis of him. Unconsciously, they look upon man as an Setema veritas, as a thing unchangeable in all commotion, as a sure standard of things. But everything that the philosopher says about man is really nothing more than testimony about the man of a very limited space of time. A lack of historical sense is the hereditary fault of all philosophers. Many, indeed, unconsciously mistake the very latest variety of man, such as has arisen under the influence of certain religions, certain political events, for the permanent form from which one must set out. They will not learn that man has developed, that his faculty of knowledge has developed also, whilst for some of them the entire world is spun out of this faculty of knowledge. Now, everything essential in human development happened in prehistoric times, long before those 4,000 years which we know something of. Man may not have changed much during this time. But the philosopher sees instincts in the present man and takes it for granted that this is one of the unalterable facts of mankind, and, consequently, can furnish a key to the understanding of the world. 
The entire teleology is so constructed that man of the last 4,000 years is spoken of as an eternal being, towards which all things in the world have from the beginning a natural direction. But everything has evolved. There are no eternal facts, as there are likewise no absolute truths. Therefore, historical philosophizing is henceforth necessary, and with it the virtue of diffidence. 3. Appreciation of Unpretentious Truths It is a mark of a higher culture to value the little unpretentious truths, which have been found by means of strict method, more highly than the joy-diffusing and dazzling errors which spring from metaphysical and artistic times and peoples. First of all, one has scorn on the lips of the former, as if here nothing could have equal privileges with anything else, so unassuming, simple, bashful. Apparently discouraging are they, so beautiful, stately, intoxicating, Perhaps even animating are the others. But the hardly attained, the certain, the lasting, and therefore of great consequence for all wider knowledge, is still the higher. To keep one's self to that is manly and shows bravery, simplicity, and forbearance. Gradually, not only single individuals, but the whole of mankind will be raised to this manliness, when it has at last accustomed itself to the higher appreciation of durable, lasting knowledge, and has lost all belief in inspiration and the miraculous communication of truths. Respecters of forms, certainly, with this standard of the beautiful and noble, will first of all have good reasons for mockery. As soon as the appreciation of unpretentious truths and the scientific spirit begin to obtain the mastery, but only because their eye has either not yet recognized the charm of the simplest form, or because man educated in that spirit are not yet completely and inwardly saturated by it, so that they still thoughtlessly imitate old forms, and badly enough, as one does who no longer cares much about the matter. Formerly the spirit was not occupied with strict thought. Its earnestness then lay in the spinning out of symbols and forms. This has changed. That earnestness in the symbolical has become the mark of a lower culture. As our arts themselves grow ever more intellectual, our senses more spiritual, and as, for instance, people now judge concerning what sounds well to the sense quite differently from how they did a hundred years ago, so the forms of our life grow ever more spiritual, to the eye of the older ages perhaps uglier, but only because it is incapable of perceiving how the kingdom of the inward, spiritual beauty constantly grows deeper and wider and to what extent the inner intellectual look may be of more importance to us all than the most beautiful bodily frame and the noblest architectural structure. 4. Astrology and the Like It is probable that the objects of religious, moral, aesthetic, and logical sentiment likewise belong only to the surface of things, while man willingly believes that here, at least, he has touched the heart of the world. He deceives himself because those things enrapture him so profoundly and make him so profoundly unhappy, and he therefore shows the same pride here as in astrology. For astrology believes that the firmament moves round the destiny of man. The moral man, however, takes it for granted that what he has essentially at heart must also be the essence and heart of things. 5. Misunderstanding of Dreams in the ages of a rude and primitive civilization, man believed that in dreams he became acquainted with a second actual world. Herein lies the origin of all metaphysics. Without dreams there could have been found no reason for a division of the world. The distinction, too, between soul and body is connected with the most ancient comprehension of dreams, also the supposition of an imaginary soul body, therefore the origin of all belief in spirits, and probably also the belief in gods. The dead continues to live, for he appears to the living in a dream. Thus men reasoned of old for thousands and thousands of years. 6. The scientific spirit partially but not wholly powerful. The smallest subdivisions of science taken separately are dealt with purely in relation to themselves. The general, great sciences on the contrary, regarded as a whole, call up the question, certainly a very non-objective one, Wherefore? To what end? It is this utilitarian consideration which causes them to be dealt with less impersonally when taken as a whole than when considered in their various parts. In philosophy, above all, as the apex of the entire pyramid of science, the question as to the utility of knowledge is involuntarily brought forward, and every philosophy has the unconscious intention of ascribing to it the greatest usefulness. 
For this reason, there is so much high-flying metaphysics in all philosophies and such a shyness of the apparently unimportant solutions of physics. For the importance of knowledge for life must appear as great as possible. Here is the antagonism between the separate provinces of science and philosophy. The latter desires what art does, to give the greatest possible depth and meaning to life and actions. In the former, one seeks knowledge and nothing further, whatever may emerge thereby. So far there has been no philosopher in whose hands philosophy has not grown into an apology for knowledge. On this point, at least, everyone is an optimist, that the greatest usefulness must be ascribed to knowledge. They are all tyrannized over by logic, and this is optimism in its essence. 7. The Killjoy in Science Philosophy separated from science when it asked the question, which is the knowledge of the world and of life which enables man to live most happily? This happened in the Socratic schools. The veins of scientific investigation were bound up by the points of view of happiness, and are so still. 8. Pneumatic Explanation of Nature Metaphysics explains the writing of nature, so to speak, pneumatically, as the Church and her learned men formerly did with the Bible. A great deal of understanding is required to apply to nature the same method of strict interpretation as the philologists have now established for all books, with the intention of clearly understanding what the text means, but not suspecting a double sense or even taking it for granted. Just, however, as with regard to books, the bad art of interpretation is by no means overcome, and the most cultivated society one still constantly comes across the remains of allegorical and mythical interpretation. So it is also with regard to nature. Indeed, it is even much worse. 9. The Metaphysical World It is true that there might be a metaphysical world. The absolute possibility of it is hardly to be disputed. We look at everything through the human head and cannot cut this head off. While the question remains, what would be left of the world if it had been cut off? This is a purely scientific problem, and one not very likely to trouble mankind. But everything which has hitherto made metaphysical suppositions valuable, terrible, delightful for man, what has produced them, is passion, error, and self-deception. The very worst methods of knowledge, not the best, have taught belief therein. When these methods have been discovered as the foundation of all existing religions and metaphysics, they have been refuted. Then there still always remains that possibility but there is nothing to be done with it. Much less is it possible to let happiness, salvation, and life depend on the spider thread of such a possibility. For nothing could be said of the metaphysical world but that it would be a different condition, a condition inaccessible and incomprehensible to us. It would be a thing of negative qualities. Were the existence of such a world ever so well proved, the fact would nevertheless remain that it would be precisely the most irrelevant of all forms of knowledge more irrelevant than the knowledge of the chemical analysis of water to the sailor in danger in a storm. 10. Harmlessness of Metaphysics in the Future Directly the origins of religion, art, and morals have been so described that one can perfectly explain them without having recourse to metaphysical concepts at the beginning and in the course of the path. The strongest interest in the purely theoretical problem of the thing in itself and the phenomenon ceases. For however it may be here, with religion, art, and morals, we do not touch the essence of the world in itself. We are in the domain of representation. No, intuition can carry us further. With the greatest calmness, we shall leave the question as to how our own conception of the world can differ so widely from the revealed essence of the world, to physiology and the history of the evolution of organisms and ideas. 11. Language as a Presumptive Science The importance of language for the development of culture lies in the fact that in language man has placed a world of his own besides the other, a position which he deems so fixed that he might therefrom lift the rest of the world off its hinges and make himself master of it. Inasmuch as man is believed in the ideas and names of things as eternae veritates for a great length of time, he has acquired that pride by which he has raised himself above the animal. He really thought that in language he possessed the knowledge of the world. The maker of language was not modest enough to think that he only gave designations to things. He believed rather that with his words he expressed the widest knowledge of the things. In reality, language is the first step in the endeavor after science. 
Here also it is belief in ascertained truth, from which the mightiest sources of strength have flowed. Much later, only now, it is dawning upon men that they have propagated a tremendous error in their belief in language. Fortunately, it is now too late to reverse the development of reason, which is founded upon that belief. Logic, also, is founded upon suppositions to which nothing in the actual world corresponds. For instance, on the supposition of the equality of things and the identity of the same thing at different points of time. But that particular science arose out of the contrary belief that such things really existed in the actual world. It is the same with mathematics, which would certainly not have arisen if it had been known from the beginning that in nature there are no exactly straight lines, no real circle, no absolute standard of size. 12. Dream and Culture The function of the brain which is most influenced by sleep is the memory, not that it entirely ceases, but it is brought back to a condition of imperfection such as everyone may have experienced in prehistoric times, whether asleep or awake. Arbitrary and confused as it is, it constantly confounds things on the ground of the most fleeting resemblances. But with the same arbitrariness and confusion the ancients invented their mythologies, and even at the present day travelers are accustomed to remark how prone the savage is to forgetfulness, how, after a short tension of memory, his mind begins to sway here and there from sheer weariness and gives forth lies and nonsense. But in dreams we all resemble the savage. Bad recognition and erroneous comparisons are the reasons of the bad conclusions, of which we are guilty in dreams, so that, when we clearly recollect what we have dreamt, we are alarmed at ourselves at harboring so much foolishness within us. The perfect distinctness of all dream representations, which presuppose absolute faith in their reality, recall the conditions that appertain to primitive man, in whom hallucination was extraordinarily frequent and sometimes simultaneously seized entire communities, entire nations. Therefore, in sleep and in dreams, we once more carry out the task of early humanity. 13. The Logic of Dreams In sleep, our nervous system is perpetually excited by numerous inner occurrences. Nearly all the organs are disjointed and in a state of activity. The blood runs its turbulent course. The position of the sleeper causes pressure on certain limbs. His coverings influence his sensations in various ways. The stomach digests, and by its movement it disturbs other organs. The intestines writhe. The position of the head occasions unaccustomed play of muscles. The feet, unshod, not pressuring upon the floor with the soles, occasion the feeling of the unaccustomed, just as does the different clothing of the whole body. All this, according to its daily change and extent, excites by its extraordinariness the entire system to the very functions of the brain, and thus there are a hundred occasions for the spirit to be surprised and to seek for the reasons of this excitation. The dream, however, is the seeking and representing of the causes of those excited sensations, that is, of the supposed causes. A person who, for instance, binds his feet with two straps will perhaps dream that two serpents are coiling around his feet. This is first hypothesis, than a belief with an accompanying mental picture and interpretation. These serpents must be the causia of these sensations which I, the sleeper, experience. So decides the mind of the sleeper. The immediate past, so disclosed, becomes to him the present through his excited imagination. Thus everyone knows from experience how quickly the dreamer weaves into his dream a loud sound that he hears, such as the ringing of bells or the firing of cannon, that is to say, explains it from afterwards, so that he first thinks he experiences the producing circumstances and then that sound. But how does it happen that the mind of the dreamer is always so mistaken, while the same mind when awake is accustomed to be so temperate, careful, skeptical with regard to its hypotheses, so that the first random hypothesis of the explanation of a feeling suffices for him to believe immediately in its truth? For in dreaming we believe in the dream as if it were a reality, i.e., we think our hypothesis completely proved. I hold that as man now still reasons in dreams, so men reasoned also when awake through thousands of years. The first causa which occurred to the mind to explain anything that required an explanation was sufficient and stood for truth. Thus, according to travelers' tales, savages still do to this very day. This ancient element in human nature still manifests itself in our dreams, for it is the foundation upon which the higher reason has developed and still develops in every individual. 
The dream carries us back into remote conditions of human culture and provides a ready means of understanding them better. Dream thinking is now so easy to us because during immense periods of human development we have been so well drilled in this form of fantastic and cheap explanation by means of the first agreeable notions. In so far, dreaming is a recreation for the brain, which by day has to satisfy the stern demands of thought as they are laid down by the higher culture. We can at once discern an allied process even in our awakened state, as the door and anteroom of the dream. If we shut our eyes, the brain produces a number of impressions of light and color, probably as a kind of afterplay and echo of all those effects of light which crowd in upon it by day. Now, however, the understanding, together with the imagination, instantly works up this play of color, shapeless in itself, into definite figures, forms, landscapes, and animated groups. The actual accompanying process thereby is again a kind of conclusion from the effect to the cause, since the mind asks, whence come these impressions of light and color? It supposes those figures and forms as causes. It takes them for the origin of those colors and lights, because in the daytime, with open eyes, it is accustomed to find a producing cause for every color, every effect of life. Here, therefore, the imagination constantly places pictures before the mind, since it supports itself on the visual impressions of the day in their production, and the dream imagination does just the same thing, that is, the supposed cause is deduced from the effect and representation after the effect. All this happens with extraordinary rapidity, so that here, as with the conjurer, a confusion of judgment may arise and a sequence may look like something simultaneous, or even like a reverse sequence. From these circumstances we may gather how lately the more acute logical thinking, the strict discrimination of cause and effect, has been developed, when our reasoning and understanding faculties still involuntarily hark back to those primitive forms of deduction, and when we pass about half of our life in this condition. The poet, too, and the artist assign causes for their moods and conditions which are by no means the true ones. In this they recall an older humanity and can assist us to the understanding of it. 14. Co-echoing. All stronger moods bring with them a co-echoing of kindred sensations and moods. They grub up the memory, so to speak. Along with them something within us remembers and becomes conscious of similar conditions in their origin. Thus, there are formed quick, habitual connections of feelings and thoughts, which eventually, when they follow each other with lightning speed, are no longer felt as complexes but as unities. In this sense, one speaks of the moral feeling, of the religious feeling, as if they were absolute unities. In reality, they are streams with a hundred sources and tributaries. Here also, as so often happens, the unity of the word is no security for the unity of the thing. 15. No internal and external in the world. As Democritus transferred the concepts above and below to endless space where they have no sense, so philosophers in general have transferred the concepts internal and external to the essence and appearance of the world. They think that with deep feelings one can penetrate deeply into the internal and approach the heart of nature. But these feelings are only deep insofar as along with them, barely noticeable, Certain complicated groups of thoughts, which we call deep, are regularly excited. A feeling is deep because we think that the accompanying thought is deep. But the deep thought can nevertheless be very far from the truth, as, for instance, every metaphysical one. If one take away from the deep feeling the commingled element of thought, then the strong feeling remains, and this guarantees nothing for knowledge but itself, just as strong faith proves only its strength and not the truth of what is believed in. 16. Phenomenon and Thing in Itself Philosophers are in the habit of setting themselves before life and experience, before that which they call the world of appearance, as before a picture that is once for all unrolled and exhibits unchangeably fixed the same process. This process, they think, must be rightly interpreted in order to come to a conclusion about the being that produced the picture, about the thing in itself, therefore, which is always accustomed to be regarded as sufficient ground for the world of phenomenon. On the other hand, since one always makes the idea of the metaphysical stand definitely as that of the unconditioned, consequently, also unconditioning, one must directly disown all connection between the unconditioned, the metaphysical world, and the world which is known to us, so that the thing in itself should certainly not appear in the phenomenon, 
and every conclusion from the former as regarded the latter is to be rejected. Both sides overlook the fact that that picture, that which we now call human life and experience, has gradually evolved, nay, is still in the process of evolving, and therefore should not be regarded as a fixed magnitude from which a conclusion about its originator might be deduced, the sufficing cause, or even merely neglected. It is because for thousands of years we have looked into the world with moral, aesthetic, and religious pretensions with blind inclination, passion, or fear, and have suffered ourselves in the vices of illogical thought that this world has gradually become so marvelously motley, terrible, full of meaning and of soul, and it has acquired color. But we were the colorists. The human intellect, on the basis of human needs, of human emotions, has caused this phenomenon to appear and has carried its erroneous fundamental conceptions into things. Late, very late, it takes to thinking and now the world of experience and the thing in itself seem to it so extraordinarily different and separated that it gives up drawing conclusions from the former to the latter, or in a terribly mysterious manner demands the renunciation of our intellect, of our personal will, in order thereby to reach the essential, that one may become essential. Again, others have collected all the characteristic features of our world of phenomenon, that is, the idea of the world spun out of intellectual errors and inherited by us, and instead of accusing the intellect as the offenders, they have laid the blame on the nature of things as being the cause of the hard fact of this very sinister character of the world, and have preached the deliverance from being. With all these conceptions, the constant and laborious process of science, which at last celebrates its great triumph in a history of the origin of thought, becomes completed in various ways, the result of which might perhaps run as follows. That which we now call the world is the result of a mass of errors and fantasies which arose gradually in general development of organic being, which are intergrown with each other, and are now inherited by us as the accumulated treasure of all the past, as a treasure for the value of our humanity depends upon it. From this world of representation, strict science is really only able to liberate us to a very slight extent, as it is also not at all desirable, inasmuch as it cannot essentially break the power of primitive habits of feeling, but it can gradually elucidate the history of the rise of that world as representation, and lift us, at least for moments, above and beyond the whole process. Perhaps we shall then recognize that the thing in itself is worth a Homeric laugh, that it seems so much, indeed everything, and is really empty, namely, empty of meaning. 17. Metaphysical Explanations The young man values metaphysical explanations because they show him something highly significant in things which he found unpleasant or despicable, and if he is dissatisfied with himself, the feeling becomes lighter when he recognizes the innermost world puzzle or world misery in that which he so strongly disapproves of in himself. To feel himself less responsible and at the same time to find things more interesting, that seems to him a doable benefit for which he has to think metaphysics. Later on, certainly, he gets distrustful of the whole metaphysical method of explanation. Then perhaps it grows clear to him that those results can be obtained equally well and more scientifically in another way. That physical and historical explanations produce the feeling of personal relief to at least the same extent, and that the interest in life and its problems is perhaps more aroused thereby. 18. Fundamental Questions of Metaphysics When the history of the rise of thought comes to be written, a new light will be thrown on the following statement of a distinguished logician. The primordial general law of the cognizant subject consists in the inner necessity of recognizing every object in itself in its own nature as a thing identical with itself, consequently self-existing and at bottom remaining ever the same and unchangeable. In short, in recognizing everything as a substance. Even this law, which is here called primordial, has evolved. It will someday be shown how gradually this tendency arises in the lower organisms, how the feeble mole eyes of their organizations at first see only the same thing, how then, when the various awakenings of pleasure and displeasure become noticeable, various substances are gradually distinguished, but each with one attribute, i.e., one single relation to such an organism. The first step in logic is the judgment, the nature of which, according to the decision of the best logicians, consists in belief. At the bottom of all belief lies the sensation of the pleasant or the painful in relation to the sentient subject. 
A third sensation as the result of two previous single sensations is the judgment in its simplest form. We organic beings have originally no interest in anything but its relation to us in connection with the pleasure and pain. Between the moments, the states of feeling, when we become conscious of this connection lie moments of rest, of non-feeling. The world and everything is then without interest for us. We notice no change in it, as even now a deeply interested person does not notice when anyone passes him. To the plant, things are as a rule tranquil and eternal, everything like itself. From the period of the lower organisms, man has inherited the belief that similar things exist. This theory is only contradicted by the matured experience of the most advanced science. The primordial belief of everything organic from the beginning is perhaps even this, that all the rest of the world is one and immovable. The point furthest removed from those early beginnings of logic is the idea of causality. Indeed, we still really think that all sensations and activities are acts of the free will. When the sentient individual contemplates himself, he regards every sensation, every alteration as something isolated. That is to say, unconditioned and disconnected. It rises up in us without connection with anything foregoing or following. We're hungry, but we do not originally think that the organism must be nourished. The feeling seems to make itself felt without cause and purpose. It isolates itself and regards itself as arbitrary. Therefore, belief in the freedom of the will is an original error of everything organic, as old as the existence of the awakenings of logic in it. The belief in unconditioned substances and similar things is equally a primordial as well as an old error of everything organic. But inasmuch as all metaphysics has concerned itself chiefly with substance and the freedom of will, it may be designated as the science which treats of the fundamental errors of mankind, but treats of them as if they were fundamental truths. End of First Division, First and Last Things, Part 1 First Division, First and Last Things, Part 2 of Human All Too Human, A Book for Free Spirits. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Aaron Rivera. Human All Too Human, A Book for Free Spirits. Part 1 by Friedrich Nietzsche. Translated by Helen Zimmern. 1846-1934. First Division, First and Last Things, Part 2 19. Number The discovery of the laws of numbers is made upon the ground of the original, already prevailing error, that there are many similar things, but in reality there is nothing similar, at least that there are things, but there is no thing. The supposition of plurality always presumes that there is something which appears frequently, but here already error reigns. Already we imagine beings, unities, which do not exist. Our sensations of space and time are false, for they lead, examined in sequence, to logical contradictions. In all scientific determinations we always reckon inevitably with certain false quantities, but as these quantities are at least constant as, for instance, our sensation of time and space, the conclusions of science have still perfect accuracy and certainty in their connection with one another one may continue to build upon them, until that final limit where the erroneous original suppositions, those constant faults, come into conflict with the conclusions, for instance, in the doctrine of atoms. There still we always feel ourselves compelled to the acceptance of a thing, or material, substratum, that is moved, whilst the whole scientific procedure has pursued the very task of resolving everything substantial, material, into motion. Here, too, we still separate with our sensation the mover and the moved and cannot get out of this circle, because the belief in things has from immemorial times been bound up with our being. When Kant says, the understanding does not derive its laws from nature, but dictates them to her, it is perfectly true with regard to the idea of nature which we are compelled to associate with her. Nature equals world as representation, that is to say as error, but which is the summing up of a number of errors of the understanding. The laws of numbers are entirely inapplicable to a world which is not our representation. These laws obtain only in the human world. 
20. A few steps back. A degree of culture, and assuredly a very high one, is attained when man rises above superstitious and religious notions and fears, and, for instance, no longer believes in guardian angels or in original sin, and has also ceased to talk of the salvation of his soul. If he has attained to this degree of freedom, he is still also to overcome metaphysics with the greatest exertion of his intelligence. Then, however, a retrogressive movement is necessary. He must understand the historical justifications as well as the psychological in such representations. He must recognize how the greatest advancement of humanity has come therefrom, and how, without such a retrocursive movement, he should have been robbed of the best products of hitherto existing mankind. With regard to philosophical metaphysics, I always see increasing numbers who have attained to the negative goal, that all positive metaphysics is error, but as yet few who climb a few rungs backwards. One ought to look out, perhaps, over the last steps of the ladder, but not try to stand upon them. The most enlightened only succeed so far as to free themselves from metaphysics and look back upon it with superiority. While it is necessary here, too, as in the Hippodrome, to turn around the end of the course. 21. Conjectural Victory of Skepticism For once let the skeptical starting point be accepted, granted that there were no other metaphysical world, and all explanations drawn from metaphysics about the only world we know were useless to us. In what light should we then look upon men and things? We can think this out for ourselves. It is useful, even though the question whether anything metaphysical has been scientifically proved by Kant and Schopenhauer were altogether set aside. For it is quite possible, according to historical probability, that some time or other man, as a general rule, may grow skeptical. The question will then be this. What form will human society take under the influence of such a mode of thought? Perhaps the scientific proof of some metaphysical world or other is already so difficult that mankind will never get rid of a certain distrust of it. And when there is distrust of metaphysics, there are on the whole the same results as if it had been directly refuted and could no longer be believed in. The historical question with regard to an unmetaphysical frame of mind in mankind remains the same in both cases. 22. Unbelief in the Monumentum Irae Perennius An actual drawback which accompanies the cessation of metaphysical views lies in the fact that the individual looks upon his short span of life too exclusively and receives no stronger incentives to build durable institutions intended to last for centuries. He himself wishes to pluck the fruit from the tree which he plants, and therefore he no longer plants those trees which require regular care for centuries, and which are destined to afford shade to a long series of generations. For metaphysical views furnish the belief that in them the last conclusive foundation has been given, upon which henceforth all the future of mankind is compelled to settle down and establish itself. The individual furthers his salvation when, for instance, he founds a church or covenant. He thinks it will be reckoned to him and recompensed to him in the eternal life of the soul. It is work for the soul's eternal salvation. Can science also arouse such faith in its results? As a matter of fact, it needs doubt and distrust as its most faithful auxiliaries. Nevertheless, in the course of time, the sum of all inviolable truths, those, namely, which have weathered all the storms of skepticism and all destructive analysis, may have become so great, in the regimen of health, for instance, that one may determine to found thereupon eternal works. For the present, the contrast between our excited ephemeral existence and the long-winded repose of metaphysical ages still operates too strongly, because the two ages still stand too closely together. The individual man himself now goes through too many inward and outward developments for him to venture to arrange his own lifetime permanently, and once and for all. An entirely modern man, for instance, who is going to build himself a house, as a feeling as if he were going to immure himself alive in a mausoleum. 23. The Age of Comparison The less men are fettered by tradition, the greater becomes the inward activity of their motives. The greater, again, in proportion thereto, the outward restlessness, the confused flux of mankind, the polyphony of strivings. 
For whom is there still an absolute compulsion to bind himself and his descendants to one place? For whom is there still anything strictly compulsory? As all styles of arts are imitated simultaneously, so also are all grades and kinds of morality, of customs, of cultures. Such an age obtains its importance because in it the various views of the world, customs, and cultures can be compared and experienced simultaneously, which was formerly not possible with the always localized sway of every culture, corresponding to the rooting of all artistic styles in place and time. An increased aesthetic feeling will now at last decide amongst so many forms presenting themselves for comparison. It will allow the greater number, that is to say all those rejected by it, to die out. In the same way, a selection amongst the forms and customs of the higher moralities is taking place, of which the aim can be nothing else than the downfall of the lower moralities. It is the age of comparison. That is its pride, but more justly also its grief. Let us not be afraid of this grief. Rather, will we comprehend as adequately as possible the task our age sets us. Posterity will bless us for doing so, a posterity which also knows itself to be as much above the terminated original national cultures as above the culture of comparison, but which looks back with gratitude on both kinds of culture as upon antiquities worthy of veneration. 24. The Possibility of Progress when a scholar of the ancient culture forswears the company of men who believe in progress, he does quite right. For the greatness and goodness of ancient culture lie behind it, and historical education compels one to admit that they can never be fresh again. An unbearable stupidity or an equally insufferable fanaticism would be necessary to deny this. But men can consciously resolve to develop themselves toward a new culture. Whilst formerly they only developed unconsciously and by chance, they can now create better conditions for the rise of human beings, for their nourishment, education, and instruction. They can administer the earth economically as a whole and can generally weigh and restrain the powers of man. This new, conscious culture kills the old, which, regarded as a whole, has led an unconscious animal and plant life. It also kills distrust in progress. Progress is possible. I must say that it is over-hasty and almost nonsensical to believe that progress must necessarily follow, but how could one deny that it is possible? On the other hand, progress in the sense and on the path of the old culture is not even thinkable. Even if romantic fantasy has also constantly used the word progress to denote its aims, for instance, circumscribed primitive national cultures, it borrows the picture of it in any case from the past, its thoughts and ideas on this subject are entirely without originality. 25. Private and Ecumenical Morality Since the belief has ceased that a god directs in general the fate of the world and, in spite of all apparent crookedness in the path of humanity, leads it on gloriously, men themselves must set themselves in ecumenical aims embracing the whole world. The older morality, especially that of Kant, required from the individual actions which were desired from all men. That was a delightfully naive thing, as if each one knew offhand what course of action was beneficial to the whole of humanity, and consequently which actions in general were desirable. It is a theory like that of free trade, taking for granted that the general harmony must result of itself according to innate laws of amelioration. Perhaps a future contemplation of the needs of humanity will show that it is by no means desirable that all men should act alike. In the interest of an ecumenical aims, it might rather be that for whole sections of mankind, special and perhaps under certain circumstances even evil tasks would have to be set. In any case, if mankind is not to destroy itself by such a conscious universal rule, there must previously be found, as a scientific standard for ecumenical aims, a knowledge of the conditions of culture, superior to what has hitherto been attained. Herein lies the enormous task of the great minds of the next century. 26. Reaction as Progress Now and again there appear rugged, powerful, impetuous, but nevertheless backward-lagging minds which conjure up once more a past phase of mankind. They serve to prove that the new tendencies against which they are working are not yet sufficiently strong, that they still lack something. Otherwise, they would show better opposition to those exercisers. Thus, for example, 
Luther's Reformation bears witness to the fact that in his century all the movements of the freedom of the spirit were still uncertain, tender, and youthful. Science could not yet lift up its head. Indeed, the whole Renaissance seems like an early spring which is almost snowed under again. But in this century also, Schopenhauer's metaphysics showed that even now the scientific spirit is not yet strong enough. Thus, the whole medieval Christian view of the world and human feeling could celebrate its resurrection in Schopenhauer's doctrine, in spite of the long-achieved destruction of all Christian dogmas. There is much science in his doctrine, but it does not dominate it. It is rather the old well-known metaphysical requirement that does so. It is certainly one of the greatest and quite invaluable advantages which we gain from Schopenhauer, that he occasionally forces our sensations back into older, mightier modes of contemplating the world and man, to which no other path would so easily lead us. The gain to history and justice is very great. I do not think that anyone would so easily succeed now in doing justice to Christianity and its Asiatic relations without Schopenhauer's assistance, which is specially impossible from the basis of still existing Christianity. Only after this great success of justice, only after we have corrected so essential a point as the historical mode of contemplation which the Age of Enlightenment brought with it, may we again bear onward the banner of Enlightenment, the banner with the three names, Petrarch, Erasmus, Voltaire. We have turned reaction into progress. 27. A Substitute for Religion it is believed that something good is said of philosophy when it is put forward as a substitute for religion for the people. As a matter of fact, in the spiritual economy there is need, at times, of an intermediary order of thought. The transition from religion to scientific contemplation is a violent, dangerous leap which is not to be recommended. To this extent, the recommendation is justifiable. But one should eventually learn that the needs which have been satisfied by religion and are now to be satisfied by philosophy, are not unchangeable. These themselves can be weakened and eradicated. Think, for instance, of the Christian's distress of soul, his sighing over inward corruption, his anxiety for salvation, all notions which originate only in errors of reason and deserve not satisfaction but destruction. A philosophy can serve either to satisfy those needs or to set them aside, for they are acquired, temporarily limited needs which are based upon suppositions contradictory to those of science. Here, in order to make a transition, art is far rather to be employed to relieve the mind overburdened with emotions, for those notions receive much less support from it than from a metaphysical philosophy. It is easier, then, to pass over from art to a really liberating philosophical science. 28. Ill-Famed Words Away with those wearisomely hackneyed terms optimism and pessimism, for the occasion for using them becomes less and less from day to day. Only the chatterboxes still find them so absolutely necessary. For why in all the world should anyone wish to be an optimist unless he has a god to defend who must have created the best of worlds if he himself be goodness and perfection? What thinker, however, still needs the hypothesis of a god? But every occasion for a pessimistic confession of faith is also lacking when one has no interest in being annoyed at the advocates of God, the theologians or the theologizing philosophers, and in energetically defending the opposite view, that evil reigns, that pain is greater than pleasure, that the world is a bungled piece of work, the manifestation of an ill will to life. But who still bothers about the theologians now, except the theologians? Apart from all theology and its contentions, it is quite clear that the world is not good and not bad, to say nothing of its being the best or the worst, and that the terms good and bad have only significance with respect to man, and indeed, perhaps, they are not justified even here in the way they are usually employed. In any case, we must get rid of both the calumniating and the glorifying conception of the world. 29 intoxicated by the scent of the blossoms. It is supposed that the ship of humanity has always a deeper draught, the heavier it is laden. It is believed that the deeper a man thinks, the more delicately he feels, the higher he values himself, the greater his distance from the other animals, the more he appears as a genius amongst the animals, the nearer will he approach the real essence of the world and its knowledge. This he actually does too, through science, 
but he means to do so still more through his religions and arts. These certainly are blossoms of the world, but by no means any nearer to the root of the world than the stalk. It is not possible to understand the nature of things better through them, although almost everyone believes he can. Error has made man so deep, sensitive, and inventive that he has put forth such blossoms as religions and arts. Pure knowledge could not have been capable of it. Whoever were to unveil for us the essence of the world would give us all the most disagreeable disillusionment. Not the world as things in itself, but the world as representation, as error, is so full of meaning, so deep, so wonderful, bearing happiness and unhappiness in its bosom. This result leads to a philosophy of the logical denial of the world, which, however, can be combined with a practical world-affirming just as well as with its opposite. 30. Bad Habits in Reasoning The usual false conclusions of mankind are these. A thing exists, therefore it has a right to exist. Here there is an inference from the ability to live to its suitability, from its suitability to its rightfulness. Then, an opinion brings happiness, therefore it is the true opinion. Its effect is good, therefore it is itself good and true. To the effect is here assigned the predicate beneficent, good, in the sense of the useful, and the cause is then furnished with the same predicate good, but here in the sense of the logically valid. The inversion of the sentences would read thus, an affair cannot be carried through or maintained, therefore it is wrong. An opinion causes pain or excites, therefore it is false. The free spirit who learns only too often the faultiness in this mode of reasoning and has to suffer from its consequences frequently gives way to the temptation to draw the very opposite conclusions, which, in general, are naturally just as false. An affair cannot be carried through, therefore it is good. An opinion is distressing and disturbing, therefore it is true. 31. The Illogical Necessary One of those things that may drive a thinker into despair is the recognition of the fact that the illogical is necessary for man, and that out of the illogical comes much that is good. It is so firmly rooted in the passions, in language, in art, in religion, and generally in everything that gives value to life, that it cannot be withdrawn without thereby hopelessly injuring those beautiful things. It is only the all-too-naive people who can believe that the nature of man can be changed into a purely logical one. But if there were degrees of proximity to this goal, how many things would not have to be lost on this course? Even the most rational man has need of nature again from time to time, i.e. his illogical fundamental attitude towards all things. 32. Injustice Necessary All judgments on the value of life are illogically developed and therefore unjust. The inexactitude of the judgment lies, firstly, in the manner in which the material is presented, namely very imperfectly, secondly, in the manner in which the conclusion is formed out of it, and thirdly, in the fact that every separate element of the material is again the result of vitiated recognition, and this, too, of necessity. For instance, no experience of an individual, however near he may stand to us, can be perfect, so that we could have a logical right to make a complete estimate of him. All estimates are rash, and must be so. Finally, the standard by which we measure our nature is not of unalterable dimensions. We have moods and vacillations, and yet we should have to recognize ourselves as a fixed standard in order to estimate correctly the relation of anything whatsoever to ourselves. From this it will, perhaps, follow that we should make no judgments at all. If one could only live without making estimations, without having likes and dislikes, for all dislike is connected with an estimation as well as an inclination, an impulse towards or away from anything without a feeling that something advantageous is desired, something injurious avoided, an impulse without any kind of conscious valuation of the worth of the aim does not exist in man. We are from the beginnings illogical, and therefore unjust beings, and can recognize this. It is one of the greatest and most inexplicable discords of existence. 33. Error about life necessary for life. 
Every belief in the value and worthiness of life is based on vitiated thought. It is only possible through the fact that sympathy for the general life and suffering of mankind is very weakly developed in the individual. Even the rare people who think outside themselves do not contemplate this general life, but only a limited part of it. If one understands how to direct one's attention chiefly to the exceptions, I mean to the highly gifted and the rich souls, if one regards the production of these as the aim of the whole world development and rejoices in its operation, then one may believe in the value of life, because one thereby overlooks the other men. One consequently thinks fallaciously. So too, when one directs one's attention to all mankind, but only considers one species of impulses in them, the less egotistical ones, and excuses them with regard to the other instincts, one may then again entertain hopes of mankind in general and believe so far in the value of life, consequently in this case also through fallaciousness of thought. Let one, however, behave in this or that manner. With such behavior one is an exception amongst men. Now, most people bear life without any considerable grumbling, and consequently believe in the value of existence. But precisely because each one is solely self-seeking and self-affirming, and does not step out of himself like those exceptions, everything extra-personal is imperceptible to them, or at most seems only a faint shadow. Therefore, on this alone is based the value of life for the ordinary everyday man, that he regards himself as more important than the world. The great lack of imagination from which he suffers is the reason why he cannot enter into the feelings of other beings, and therefore sympathizes as little as possible with their fate and suffering. He, on the other hand, who really could sympathize therewith, would have to despair of the value of life. Were he to succeed in comprehending and feeling in himself the general consciousness of mankind, he would collapse with a curse on existence, for mankind as a whole has no goals. Consequently, man, in considering his whole course, cannot find in it his comfort and support, but his despair. If, in all that he does, he considers the final aimlessness of man, his own activity assumes in his eyes the character of wastefulness. But to feel oneself just as wasted as humanity, and not only as an individual, as we see the single blossom of nature wasted, is a feeling above all other feelings. But who is capable of it? Assuredly, only a poet, and poets always know how to console themselves. 34. For Tranquility But does not our philosophy thus become a tragedy? Does not truth become hostile to life, to improvement? A question seems to weigh upon our tongue and yet hesitate to make itself heard. Whether one can consciously remain in untruthfulness, or, supposing one were obliged to do this, would not death be preferable? For there is no longer any must morality, insofar as it has any must or shalt, has been destroyed by our mode of contemplation, just as religion has been destroyed. Knowledge can only allow pleasure and pain, benefit and injury to subsist as motives, but how will these motives agree with the sense of truth? They also contain errors, for, as already said, inclination and aversion, and their very incorrect determinations practically regulate our pleasure and pain. The whole of human life is deeply immersed in untruthfulness. The individual cannot draw it up out of this well without thereby taking a deep dislike to his whole past, without finding his present motives, those of honor, for instance, inconsistent, and without opposing scorn and disdain to the passions which conduce to happiness in the future. Is it true that there remains but one sole way of thinking which brings after it despair as a personal experience, as a theoretical result, a philosophy of disillusion, disintegration, and self-destruction? I believe that the decision with regard to the after-effects of the knowledge will be given through the temperament of a man. I could imagine another after-effect just as well as that one described, which is possible in certain natures, by means of which a life would arise much simpler, freer from emotions than is the present one, so that though at first, indeed, the old motives of passionate desire might still have strength from old hereditary habit, they would gradually become weaker under the influence of purifying knowledge. One would live at last amongst men, and with oneself as with nature, without praise, reproach, or agitation, feasting one's eyes as if it were play, 
upon much of which one was formerly afraid. One would be free from the emphasis, and would no longer feel the goading, of the thought that one is not only nature or more than nature. Certainly, as already remarked, a good temperament would be necessary for this, an even, mild, and naturally joyous soul, a disposition which would not always need to be on its guard against spite and sudden outbreaks, and would not convey in its utterances anything of a grumbling or sudden nature. Those well-known vexatious qualities of old dogs and men who have been long chained up. On the contrary, a man from whom the ordinary fetters of life have so far fallen that he continues to live only for the sake of even better knowledge must be able to renounce without envy and regret. Much, indeed, almost everything that is precious to other men, he must regard as the all-sufficing and the most desirable condition, the free, fearless soaring over men, customs, laws, and the tradition of valuations of things. The joy of this condition he imparts willingly, and he has perhaps nothing else to impart, wherein, to be sure, there is more privation and renunciation. If, nevertheless, more is demanded from him, he will point with a friendly shake of his head to his brother, the free man of action, and will perhaps not conceal a little derision, for as regards this freedom, it is a very peculiar case. End of First Division, First and Last Things, Part 2《2nd Division, The History of the Moral Sentiments, Part 1, of Human All to Human, A Book for Free Spirits, by Friedrich Nietzsche, translated by Helen Zimmern, 1846-1934. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Aaron Rivetta. — 2nd Division, The History of the Moral Sentiments 35. Advantages of Psychological Observation that reflection on the human, all too human, or, according to the learned expression, psychological observation, is one of the means by which one may lighten the burden of life. That exercise in this art produces presence of mind in difficult circumstances, in the midst of tiresome surroundings, even that from the most thorny and unpleasant periods of one's own life one may gather maxims and thereby feel a little better. All this was believed, was known in former centuries. Why was it forgotten by our century? when in Germany, at least, even in all Europe, the poverty of psychological observation betrays itself by many signs. Not exactly in novels, tales, and philosophical treaties. They are the work of exceptional individuals. Rather, in the judgments on public events and personalities. But above all, there is a lack of the art of psychological analysis and summing up in every rank of society, in which a great deal is talked about men, but nothing about man. Why do we allow the richest and most harmless subject of conversation to escape us? Why are not the greatest masters of psychological maxim more read? For, without any exaggeration, the educated man in Europe who has read La Rochefoucauld and his kindred in mind and art is rarely found, and still more rare is he who knows them and does not blame them. It is probable, however, that even this exceptional reader will find much less pleasure in them than the form of this artist who should afford him. For even the clearest head is not capable of rightly estimating the art of shaping and polishing maxims unless he has really been brought up to it and has competed in it. Without this practical teaching, one deems this shaping and polishing to be easier than it is. One has not a sufficient perception of fitness and charm. For this reason, the present readers of maxims find in them a comparatively small pleasure, hardly a mouthful of pleasantness so that they resemble the people who generally look at cameos who praise because they cannot love, and are very ready to admire, but still more ready to run away. 36. Objection Or should there be a counter-reckoning to that theory that places psychological observation amongst the means of charming, curing, and relieving existence? Should one have sufficiently convinced oneself of the unpleasant consequences of this art to divert from it designedly the attention of him who is educating himself in it? As a matter of fact, a certain blind belief in the goodness of human nature, an innate aversion to the analysis of human actions, a kind of shamefacedness with respect to the nakedness of the soul may really be more desirable for the general well-being of a man than the quality, useful in isolated cases, of psychological sharp-sightedness, 
and perhaps the belief in goodness, in virtuous men and deeds, in an abundance of impersonal goodwill in the world, has made men better inasmuch as it has made them less distrustful. When one imitates Plutarch's heroes with enthusiasm, and turns with disgust from a suspicious examination of the motives for their actions, it is not truth which benefits thereby, but the welfare of human society, the psychological mistake, and generally speaking, the insensibility on this matter helps humanity forwards, while the recognition of truth gains more through the stimulating power of hypothesis than La Rochefoucauld has said in his preface to the first edition of his Sentence et Maxime Morale. Ce que le monde nomme vertu n'est de ordinaire qu'un fantôme formé par nos passions à qui on donnait un nom honnête pour faire impuniment ce qu'on veut. La Rochefoucauld and those other French masters of soul examination who have lately been joined by a German, the author of Psychological Observations, resemble good marksmen who again and again hit the bullseye. But it is the bullseye of human nature. Their art arouses astonishment. But in the end, a spectator who is not led by the spirit of science, but by humane intentions, will probably execrate an art which appears to implant in the soul the sense of the disparagement and suspicion of mankind. 37. Nevertheless, however it may be with reckoning and counter-reckoning, in the present condition of philosophy the awakening of moral observation is necessary. Humanity can no longer be spared the cruel sight of the psychological dissecting table with its knives and forceps. For here rules that science which inquires into the origin and history of the so-called moral sentiments, and which, in its progress, has to draw up and solve complicated sociological problems. The older philosophy knows the latter one not at all, and has always avoided the examination of the origin and history of moral sentiments on any feeble pretext. With what consequences it is now very easy to see, after it has been shown by many examples how the mistakes of the greatest philosophers generally have their starting point in a wrong explanation of certain human actions and sensations, just as on the ground of an erroneous analysis, for instance, that of the so-called unselfish actions a false ethic is built up, then, to harmonize with this again, religion and mythological confusion are brought in to assist. And finally, the shades of these dismal spirits fall also over physics and the general mode of regarding the world. If it is certain, however, that superficiality and psychological observation has laid, and still lays, the most dangerous snares for human judgment and conclusions, then there is need now of that endurance of work which does not grow weary of piling stone upon stone, pebble on pebble. There is need of courage not to be ashamed of such humble work and to turn a deaf ear to scorn. And this is also true. Numberless single observations on the human and all too human have first been discovered and given utterance to in circles of society which were accustomed to offer sacrifice therewith to a clever desire to please and not to scientific knowledge. And the odor of that old home of the moral maxim, a very seductive odor, has attached itself almost inseparably to the whole species, so that on its account the scientific man involuntarily betrays a certain distrust of this species and its earnestness. But it is sufficient to point to the consequences, for already it begins to be seen what results of a serious kind spring from the ground of psychological observation. What, after all, is the principal axiom to which the boldest and coldest thinker, the author of the book On the Origin of Moral Sensations, has attained by means of his incisive and decisive analysis of human actions. The moral man, he says, is no nearer to the intelligible, metaphysical, world than is the physical man. This theory, hardened and sharpened under the hammer blow of historical knowledge, may sometime or other, perhaps in some future period, serve as the axe which is applied to the root of the metaphysical need of man. Whether more as a blessing than a curse to the general welfare, it is not easy to say but in any case as a theory with the most important consequences, at once fruitful and terrible, and looking into the world with that Janus face which all great knowledge possesses. 38. How far useful? It must remain forever undecided whether psychological observation is advantageous or disadvantageous to man, but it is certain that it is necessary, because science cannot do without it. Science, however, has no consideration for ultimate purpose any more than nature has, but just as the latter occasionally achieves things of the greatest suitableness without intending to do so, so also true science, as the imitator of nature and ideas, 
will occasionally and in many ways further the usefulness and welfare of man, but also without intending to do so. But whoever feels too chilled by the breath of such a reflection has perhaps too little fire in himself. Let him look around him meanwhile, and he will become aware of illnesses which have need of ice poultices, and of men who are so needed together, of heat and spirit that they can hardly find an atmosphere that is cold and biting enough. Moreover, as individuals and nations that are too serious have need of frivolities, as others too mobile and excitable have need occasionally of heavily oppressing burdens for the sake of their health, should not we, the more intellectual people of this age, that grows visibly more and more inflamed, seize all quenching and cooling means that exist, in order that we may at least remain as constant, harmless, and moderate as we still are, and thus, perhaps, serve some time or other as mirror and self-contemplation for this age? 39. The Fable of Intelligible Freedom The history of the sentiments by means of which we make a person responsible consists of the following principal phases. First, all single actions are called good or bad without any regard to their motives, but only on account of the useful or injurious consequences which result for the community. But soon the origin of these distinctions is forgotten, and it is deemed that the qualities good or bad are contained in the action itself without regard to its consequences, by the same air according to which language describes the stone as hard, the tree as green, with which, in short, the result is regarded as the cause. Then the goodness or badness is implanted in the motive, and the action in itself is looked upon as morally ambiguous. Mankind even goes further, and applies the predicate good or bad no longer to single motives, but to the whole nature of an individual, out of whom the motive grows as the plant grows out of the earth. Thus, in turn, man is made responsible for his operations, then for his actions, then for his motives, and finally for his nature. Eventually, it is discovered that even this nature cannot be responsible, inasmuch as it is an absolutely necessary consequence concreted out of the elements and influences of past and present things. That man, therefore, cannot be made responsible for anything, neither for his nature, nor his motives, nor his actions, nor his effects. It has therewith come to be recognized that the history of moral valuations is at the same time the history of an error, the error of responsibility, which is based upon the error of the freedom of will. Schopenhauer thus decided against it, because certain actions bring ill humor, consciousness of guilt, in their train. There must be responsibility, for there would be no reason for this ill humor if not only all human actions were not done of necessity, which is actually the case and also the belief of this philosopher. But man himself from the same necessity is precisely the being that he is, which Schopenhauer denies. From the fact of that ill humor, Schopenhauer thinks he can prove a liberty which man must somehow have had, not with regard to actions, but with regard to nature. Liberty, therefore, to be thus or otherwise, not to act thus or otherwise. From the essay, the sphere of freedom and responsibility, there results, in his opinion, the operari, the sphere of strict causality, necessity, and irresponsibility. This ill humor is apparently directed to the operari, insofar as it is erroneous, but in reality it is directed to the essay, which is the deed of a free will, the fundamental cause of the existence of an individual. Man becomes that which he wishes to be. His will is anterior to his existence. Here the mistaken conclusion is drawn that from the fact of the ill humor, the justification, the reasonable admissibleness of this ill humor is presupposed, and starting from this mistaken conclusion, Schopenhauer arrives at his fantastic sequence of the so-called intelligible freedom. But the ill humor after the deed is not necessarily reasonable. Indeed, it is assuredly not reasonable, for it is based upon the erroneous presumption that the action need not have inevitably followed. Therefore, it is only because man believes himself to be free, not because he is free, that he experiences remorse and pricks of conscience. Moreover, this ill humor is a habit that can be broken off. In many people, it is entirely absent in connection with actions where others experience it. It is a very changeable thing, and one which is connected with the development of customs and culture, and probably only existing during a comparatively short period of the world's history. No one is responsible for his actions, nobody for his nature, 
To judge is identical with being unjust. This also applies when an individual judges himself. The theory is as clear as sunlight, and yet everyone prefers to go back into the shadow and the untruth for fear of the consequences. 40. The Super Animal The beast in us wishes to be deceived. Morality is a lie of necessity in order that we may not be torn in pieces by it. Without the errors which lie in the assumption of morality, man would have remained an animal. Thus, however, he has considered himself as something higher and has laid strict laws upon himself. Therefore, he hates the grades which have rendered near to animalness, whereby the former scorn of the slave, as not yet man, is to be explained as a fact. 41. The Unchangeable Character that the character is unchangeable is not true in a strict sense. This favorite theory means, rather, that during the short lifetime of an individual the new influencing motives cannot penetrate deeply enough to destroy the ingrained marks of many thousands of years. But if one were to imagine a man of 80,000 years, one would have in him an absolutely changeable character, so that a number of different individuals would gradually develop out of him. The shortness of human life misleads us into forming many erroneous ideas about the qualities of man. 42. The Order of Possessions and Morality The once accepted hierarchy of possessions, according as this or the other is coveted by a lower, higher, or highest egoism, now decides what is moral or immoral. To prefer a lesser good, for instance, the gratification of the senses, to a more highly valued good, for instance, health, is accounted immoral and also to prefer luxury to liberty. The hierarchy of possessions, however, is not fixed and equal at all times. If anyone prefers vengeance to justice, he is moral according to the standard of an earlier civilization, but immoral according to the present one. To be immoral, therefore, denotes that an individual has not felt or not felt sufficiently strongly the higher, finer spiritual motives which have come in with a new culture. It marks one who has remained behind, but only according to the difference of degrees. The order of possessions itself is not raised and lowered according to a moral point of view, but each time that it is fixed it supplies the decision as to whether an action is moral or immoral. 43. Cruel people as those who have remained behind. People who are cruel nowadays must be accounted for by us as the grades of earlier civilizations which have survived. Here are exposed those deeper formations in the mountains of humanity which usually remain concealed. They are backward people whose brains, through all manner of accidents in the course of inheritance, have not been developed in so delicate and manifold a way. They show us what we all were and horrify us but they themselves are as little responsible as is a block of granite for being granite. There must, too, be grooves and twists in our brains which answer to that condition of mind, as in the form of certain human organs there are supposed to be traces of a fish state. But these grooves and twists are no longer the bed through which the stream of our sensation flows. 44. Gratitude and Revenge the reason why the powerful man is grateful is this. His benefactor, through the benefit he confers, has mistaken and intruded into the sphere of the powerful man. Now the latter, in return, penetrates into the sphere of the benefactor by the act of gratitude. It is a milder form of revenge. Without the satisfaction of gratitude, the powerful man would have shown himself powerless and would have been reckoned as such even after. Therefore, every society of the good which originally meant the powerful, places gratitude amongst the first duties. Swift propounded the maxim that men were grateful in the same proportion as they were revengeful. 45. The Twofold Early History of Good and Evil The conception of good and evil has a twofold early history, namely, once in the soul of the ruling tribes and caste. Whoever has the power of returning good for evil evil for evil, and really practices requital, and who is, therefore, grateful and revengeful, is called good. Whoever is powerless and unable to requite is reckoned as bad. As a good man one is reckoned among the good, 
a community which has common feelings because the single individuals are bound to one another by the sense of requital. As a bad man, one belongs to the bad, to a party of subordinate, powerless people who have no common feeling. The good are a caste, the bad are a mass like dust. Good and bad have for a long time meant the same thing as noble and base, master and slave. On the other hand, the enemy is not looked upon as evil, he can requite. In Homer, the Trojan and the Greek are both good. It is not the one who injures us, but the one who is despicable, who is called bad. Good is inherited in the community of the good. It is impossible that a bad man could spring from such good soil. If, nevertheless, one of the good ones does something which is unworthy of the good, refuge is sought in excuses. The guilt is thrown upon a god, for instance. It is said that he has struck the good man with blindness and madness. Then, in the soul of the oppressed and powerless, here every other man is looked upon as hostile, inconsiderate, rapacious, cruel, cunning, be he noble or base. Evil is the distinguishing word for man, even for every conceivable living creature, e.g. for a god. Human, divine, is the same thing as devilish, evil. The signs of goodness, helpfulness, pity, are looked upon with fear as spite, the prelude to a terrible result, stupefaction and outwitting, in short, as refined malice. With such a disposition in the individual, a community could hardly exist, or at most it could exist only in its crudest form, so that in all places where the conception of good and evil obtains, the downfall of the single individuals, of their tribes and races, is at hand. Our present civilization has grown up on the soil of the ruling tribes and castes. 46. Sympathy Stronger Than Suffering There are cases when sympathy is stronger than actual suffering. For instance, we are more pained when one of our friends is guilty of something shameful than when we do it ourselves. For one thing, we have more faith in the purity of his character than he has himself. Then our love for him probably on account of this very faith, is stronger than his love for himself. And even if his egoism suffers more thereby than our egoism, inasmuch as it is to bear more of the bad consequences of his fault, the unegotistic in us, this word is not to be taken too seriously, but only as a modification of the expression, is more deeply wounded by his guilt than is the unegotistic in him. 47. Hypochondria there are people who became hypochondrical through their sympathy and concern for another person. The kind of sympathy which results therefrom is nothing but a disease. Thus, there is also a Christian hypochondria, which afflicts those solitary, religiously-minded people who keep constantly before their eyes the suffering and death of Christ. 48. Economy of Goodness Goodness and Love as the most healing herbs and powers in human intercourse are such costly discoveries that one would wish as much economy as possible to be exercised in the employment of these balsamic means. But this is impossible. The economy of goodness is the dream of the most daring utopians. 49. Goodwill Amongst the small, but countlessly frequent, and therefore very effective things to which science should pay more attention than to the great, rare things, is to be reckoned goodwill. I mean that exhibition of a friendly disposition in intercourse, that smiling eye, that clasp of the hand, that cheerfulness with which most all human actions are usually accompanied. Every teacher, every official, adds this to whatever is his duty. It is the perpetual occupation of humanity and at the same time the waves of its light, in which everything grows. In the narrowest circle, namely, within the family, life blooms and flourishes only through that goodwill. Kindliness, friendliness, the courtesy of the heart, are ever-flowing streams of unegotistical impulses, and have given far more powerful assistance to culture than even those much more famous demonstrations which are called pity, mercy, and self-sacrifice. But they are thought little of, and, as a matter of fact, there is not much that is unegotistic in them. The sum of these small doses is nevertheless mighty. Their united force is amongst the strongest forces. 
Thus one finds much more happiness in the world than sad eyes see. If one only reckons rightly, and does not forget all those moments of comfort in which every day is rich, even in the most harried of human lives. 50. The Wish to Arouse Pity In the most remarkable passage of his auto, Portrait, first printed in 1658, La Rochefoucauld assuredly hits the nail on the head when he warns all sensible people against pity, when he advises them to leave that to those orders of the people who have need of passion, because it is not ruled by reason, and to reach the point of helping the suffering and acting energetically in an accident, while pity, according to his, and Plato's, judgment, weakens the soul. Certainly we should exhibit pity, but take good care not to feel it. For the unfortunate are so stupid that to them the exhibition of pity is the greatest good in the world. One can, perhaps, give a more forcible warning against this feeling of pity if one looks upon that need of the unfortunate not exactly as stupidity and lack of intellect, a kind of mental derangement which misfortune brings with it, and as such, indeed, La Rochefoucauld appears to regard it, but as something quite different and more serious. Observe children who cry and scream in order to be pitied, and therefore wait for the moment when they will be noticed. Live in intercourse with the sick and mentally oppressed, and ask yourself whether that ready complaining and whimpering, that making a show of misfortune, does not, at bottom, aim at making the spectators miserable. The pity which the spectators then exhibit is in so far a consolation for the weak and suffering in that the latter recognize therein that they possess still one power, in spite of their weakness, the power of giving pain. The unfortunate derives a sort of pleasure from this feeling of superiority, of which the exhibition of pity makes him conscious. His imagination is exalted. He is still powerful enough to give the world pain. Thus, the thirst for pity is the thirst for self-gratification, and that, moreover, at the expense of his fellow men. It shows man in the whole inconsiderateness of his own dear self, but not exactly in his stupidity, as La Rochefoucauld thinks. In society talk, three-fourths of all questions asked and of all answers given are intended to cause the interlocutor a little pain. For this reason, so many people pine for company. It enables them to feel their power. There is a powerful charm of life in such countless but very small doses in which malice makes itself felt, just as good will, spread in the same way throughout the world, is the ever-ready means of healing. But are there many honest people who will admit that it is pleasing to give pain? That one not infrequently amuses oneself, and amuses oneself very well, in causing mortifications to others, at least in thought, and firing off at them the grape shot of petty malice? Most people are too dishonest, and a few are too good, to know anything of this pudendum. These will always deny that Prosper Merrimé is right when he says, Sachez aussi qu'il n'y a rien de plus comment que de faire le mal pour la placer de le faire. 51. How Appearance Becomes Actuality The actor finally reaches such a point that even in the deepest sorrow he cannot cease from thinking about the impression made by his own person and the general scenic effect. For instance, even at the funeral of his child, he will weep over his own sorrow and its expression like one of his own audience. The hypocrite, who always plays one in the same part, ceases at last to be a hypocrite. For instance, priests who as young men are generally conscious or unconscious hypocrites, become at last natural, and are then really without any affectation, just priests. Or if the father does not succeed so far, perhaps the son does, who makes use of his father's progress and inherits his habits. If any one long and obstinately desires to appear something, he finds it difficult at last to be anything else. The profession of almost every individual even the artist, begins with hypocrisy, with an imitating from without, with a copying of the effective. He who always wears the mask of a friendly expression must eventually obtain a power over well-meaning dispositions without which the expression of friendliness is not to be compelled. And finally, these, again, obtain a power over him. 
He is well-meaning. 52. The Point of Honor in Deception In all great deceivers, one thing is noteworthy, to which they owe their power. In the actual act of deception, with all their preparations, the dreadful voice, expression, and mind, in the midst of their effective scenery, they are overcome by their belief in themselves. It is this, then, which speaks so wonderfully and persuasively to the spectators. The founders of religions are distinguished from those great deceivers in that they never awake from their condition of self-deception. Or at times, but very rarely, they have an enlightened moment when doubt overpowers them. They generally console themselves, however, by ascribing these enlightened moments to the influence of the evil one. There must be self-deception in order that this and that may produce great effects. For men believe in the truth of everything that is visibly, strongly believed in. 53. The Nominal Degrees of Truth One of the commonest mistakes is this. Because someone is truthful and honest towards us, he must speak the truth. Thus, the child believes in its parents' judgment, the Christian in the assertions of the founder of the church. In the same way, men refuse to admit that all those things which men defend in former ages with the sacrifice of life and happiness were nothing but errors. It is even said, perhaps, that they were degrees of the truth. But what is really meant is that when a man has honestly believed in something and has fought and died for his faith, it would really be too unjust if he had only been inspired by an error. Such a thing seems a contradiction of eternal justice. Therefore, the heart of sensitive man ever enunciates against his head the axiom. Between moral action and intellectual insight there must absolutely be a necessary connection. It is unfortunately otherwise, for there is no eternal justice. 54. Falsehood why do people mostly speak the truth in daily life? Assuredly not because a God has forbidden falsehood, but, firstly, because it is more convenient, as falsehood requires invention, deceit, and memory. As Swift says, he who tells a lie is not sensible how great a task he undertakes, for in order to uphold one lie he must invent twenty others. Therefore, because it is advantageous in upright circumstances to say straight out, I want this, I have done that, and so on, because, in other words, the path of compulsion and authority is surer than that of cunning. But if a child has been brought up in complicated domestic circumstances, he employs falsehood, naturally and unconsciously says whatever best suits his interest. A sense of truth and a hatred of falsehood are quite foreign and unknown to him, and so he lies in all innocence. 55. Throwing Suspicion on Morality for Faith's Sake No power can be maintained when it is only represented by hypocrites. No matter how many worldly elements the Catholic Church possesses, its strength lies in those still numerous priestly natures who render life hard and full of meaning for themselves, and whose glance and worn bodies speak of nocturnal vigils, hunger, burning prayers, and perhaps even of scourging. These move men and inspire them with fear. What if it were necessary to live thus? This is the terrible question which their aspect brings to the lips. Whilst they spread this doubt, they always uprear another pillar of their power. Even the freethinker does not dare to withstand such unselfishness with hard words of truth and to say, Thyself deceived, deceive no others. Only the difference of views divides them from him, certainly no difference of goodness or badness, but men generally treat unjustly that which they do not like. Thus we speak of the cunning and the infamous art of the Jesuits, but overlook the self-control which every individual Jesuit practices, and the fact that the lightened manner of life preached by Jesuit books is by no means for their benefit, but for that of the laity. We may even ask whether, with precisely similar tactics and organization, we enlightened ones would make equally good tools, equally admirable through self-conquest, defatigableness, and renunciation. 
56. Victory of Knowledge over Radical Evil It is of great advantage to him who desires to be wise to have witnessed for a time the spectacle of a thoroughly evil and degenerate man. It is false, like the contrary spectacle, but for whole long periods it held the mastery, and its roots have even extended and ramified themselves to us and our world. In order to understand ourselves, we must understand it, but then, in order to mount higher, we must rise above it. We must recognize, then, that there exist no sins in the metaphysical sense, but, in the same sense, also no virtues. We recognize that the entire domain of ethical ideas is perpetually tottering, that there are higher and deeper conceptions of good and evil, of moral and immoral. He who does not desire much more from things than a knowledge of them easily makes peace with his soul, and will make a mistake, or commit a sin as the world calls it, at the most from ignorance, but hardly from covetousness. He will no longer wish to excommunicate and exterminate desires, but is only his wholly dominating ambition, to know as well as possible at all times, will make him cool and will soften all the savageness in his disposition. Moreover, he has been freed from a number of tormenting conceptions. He has no more feeling at the mention of the words punishments of hell, sinfulness, incapacity for good. He recognizes in them only the vanishing shadow pictures of false views of the world and of life. 57. Morality as the self-disintegration of man. A good author, who really has his heart in his work, wishes that someone could come and annihilate him by representing the same thing in a clear way, and answering without more ado the problems therein proposed. The loving girl wishes she could prove the self-sacrificing faithfulness of her love by the unfaithfulness of her beloved. The soldier hopes to die on the field of battle for his victorious fatherland, for his loftiest desires triumph in the victory of his country. The mother gives to the child that of which she deprives herself, sleep, the best food, sometimes her health and fortune. But are all these unegotistic conditions? Are these deeds of morality miracles because, to use Schopenhauer's expression, they are impossible and yet performed? Is it not clear that in all four cases the individual loves something of himself, a thought, a desire, a production, better than anything else of himself, that he therefore divides his nature and to one part sacrifices all the rest? Is it something entirely different when an obstinate man says, I would rather be shot than move a step out of my way for this man? The desire for something, wish, inclination, longing, is present in all the instances mentioned. To give way to it, with all its consequences, is certainly not unegotistic. In ethics, man does not consider himself an individuum, but as a dividuum. 58. What one may promise. One may promise actions, but no sentiments, for these are involuntary. Whoever promises to love or hate a person, or be faithful to him forever, promises something which is not within his power. He can certainly promise such actions as are usually the results of love, hate, or fidelity, but which may also spring from other motives, for many ways and motives lead to one and the same action. The promise to love someone forever is, therefore, really, so long as I love you, I will act towards you in a loving way. If I cease to love you, you will still receive the same treatment from me, although inspired by other motives, so that our fellow man will still be deluded into the belief that our love is unchanged and ever the same. One promises, therefore, the continuation of the semblance of love, when, without self-deception, one speaks vows of eternal love. 59. Intellect and Morality one must have a good memory to be able to keep a given promise. One must have a strong power of imagination to be able to feel pity. So closely is morality bound to the goodness of the intellect. 
60. To wish for revenge and to take revenge. To have a revengeful thought and carry it into effect is to have a violent attack of fever, which passes off, however. But to have a revengeful thought without the strength and courage to carry it out is a chronic disease, a poisoning of body and soul, which we have to bear about with us. Morality, which only takes intentions into account, considers the two cases as equal. Usually the former case is regarded as the worse because of the evil consequences which may perhaps result from the deed of revenge. Both estimates are short-sighted. 61. The Power of Waiting Waiting is so difficult that even great poets have not disdained to take incapability of waiting as the motive for their works. Thus, Shakespeare and Othello, or Sophocles and Ajax, to whom suicide had he been able to let his feelings cool down for one day would no longer have seemed necessary, as the oracle intimated, he would probably have snapped his fingers at the terrible whisperings of wounded vanity and said to himself, Who is not already in my circumstances mistaken a fool for a hero? Is it something so very extraordinary? On the contrary, it is something very commonly human. Ajax might allow himself that consolation. Passion will not wait. The tragedy in the lives of great men frequently lies not in their conflict with the times and the baseness of their fellow men, but in their incapacity of postponing their work for a year or two. They cannot wait. In all duels, advising friends have one thing to decide, namely whether the parties concerned can still wait a while. If this is not the case then a duel is advisable, inasmuch as each of the two says, either I continue to live and that other man must die immediately, or vice versa. In such case, waiting could mean a prolonged suffering of the terrible martyrdom of wounded honor in the face of the insulter, and this may entail more suffering than life is worth. 62. Reveling in Vengeance Coarser individuals who feel themselves insulted make out the insult to be as great as possible, and relate the affair in greatly exaggerated language in order to be able to revel thoroughly in the rarely awakened feelings of hatred and revenge. 63. The Value of Disparagement In order to maintain their self-respect in their own eyes and a certain thoroughness of action, not a few men, perhaps even the majority, find it absolutely necessary to run down and disparage all their acquaintances. But as mean natures are numerous, and since it is very important whether they possess that thoroughness or lose it, hence, 64, the man in a passion, we must beware of one who is in a passion against us as of one who has once sought our life. For the fact that we still live is due to the absence of power to kill. If looks would suffice, we should have been dead long ago. It is a piece of rough civilization to force someone into silence by the exhibition of physical savageness and the inspiring of fear. That cold glance which exalted persons employ towards their servants is also a relic of that caste division between man and man, a piece of rough antiquity. Women, the preservers of ancient things, have also faithfully retained this survival of an ancient habit. 65. Whither Honesty Can Lead Somebody had the bad habit of occasionally talking quite frankly about the motives of his actions, which were as good and as bad as the motives of most men. He first gave offense, then aroused suspicion, was then gradually excluded from society and declared a social outlaw, until at last justice remembered such an abandoned creature, on occasions when it would otherwise have had no eyes or would have closed them. The lack of power to hold his tongue concerning the common secret, and the irresponsible tendency to see what no one wishes to see himself, brought him to a prison and an early death. 66. Punishable, but never punished. Our crime against criminals lies in the fact that we treat them like rascals. 67. Sancta simplicitas, a virtue. Every virtue has its privileges. For example, 
that of contributing its own little faggot to the scaffold of every condemned man. 68. Morality and Consequences It is not only the spectators of a deed who frequently judge of its morality or immorality according to its consequences, but the doer of the deed himself does so. For the motives and intentions are seldom sufficiently clear and simple, and sometimes memory itself seems clouded by the consequences of the deed, so that one ascribes the deed to false motives or looks upon unessential motives as essential. Success often gives an action the whole honest glamour of a good conscience. Failure casts the shadow of remorse over the most esteemable deed. Hence arises the well-known practice of the politician, who thinks, Only grant me success. With that, I bring all honest souls over to my side and make myself honest in my own eyes. In the same way, success must replace a better argument. Many educated people still believe that the triumph of Christianity over the Greek philosophy is proof of the greater truthfulness of the former, although in this case it is only the coarser and more powerful that has triumphed over the more spiritual and delicate. Which possesses the greater truth may be seen from the fact that the awakening sciences have agreed with Epicurus' philosophy on point after point, but on point after point have rejected Christianity. End of Second Division, The History of the Moral Sentiments, Part 1《2nd Division, The History of the Moral Sentiments, Part 2 of Human All Too Human, A Book for Free Spirits, by Friedrich Nietzsche, translated by Helen Zimmern, 1846-1934. to 1934. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Aaron Rivetta. Second Division, The History of the Moral Sentiments, Part 2. 69. Love and Justice why do we overestimate love to the disadvantage of justice, and say the most beautiful things about it, as if it were something very much higher than the latter? Is it not visibly more stupid than justice? Certainly, but precisely for that reason all the pleasanter for everyone. It is blind, and possesses an abundant cornucopia, out of which it distributes its gifts to all, even if they do not deserve them, even if they express no thanks for them. It is as impartial as the rain, which, according to the Bible and experience, makes not only the unjust, but also occasionally the just wet through the skin. 70. Execution How is it that every execution offends us more than does a murder? It is the coldness of the judges, the painful preparations, the conviction that a human being is here being used as a warning to scare others. For the guilt is not punished, even if it existed. It lies with educators, parents, surroundings, in ourselves, not in the murderer. I mean the determining circumstances. 71. Hope Pandora brought the box of ills and opened it. It was the gift of the gods to men, outwardly a beautiful and seductive gift, and called the casket of happiness. Out of it flew all the evils living winged creatures, thence they now circulate and do men injury day and night. One single evil had not yet escaped from the box, and by the will of Zeus Pandora closed the lid and it remained within. Now forever man has the casket of happiness in his house, and thinks he holds a great treasure. It is at his disposal, he stretches out his hand for it whenever he desires. For he does not know the box which Pandora brought was the casket of evil, and he believes the ill which remains within to be the greatest blessing. It is hope. Zeus did not wish man, however much he might be tormented by the other evils, to fling away his life, but to go on letting himself be tormented again and again. Therefore he gives man hope. In reality, it is the worst of all evils, because it prolongs the torments of man. 72. The Degree of Moral Inflammability Unknown According to whether we have or have not had certain disturbing views and impressions, for instance, an unjustly executed, killed, or martyred father, a faithless wife, a cruel hostile attack, it depends whether our passions reach fever heat and influence our whole life or not. 
No one knows to what he may be driven by circumstances, pity, or indignation. He does not know the degree of his own inflammability. Miserable little circumstances make us miserable. It is generally not the quantity of experiences, but their quality on which lower and higher man depends, in good and evil. 73. The Martyr in Spite of Himself There was a man belonging to a party who was too nervous and cowardly ever to contradict his comrades. They made use of him for everything. They demanded everything from him, because he was more afraid of the bad opinion of his companions than of death itself. His was a miserable, feeble soul. They recognized this, and on the ground of these qualities they made a hero of him, and finally even a martyr. Although the coward inwardly always said no, with his lips he always said yes, even on the scaffold, when he was about to die for the opinions of his party. For beside him stood one of his old companions, who so tyrannized over him by word and look that he really suffered death in the most respectable manner, and has ever since been celebrated as a martyr and a great character. 74. I, the Everyday Standard One will seldom go wrong if one attributes extreme actions to vanity, average ones to habit, and petty ones to fear. 75. Misunderstanding Concerning Virtue Whoever has known immorality in connection with pleasure, as is the case with a man who has a pleasure-seeking youth behind him, imagines that virtue must be connected with absence of pleasure. Whoever, on the contrary, has been much plagued by his passions and vices, longs to find in virtue peace and the soul's happiness. Hence, it is possible for two virtuous persons not to understand each other at all. 76. The Ascetic The ascetic makes a necessity of virtue. 77. Transferring honor from the person to the thing. Deeds of love and sacrifice for the benefit of one's neighbor are generally honored wherever they are manifested. Thereby we multiply the valuation of things which are thus loved, or for which we sacrifice ourselves, although perhaps they are not worth much in themselves. A brave army is convinced of the cause for which it fights. 78. Ambition, a substitute for the moral sense. The moral sense must not be lacking in those natures which have no ambition. The ambitious manage without it, with almost the same results. For this reason, the sons of unpretentious, unambitious families, when once they lose the moral sense, generally degenerate very quickly into complete scamps. 79. Vanity in Riches How poor would be the human mind without vanity! Thus, however, it resembles a well-stocked and constantly replenished bazaar which attracts buyers of every kind. There they can find almost everything, obtain almost everything, provided that they bring the right sort of coin, namely, admiration. 80. Old Age and Death Apart from the commands of religion, the question may well be asked, why is it more worthy for an old man who feels his powers decline to await his slow exhaustion and extinction than with full consciousness to set a limit to his life? Suicide in this case is a perfectly natural, obvious action, which should justly arouse respect as a triumph of reason, and did arouse it in those times when the heads of Greek philosophy and the sturdiest patriots used to seek death through suicide. The seeking, on the contrary, to prolong existence from day to day, with anxious consultation of doctors and a painful mode of living, without the power of drawing near to the actual aim of life, is far less worthy. Religion is rich in excuses to reply to the demand for suicide, and thus it ingratiates itself with those who wish to cling to life. 81. Errors of the Sufferer and the Doer When a rich man deprives a poor man of a possession, for instance, a prince taking the sweetheart of a plebeian, an error arises in the mind of the poor man. He thinks that the rich man must be utterly infamous to take away from him the little that he has. But the rich man does not estimate so highly the value of a single possession, because he is accustomed to have many. Hence he cannot imagine himself in the poor man's place, and does not commit nearly so great a wrong as the latter supposes. They each have a mistaken idea of the other. The injustice of the powerful, which, more than anything else, rouses indignation in history, is by no means so great as it appears. 
Alone, the mere inherited consciousness of being a higher creation, with higher claims, produces a cold temperament and leaves the conscience quiet. We all of us feel no injustice when the difference is very great between ourselves and another creature, and kill a fly, for instance, without any pricks of conscience. Therefore, it was no sign of badness in Xerxes, whom even all Greeks describe as superlatively noble, when he took away a son from his father and had him cut in pieces, because he had expressed a nervous, ominous distrust of the whole campaign. In this case, the individual is put out of the way like an unpleasant insect. He is too lowly to be allowed any longer to cause annoyance to a ruler of the world. Yes, every cruel man is not so cruel as the ill-treated one imagines the idea of pain is not the same as its endurance. It is the same thing in the case of unjust judges, of the journalist who leads public opinion astray by small dishonesties. In all these cases, cause and effect are surrounded by entirely different groups of feelings and thoughts. Yet one unconsciously takes it for granted that doer and sufferer think and feel alike, and according to this supposition we measure the guilt of the one by the pain of the other. 82. The Skin of the Soul as the bones, flesh, entrails, and blood vessels are enclosed within a skin, which makes the aspect of man endurable, so the emotions and passions of the soul are enwrapped with vanity. It is the skin of the soul. 83. The Sleep of Virtue When virtue has slept, it will arise again all the fresher. 84. The Refinement of Shame People are not ashamed to think something foul, but they are ashamed when they think these foul things are attributed to them. 85. Malice is rare. Most people are far too much occupied with themselves to be malicious. 86. The tongue in the balance. We praise or blame according as the one or other affords more opportunity for exhibiting our power of judgment. 87. St. Luke the 18th, 14, improved. He that humbleth himself wishes to be exalted. 88. The Prevention of Suicide There is a certain right by which we may deprive a man of life, but none by which we may deprive him of death. This is mere cruelty. 89. Vanity We care for the good opinion of men. Firstly, because they are useful to us, and then because we wish to please them. Children, their parents, pupils, their teachers, and well-meaning people, generally their fellow men. Only where the good opinion of men is of importance to someone, apart from the advantage thereof or his wish to please, can we speak of vanity. In this case, the man wishes to please himself, but at the expense of his fellow men, either by misleading them into holding a false opinion about him, or by aiming at a degree of good opinion which must be painful to everyone else, by arousing envy. The individual usually wishes to corroborate the opinion he holds of himself by the opinion of others, and to strengthen it in his own eyes. But the strong habit of authority, a habit as old as man himself, induces many to support by authority their belief in themselves. That is to say, they accept it first from others. They trust the judgment of others more than their own. The interest in himself, the wish to please himself, attains to such a height in a vain man that he misleads others by having a false, all too elevated estimation of him, and yet nevertheless sets store by their authority, thus causing an error and yet believing in it. It must be confessed, therefore, that vain people do not wish to please others so much as themselves, and that they go so far therein as to neglect their advantage, for they often endeavor to prejudice their fellow man unfavorably, inimicably, enviously, consequently injuriously against themselves, merely in order to have pleasure in themselves, personal pleasure. 90. The Limits of Human Love A man who has declared that another is an idiot and a bad companion is angry when the latter eventually proves himself to be otherwise. 91. Moralité larmoyante. What a great deal of pleasure morality gives! Only think what a sea of pleasant tears has been shed over descriptions of noble and unselfish deeds. This charm of life would vanish if the belief in absolute irresponsibility were to obtain supremacy. 92. The Origin of Justice 
Justice, equity, has its origin amongst powers which are fairly equal. As Thucydides, in the terrible dialogue between the Athenian and Milanian ambassadors, rightly comprehended, that is to say, where there is no clearly recognizable supremacy and where a conflict would be useless and would injure both sides, there arises the thought of coming to an understanding and settling the opposing claims. The character of exchange is the primary character of justice. Each party satisfies the other, as each obtains what he values more than the other. Each one receives that which he desires, as his own henceforth, and whatever is desired is received in return. Justice, therefore, is recompense and exchange based on the hypothesis of a fairly equal degree of power. Thus, originally, revenge belongs to the province of justice. It is an exchange, also gratitude. Justice naturally is based on the point of view of a judicious self-preservation, on the egoism, therefore, of that reflection. Why should I injure myself uselessly and perhaps not attain my aim after all? So much about the origin of justice. Because man, according to his intellectual custom, has forgotten the original purpose of so-called just and reasonable actions, and particularly because for hundreds of years children have been taught to admire and imitate such actions, the idea has gradually arisen that such an action is unegoistic. Upon this idea, however, is based the high estimation in which it is held, which, moreover, like all valuations, is constantly growing, for something that is valued highly is striven after, imitated, multiplied, and increases, because the value of the output of the toil and enthusiasm of each individual is added to the value of the thing itself. How little moral would the world look without this forgetfulness? A poet might say that God has placed forgetfulness as doorkeeper in the temple of human dignity. 93. The Right of the Weaker When anyone submits under certain conditions to a greater power, as a besieged town for instance, the counter-condition is that one can destroy oneself, burn the town, and so cause the mighty one a great loss. Therefore, there is a kind of equalization here, on the basis of which rights may be determined. The enemy has his advantage in maintaining it. Insofar, there are also rights between slaves and masters, that is, precisely so far as the possession of the slave is useful and important to his master. The right originally extends so far as one appears to be valuable to the other essentially unlosable, unconquerable, and so forth. Insofar, the weaker one also has rights, but lesser ones. Hence the famous unusquique tantum juris habet, quantum potentia valet, or more exactly, quantum potentia valere creditur. 94. The Three Phases of Hitherto Existing Morality it is the first sign that the animal has become man when its actions no longer have regard only to momentary welfare, but to what is enduring, when it grows useful and practical. There the free rule of reason first breaks out. A still higher step is reached when he acts according to the principle of honor, by this means he brings himself into order, submits to common feelings, and that exalts him still higher over the phase in which he was led only by the idea of usefulness from a personal point of view. He respects and wishes to be respected, i.e., he understands usefulness as dependent upon what he thinks of others and what others think of him. Eventually, he acts on the highest step of the hitherto existing morality, according to his standard of things and men. He himself decides for himself and others what is honorable, what is useful. He has become the lawgiver of opinions, in accordance with the ever more highly developed idea of what is useful and honorable. Knowledge enables him to place that which is most useful, that is to say, the general, enduring usefulness, above the personal, the honorable recognition of general, enduring usefulness, above the personal, the honorable recognition of general, enduring validity above the momentary. He lives and acts as a collective individual. 95. The Morality of the Mature Individual The impersonal has hitherto been looked upon as the actual distinguishing mark of moral actions, and it has been pointed out that in the beginning it was in consideration of the common good that all impersonal actions were praised and distinguished. It is not an important change in these views impending, now when it is more and more recognized that it is precisely in the most personal possible considerations that the common good is the greatest, so that a strictly personal action now best illustrates the present idea of morality, as utility for the mass? To make a whole personality out of ourselves, and in all that we do to keep that personality's highest good in view, 
carries us further than those sympathetic emotions and actions for the benefit of others. We all still suffer, certainly, from the too small consideration of the personal in us. It is badly developed. Let us admit it. Rather, has our mind been forcibly drawn away from it and offered as a sacrifice to the state, to science, or to those who stand in need of help, as if it were the bad part which must be sacrificed? We are still willing to work for our fellow men, but only so far as we find our own greatest advantage in this work, no more and no less. It is only a question of what we understand as our advantage. The unripe, undeveloped, crude individual will understand it in the crudest way. 96. Custom and Morality To be moral, correct, and virtuous is to be obedient to an old established law and custom. Whether we submit with difficulty or willingly is immaterial, enough that we do so. He is called good who, as if naturally, after long precedent, easily and willingly, therefore, does what is right, according to whatever this may be, as, for instance, taking revenge, if to take revenge be considered as right, as amongst the ancient Greeks. He is called good because he is good for something, but as goodwill, piety, consideration, moderation, and such like, have come, with the change in manners, to be looked upon as good for something, as useful, the good-natured and helpful have, later on, come to be distinguished specially as good, in the beginning, other and more important kinds of usefulness stood in the foreground. To be evil is to be not moral, immoral. To be immoral is to be in opposition to tradition, however sensible or stupid it may be. Injury to the community, the neighbor being understood thereby, has, however, been looked upon by the social laws of all different ages as being eminently the actual immorality, so that now at the word evil we immediately think of voluntary injury to one's neighbor. The fundamental antithesis which has taught man the distinction between moral and immoral, between good and evil, is not the egoistic and unegoistic, but the being bound to the tradition, law, and solution thereof. How the tradition has arisen is immaterial, at all events without regard to good and evil or any imminent categorical imperative, but above all for the purpose of preserving a community, a generation, an association, a people. Every superstitious custom that has arisen on account of some falsely explained accident creates a tradition which it is moral to follow. To separate oneself from it is dangerous, but more dangerous for the community than for the individual, because the Godhead punishes the community for every outrage and every violation of its rights, and the individual only in proportion. Now every tradition grows continually more venerable. The farther off lies its origin, the more this is lost sight of. The veneration paid it accumulates from generation to generation. The tradition at last becomes holy and excites awe. And thus, in any case, the morality of piety is a much older morality than that which requires unegoistic actions. 97. Pleasure in Traditional Custom An important species of pleasure, and therewith the source of morality, arises out of habit. Man does what is habitual to him more easily better, and therefore more willingly. He feels a pleasure therein, and knows from experience that the habitual has been tested and is therefore useful. A custom that we can live with is proved to be wholesome and advantageous in contrast to all new and not yet tested experiments. According to this, morality is the union of the pleasant and the useful. Moreover, it requires no reflection. As soon as man can use compulsion, he uses it to introduce and enforce his customs, for in his eyes they are proved as the wisdom of life. In the same way, a company of individuals compels each single one to adopt the same customs. Here, the inference is wrong, because we feel at ease with the morality, or at least because we are able to carry on existence with it. Therefore, this morality is necessary, for it seems to be the only possibility of feeling at ease. The ease of life seems to grow out of it alone. This comprehension of the habitual as a necessity of existence is pursued even to the smallest details of custom as insight into genuine causality is very small with lower peoples and civilizations, they take precautions with superstitious fear that everything should go in its same groove. Even where custom is difficult, hard, and burdensome, it is preserved on account of its apparent highest usefulness. It is not known that the same degree of well-being can also exist with other customs, and that even higher degrees may be attained. We become aware, however, that all customs, even the hardest, grow pleasanter and milder with time. 
and that the severest way of life may become a habit, and therefore a pleasure. 98. Pleasure and Social Instinct Out of his relations with other men, man obtains a new species of pleasure in addition to those pleasurable sensations which he derives from himself, whereby he greatly increases the scope of enjoyment. Perhaps he has already taken too many of the pleasures of this sphere from animals, which visibly feel pleasure when they play with each other, especially the mother with her young. Then consider the sexual relations, which make almost every female interesting to a male with regard to pleasure, and vice versa. The feeling of pleasure on the basis of human relations generally makes man better. Joy in common, pleasure enjoyed together is increased. It gives the individual security, makes him good-tempered, and dispels mistrust and envy, for we feel ourselves at ease and see others at ease. Similar manifestations of pleasure awaken the idea of the same sensations, the feeling of being like something. A like effect is produced by common sufferings, the same bad weather, dangers, enemies. Upon this foundation is based the oldest alliance, the object of which is the mutual obviating and averting of a threatening danger for the benefit of each individual, and thus the social instinct grows at a pleasure. 99. The Innocent Side of So-Called Evil Actions All evil actions are prompted by the instinct of preservation or, more exactly, by the desire for pleasure and the avoidance of pain on the part of the individual, thus prompted, but not evil. To cause pain, per se, does not exist, except in the brains of philosophers. Neither does to give pleasure, per se, pity in Schopenhauer's meaning. In the social condition before the state, we kill the creature, be it ape or man, who tries to take from us the fruit of a tree when we are hungry and approach the tree as we should still do with animals in inhospitable countries. The evil actions, which now most rouse our indignation, are based upon the error that he who causes them has a free will, that he had the option, therefore, of not doing us this injury. This belief in option arouses hatred, desire for revenge, spite, and the deterioration of the whole imagination, while we are much less angry with an animal because we consider it irresponsible. To do injury, not from the instinct of preservation, but as requital, is the consequence of a false judgment and therefore equally innocent. The individual can in the condition which lies before the state, act sternly and cruelly towards other creatures for the purpose of terrifying, to establish his existence firmly by such terrifying proofs of his power. Thus act the violent, the mighty, the original founders of states, who subdue the weaker to themselves. They have the right to do so, such as the state still takes for itself, or rather, there is no right that can hinder this. The ground for all morality can only be made ready when a stronger individual or a collective individual, for instance society or the state, subdues the single individuals, draws them out of their singleness, and forms them into an association. Compulsion precedes morality. Indeed, morality itself is compulsion for a time, to which one submits for the avoidance of pain. Later on, it becomes custom. Later still, free obedience. And finally, almost instinct. Then, like everything long accustomed and natural, it is connected with pleasure, and is henceforth called virtue. 100. Shame. Shame exists everywhere where there is a mystery. This, however, is a religious idea, which was widely extended in the older times of human civilization. Everywhere were found bounded domains to which access was forbidden by divine right, except under certain conditions. At first locally, as, for example, certain spots that ought not to be trodden by the feet or the uninitiated, in the neighborhood of which these latter experienced horror and fear. This feeling was a good deal carried over into other relations, for instance, the sex relations, which, as a privilege and a doitan of riper years, had to be withheld from the knowledge of the young for their advantage, relations for the protection and sanctification of which many gods were invented and were set up as guardians in the nuptial chamber. In Turkish, this room is on this account called harem, sanctuary, and is distinguished with the same name, therefore, that is used for the entrance courts of the mosques. Thus the kingdom is as a center from which radiate power and glory, to the subjects a mystery full of secrecy and shame, of which many after-effects may still be felt among nations which otherwise do not by any means belong to the bashful type. Similarly, the whole world of inner conditions, the so-called soul, is still a mystery for all who are not philosophers, 
after it has been looked upon for endless ages as a divine origin and as worthy of divine intercourse. According to this, it is an adoiton and rouses shame. 101. Judge not. In considering earlier periods, care must be taken not to fall into unjust abuse. The injustice in slavery, the cruelty and the suppression of persons and nations, is not to be measured by our standard. For the instinct of justice was not then so far developed. Who dares to reproach the Genovese Calvin with the burning of the physician's servant? It was an action following and resulting from his convictions, and in the same way the Inquisition had a good right. Only the ruling views were false, and produced a result which seemed hard to us because those views had now grown strange to us. Because, what is the burning of a single individual compared with the eternal pains of hell for almost all? And yet this idea was universal at the time, without essentially injuring by its dreadfulness the conception of a god. With us, too, political sectarians are hardly and cruelly treated. But because one is accustomed to believe in the necessity of the state, the cruelty is not so deeply felt here as it is when we repudiate the views. Cruelty to animals and children and Italians is due to ignorance, i.e., the animal, through the interests of church teaching, has been placed too far behind man. Much that is dreadful and inhuman in history, much that one hardly likes to believe, is mitigated by the reflection that the one who commands and the one who carries out are different persons. The former does not behold the right and therefore does not experience the strong impression on the imagination. The latter obeys the superior and therefore feels no responsibility. Most princes and military heads, through lack of imagination, easily appear hard and cruel without really being so. Egoism is not evil because the idea of the neighbor, the word is of Christian origin and does not represent the truth, is very weak in us and we feel ourselves almost as free and irresponsible towards him as towards plants and stones. We have yet to learn that others suffer, and this can never be completely learnt. 102. Man always acts rightly. We do not complain of nature as immoral because it sends a thunderstorm and makes us wet. Why do we call those who injure us immoral? Because in the latter case, we take for granted a free will functioning voluntarily. In the former, we see necessity. But this distinction is an error. Thus, we do not call even intentional injury immoral in all circumstances. For instance, we kill a fly unhesitatingly and intentionally, only because its buzzing annoys us. We punish a criminal intentionally and hurt him in order to protect ourselves and society. In the first case, it is the individual who, in order to preserve himself, or even to protect himself from worry, does intentional injury. In the second case, it is the state. All morals allow intentional injury in the case of necessity, that is, when it is a matter of self-preservation. But these two points of view suffice to explain all evil actions committed by men against men. We are desirous of obtaining pleasure or avoiding pain. In any case, it is always a question of self-preservation. Socrates and Plato are right. Whatever man does, he always does well. That is, he does that which seems to him good, useful, according to the degree of his intellect, the particular standard of his reasonableness. 103. The Harmlessness of Malice The aim of malice is not the suffering of others in itself, but our own enjoyment. For instance, as the feeling of revenge or stronger nervous excitement, all teasing, even, shows the pleasure it gives to exercise our power on others and bring it to an enjoyable feeling of preponderance. Is it immoral to taste pleasure at the expense of another's pain? Is malicious joy, footnote, this is the untranslatable word schadenfreude, which means joy at the misfortune of others, J-M-K, end footnote, devilish, as Schopenhauer says, we give ourselves pleasure in nature by breaking off twigs, loosening stones, fighting with wild animals, and do this in order to become thereby conscious of our strength. Is the knowledge, therefore, that another suffers through us, the same thing concerning which we otherwise feel irresponsible, supposed to make us immoral? But if we did not know this, would we not thereby have the enjoyment of our own superiority, which can only manifest itself by the suffering of others, for instance, in teasing? All pleasure, per se, is neither good nor evil. Whence should come the decision that in order to have pleasure ourselves we may not cause displeasure to others? 
From the point of view of usefulness alone, that is, out of consideration for the consequences, for possible displeasure, when the injured one or the replacing state gives the expectation of resentment and revenge. This only can have been the original reason for denying ourselves such actions. Pity aims just as little at the pleasure of others as malice at the pain of others per se. For it contains at least two, perhaps many more, elements of a personal nature, and is so far self-gratification, in the first place as the pleasure of emotion, which is the kind of pity that exists in tragedy, and then, when it impels to action, as the pleasure of satisfaction in the exercise of power. If, besides this, a suffering person is very dear to us, we lift a sorrow from ourselves by the exercise of sympathetic actions. Except by a few philosophers, pity has always been placed very low in the scale of moral feelings, and rightly so. 104. Self-Defense If self-defense is allowed to pass as moral, then almost all manifestations of the so-called immoral egoism must also stand. Men injure, rob, or kill in order to preserve or defend themselves to prevent personal injury. They lie where cunning and dissimulation are the right means of self-preservation. Intentional injury, when our existence or safety, preservation of our comfort, is concerned, is conceded to be moral. The state itself injures, according to this point of view, when it punishes. In unintentional injury, of course, there can be nothing immoral. That is ruled by chance. Is there, then, a kind of intentional injury where existence or the preservation of our comfort is not concerned? Is there an injuring out of pure malice, for instance, in cruelty? If one does not know how much an action hurts, it is no deed of malice. Thus the child is not malicious towards the animal, not evil. He examines and destroys it like a toy. But do we ever know entirely how an action hurts another? As far as our nervous system extends, we protect ourselves from pain. If it extended farther, to our fellow man, namely, we should do no one an injury, except in such cases as we injure ourselves, where we cut ourselves for the sake of cure, tire, and exert ourselves for the sake of health. We conclude by analogy that something hurts somebody, and through memory and the strength of imagination we may suffer from it ourselves. But still, what a difference there is between toothache and the pain pity, that the sight of toothache calls forth. Therefore, in injury out of so-called malice the degree of pain produced is always unknown to us, but inasmuch as there is pleasure in the action, the feeling of one's own power, one's own strong excitement, the action is committed in order to preserve the comfort of the individual, and is regarded, therefore, from a similar point of view as defense and falsehood and necessity. No life without pleasure. The struggle for pleasure is the struggle for life. Whether the individual so fights this fight that men call him good, or so that they can call him evil, is determined by the measure and the constitution of his intellect. 105. Recompensing Justice Whoever has completely comprehended the doctrine of absolute irresponsibility can no longer include the so-called punishing and recompensing justice in the idea of justice, should this consist of giving to each man his due. For he who is punished does not deserve the punishment. He is only used as a means of henceforth warning away from certain actions. Equally so, he who is rewarded does not merit this reward. He cannot act otherwise than he did. Therefore, the reward is meant only as an encouragement to him and others, to provide a motive for subsequent actions. Words of praise are flung to the runners of the course, not the one who has reached the goal. Neither punishment nor reward is anything that comes to one as one's own. They are given from motives of usefulness without one having a right to claim them. Hence we must say, The wise man gives no reward because the deed has been well done. Just as we have said, the wise man does not punish because evil has been committed, but in order that evil shall not be committed. If punishment and reward no longer existed, then the strongest motives which deter men from certain actions and impel them to certain other actions would also no longer exist. The needs of mankind require their continuance, and inasmuch as punishment and reward, blame and praise, work most sensibly on vanity, the same need requires the continuance of vanity. 106. At the Waterfall 
In looking at a waterfall, we imagine that there is freedom of will and fancy in the countless turnings, twistings, and breaking of the waves, but everything is compulsory. Every movement can be mathematically calculated. So it is also with human actions. One would have to be able to calculate every single action beforehand if one were all-knowing. Equally so all progress of knowledge, every error, all malice. The one who acts certainly labors under the illusion of voluntariness. If the world's wheels were to stand still for a moment and an all-knowing, calculating reason were there to make use of this pause, it could foretell the future of every creature to the remotest times and mark out every track upon which that wheel would continue to roll. The delusion of the acting agent about himself, the supposition of a free will, belongs to this mechanism which still remains to be calculated. 107. Irresponsibility and Innocence The complete irresponsibility of man for his actions and his nature is the bitterest drop which he who understands must swallow if he was accustomed to see the patent of nobility of his humanity in responsibility and duty. All his valuations, distinctions, disinclinations are thereby deprived of value and become false. His deepest feeling for the sufferer and the hero was based on an error. He may no longer either praise or blame, for it is absurd to praise and blame nature and necessity. In the same way as he loves a fine work of art, but does not praise it, because it can do nothing for itself. In the same way he regards plants, so must he regard his own actions and those of mankind. He can admire strength, beauty, abundance in themselves, but must find no merit therein. The chemical progress and the strife of the elements, the torments of the sick person who thirsts after recovery, are all equally as little merits as those struggles of the soul and states of distress in which we are all torn hither and thither by different impulses until we finally decide for the strongest, as we say, but in reality it is the strongest motive which decides for us. All these motives, however, whatever fine names we may give them, have all grown out of the same root, in which we believe the evil poisons to be situated. Between good and evil actions there is no difference of species, but at most of degree. Good actions are sublimated evil ones. Evil actions are vulgarized and stupefied good ones. The single longing of the individual for self-gratification, together with the fear of losing it, satisfies itself in all circumstances. Man may act as he can, that is, as he must, but it in deeds of vanity, revenge, pleasure, usefulness, malice, cunning, beaten deeds of sacrifice, of pity, of knowledge. The degrees of the power of judgment determine whither anyone lets himself be drawn through this longing. To every society, to every individual, a scale of possessions is continually present, according to which he determines his actions and judges those of others. But this standard changes constantly. Many actions are called evil and are only stupid because the degree of intelligence which decided for them was very low. In a certain sense, even all actions are still stupid, for the highest degree of human intelligence which can now be attained will assuredly be yet surpassed, and then, in a retrospect, all our actions and judgments will appear as limited and hasty as the actions and judgments of primitive wild peoples now appear limited and hasty to us. To recognize all this may be deeply painful, but consolation comes after. Such pains are the pangs of birth. The butterfly wants to break through its chrysalis. It renders and tears it, and is then blinded and confused by the unaccustomed light, the kingdom of liberty. In such people as are capable of such sadness, and how few are, the first experiment made is to see whether mankind can change itself from a moral into a wise mankind. The sun of a new gospel throws its rays upon the highest point in the soul of each single individual. Then the mists gather thicker than ever, and the brightest light and the dreariest shadow lie side by side. Everything is necessity, so says the new knowledge, and this knowledge itself is necessity. Everything is innocence, and knowledge is the road to insight into this innocence. Are pleasure, egoism, vanity necessary for the production of the moral phenomena in their highest result? The sense for truth and justice in knowledge. Were error and the confusion of the imagination the only means through which mankind could raise itself gradually to this degree of self-enlightenment and self-liberation? Who would dare to undervalue these means? Who would dare to be sad if he perceived the goal to which those roads led? 
Everything in the domain of morality has evolved, is changeable, unstable. Everything is dissolved. It is true. But everything is also streaming towards one goal. Even if the inherited habit of erroneous valuation, love and hatred, continue to reign in us, yet under the influence of growing knowledge it will become weaker. A new habit, that of comprehension, of not loving, not hating, of overlooking, is gradually implanting itself in us upon the same ground, and in thousands of years will perhaps be powerful enough to give humanity the strength to produce wise, innocent, consciously innocent, men, as it now produces unwise, guilt-conscious men. That is the necessary preliminary step, not its opposite. End of Second Division The History of the Moral Sentiments Third Division, Part 1 of Human All Too Human, a book for free spirits by Friedrich Nietzsche, translated by Helen Zimmern, 1846 to 1934. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Aaron Rivera. Third Division, The Religious Life, Part 1. 108. The Double Fight Against Evil. When misfortune overtakes us, we can either pass over it so lightly that its cause is removed, or so that the result which it has on our temperament is altered, through a changing, therefore, of the evil into a good, the utility of which is perhaps not visible until later on. Religion and art, also metaphysical philosophy, work upon the changing of the temperament, partly through the changing of our judgment on events, for instance, with the help of the phrase, whom the Lord loveth he chasteneth, partly through the awakening of a pleasure in pain, in emotion generally, whence the tragic art takes its starting point. The more a man is inclined to twist and arrange meanings, the less he will grasp the causes of evil and disperse them. The momentary mitigation and influence of a narcotic, as for example in toothache, suffices him even in more serious sufferings. The more the dominion of creeds and all arts dispense with narcotics, the more strictly men attend to the actual removing of the evil, which is certainly bad for writers of tragedy. For the material for tragedy is growing scarcer because the domain of pitiless, inexorable fate is growing ever narrower, but worse still for the priests for they have hitherto lived on the narcotization of human woes. 109. Sorrow is Knowledge How greatly we should like to exchange the false assertions of the priests, that there is a God who desires good from us, a guardian and witness of every action, every moment, every thought, who loves us and seeks our welfare in all misfortune. How greatly we would like to exchange these ideas for truths which would be just as healing, pacifying, and beneficial as those errors. But there are no such truths. At most, philosophy can oppose to them metaphysical appearances. At bottom, also untruths. The tragedy consists in the fact that we cannot believe those dogmas of religion and metaphysics if we have strict methods of truth in heart and brain. On the other hand, mankind has, through development, become so delicate, irritable, and suffering that it has need of the highest means of healing and consolation. Whence also the danger arises that man would bleed to death from recognized truth, or, more correctly, from discovered error. Byron has expressed this in the immortal lines, Sorrow is knowledge, they who know the most, must mourn the deepest or the fatal truth. The tree of knowledge is not that of life. For such troubles there is no better help than to recall the stately levity of Horace, at least for the worst hours and eclipses of the soul, and to say with him, Quid aeternis miniorum? Consilis animum fatigas? Cur non sub alta vel plantano vel hac pino jacentes. Footnote. Why harass with eternal designs a mind too weak to compass them? Why do we not, as we lie beneath a lofty plane tree, or this pine, drink while we may. Horace, Odes 3, 2, 11 through 14, JMK. End footnote. But assuredly frivolity or melancholy of every degree is better than a romantic retrospection and desertion of the flag, an approach to Christianity in any form. For according to the present condition of knowledge, it is absolutely impossible to approach it without hopelessly soiling our intellectual conscience and giving ourselves away to ourselves and others. Those pains may be unpleasant enough, 
but we cannot become leaders and educators of mankind without pain. And woe to him who would wish to attempt this and no longer have that clear conscience. 110. The Truth in Religion in the period of rationalism, justice was not done to the importance of religion. Of that there is no doubt. But equally there is no doubt that in the reaction that followed this rationalism, justice was far overstepped. For religions were treated lovingly, even amorously, and, for instance, a deeper, even the very deepest, understanding of the world was ascribed to them, which science has only to strip of its dogmatic garment in order to possess the truth in unmythical form. Religion should... Therefore, this was the opinion of all opposers of rationalism, sensu allegorico, with all consideration for the understanding of the masses, give utterance to that ancient wisdom which is wisdom itself, inasmuch as all true science of later times has always led up to it instead of away from it, so that between the oldest wisdom of mankind and all later harmonies, similarity of discernment and a progress of knowledge, in case one should wish to speak of such a thing, rests not upon the nature but upon the way of communicating it. This whole conception of religion and science is thoroughly erroneous, and none would still dare to profess it if Schopenhauer's eloquence had not taken it under its protection. This resonant eloquence which, however, only reached its hearers a generation later. As surely as from Schopenhauer's religious moral interpretations of men and the world much may be gained for the understanding of the Christian and other religions, so surely also is he mistaken about the value of religion for knowledge. Therein, he himself was only a too docile pupil for the scientific teachers of his time, who all worshipped Romanticism and had forsworn the spirit of enlightenment. Had he been born in our present age, he could not possibly have talked about the sensus allegoricus of religion. He would much rather have given honor to truth, as he used to do, with the words, No religion, direct or indirect, either as dogma or as allegory, has ever contained a truth. For each has been born of fear and necessity. Through the byways of reason did it slip into existence. Once, perhaps, when imperiled by science, some philosophic doctrine has lied itself into its system in order that it may be found there later. But this is a theological trick of the time when a religion already doubts itself. These tricks of theology, which certainly were practiced in the early days of Christianity, as the religion of a scholarly period steeped in philosophy, have led to that superstition of the sensus allegoricus, but yet more the habits of the philosophers, especially the half-natures, the poetical philosophers, and the philosophizing artists, to treat all the sensations which they discovered in themselves as the fundamental nature of man in general, and hence to allow their own religious feelings an important influence in the building up of their systems. As philosophers frequently philosophized under the custom of religious habits, or at least under the anciently inherited power of that metaphysical need, they developed doctrinal opinions which really bore a great resemblance to the Jewish or Christian or Indian religious views. A resemblance, namely, such as children usually bear to their mothers, only that in this case the fathers were not clear about that motherhood, as happens sometimes, but in their innocence romanced about a family likeness between all religion and science. Moreover, if all nations were to agree about certain religious matters, for instance the existence of a god, which, it may be remarked, is not the case with regard to this point, this would only be an argument against those affirmed matters, for instance the existence of a god, the consensus genitum and hominum in general can only take place in case of a huge folly. On the other hand, there is no consensus omnium sapientium with regard to any single thing, with that exception mentioned in Goethe's lines, Ali di Weissesten, aller der Seiten, Lechen und winken und steimen mit ein, Torricht auf Besserung der Toren zu harren, Kinder der Klugheit, o habet die Nähren, Eben zum Nähren auch, wie sie's gehört. Footnote. All greatest sages of all latest ages will chuckle and slyly agree, Tis folly to wait till a fool's empty pate has learnt to be knowing and free. So children of wisdom make use of the fools, and use them whenever you can as your tools. J. M. K. End footnote. Spoken without verse and rhyme, and applied to our case, the consensus sapientium consists in this, that the consensus gentium counts as a folly. 111. 
The Origin of the Religious Cult If we go back to the times in which the religious life flourished to the greatest extent, we find a fundamental conviction which we now no longer share, and whereby the doors leading to a religious life are closed to us once for all. It concerns nature and intercourse with her. In those times, people knew nothing of natural laws. Neither for earth nor for heaven is there a must, a season, the sunshine, the rain may come or may not come. In short, every idea of natural causality is lacking. When one rows, it is not the rowing that moves the boat, but rowing is only a magical ceremony by which one compels a daemon to move the boat. All maladies, even death itself, are the result of magical influences. Illness and death never happen naturally. The whole conception of natural sequence is lacking. It dawned first amongst the older Greeks, that is, in a very late phase of humanity, in the conception of Moira, enthroned above the gods. When a man shoots with a bow, there is still always present an irrational hand and strength. If the wells suddenly dry up, men think first of subterranean daemons and their tricks. It must be the arrow of a god beneath whose invisible blow a man suddenly sinks down. In India, says Lubbock, a carpenter is accustomed to offer sacrifice to his hammer, his hatchet, and the rest of his tools. In the same way, a Brahmin treats the pen with which he writes, a soldier, the weapons he requires in the field of battle, a mason, his trowel, a laborer, his plow. In the imagination of religious people, all nature is a summary of the actions of conscious and voluntary creatures, an enormous complex of arbitrariness. No conclusion may be drawn with regard to everything that is outside of us, that anything will be so, and so, must be so, and so. The approximately sure, reliable are we. Man is the rule, nature is regularity. This theory contains the fundamental conviction which obtains in rude, religiously productive, primitive civilizations. We latter-day men feel just the contrary. The richer man now feels himself inwardly, the more polyphonous is the music and the noise of his soul, the more powerfully the symmetry of nature works upon him. We all recognize with Goethe the great means in nature for the appeasing of the modern soul. We listen to the pendulum swing of this greatest of clocks with a longing for rest, for home, and tranquility, as if we could absorb this symmetry into ourselves and could only thereby arrive at the enjoyment of ourselves. Formerly it was otherwise. If we consider the rude, early conditions of nations or contemplate present-day savages at close quarters, we find them most strongly influenced by law and by tradition. The individual is almost automatically bound to them and moves with the uniformity of a pendulum. To him, nature, uncomprehended, terrible, mysterious nature, must appear as the sphere of liberty, of voluntariness, of the higher power, even as a superhuman degree of existence, as God. In those times and conditions, however, every individual felt that his existence, his happiness, and that of the family and the state, and the success of all undertakings, depend on those spontaneities of nature. Certain natural events must appear at the right time, otherwise be absent at the right time. How can one have any influence on these terrible unknown things? How can one bind the sphere of liberty? Thus he asks himself, thus he inquires anxiously, is there, then, no means of making those powers as regular through tradition and law as you are yourself? The aim of those who believe in magic and miracles is to impose a law on nature, and, briefly, the religious cult is a result of this aim. The problem which those people have set themselves is closely related to this. How can the weaker race dictate laws to the stronger, rule it, and guide its actions, in relation to the weaker? One would first remember the most harmless sort of compulsion, that compulsion which one exercises when one has gained anyone's affection. By imploring and praying, by submission, by the obligation of regular taxes and gifts, by flattering glorifications, it is also possible to exercise an influence upon the powers of nature, inasmuch as one gains the affections. Love binds and becomes bound. Then one can make compacts by which one is mutually bound to a certain behavior, where one gives pledges and exchanges vows. But far more important is a species of more forcible compulsion by magic and witchcraft. As with the sorcerer's help, man is able to injure a more powerful enemy and keep him in fear. As the love charm works at a distance, so the weaker man believes he can influence the mightier spirits of nature. 
The principal thing in all witchcraft is that we must get into our possession something that belongs to someone. Hair, nails, food from their table, even their portrait, their name. With such apparatus we can then practice sorcery. For the fundamental rule is, to everything spiritual there belongs something corporeal. With the help of this we are able to bind the spirit, to injure it, and destroy it. The corporeal furnishes the handles with which we can grasp the spiritual. As man controls man, so he controls some natural spirit or other. For this is also its corporeal part by which it may be grasped. The tree and, compared with it, the seed from which it sprang. This enigmatical contrast seems to prove that the same spirit embodied itself in both forms, now small, now large. A stone that begins to roll suddenly is the body in which a spirit operates. If there is an enormous rock lying on a lonely heath, it seems impossible to conceive human strength sufficient to have brought it there. Consequently, the stone must have moved there by itself, that is, it must be possessed by a spirit. Everything that has a body is susceptible to witchcraft, therefore also the natural spirits. If a god is bound to his image, we can use the most direct compulsion against him, through refusal or of sacrificial food, scourging, binding in fetters, and so on. In order to obtain by force the missing favor of their god, the lower classes in China wind cords round the image of the one who has left them in the lurch, pull it down, and drag it through the streets in dust and the dirt. You dog of a spirit, they say. We gave you a magnificent temple to live in. We gilded you prettily. We fed you well. We offered you sacrifice, and yet you are so ungrateful. Similar forcible measures against pictures of the saints and virgin when they refused to do their duty in pestilence or drought have been witnessed even during the present century in Catholic countries. Through all these magic relations to nature, countless ceremonies have been called into life, and at last, when the confusion has grown too great, an endeavor has been made to order and systematize them, in order that the favorable courses of the whole progress of nature, i.e., of the great succession of the seasons, may seem to be guaranteed by a corresponding course of a system of procedure. The essence of the religious cult is to determine and confine nature to human advantage, to impress it with a legality, therefore, which it did not originally possess. While at the present time we wish to recognize the legality of nature in order to adapt ourselves to it. In short, then, the religious cult is based upon the representations of sorcery between man and man, and the sorcerer is older than the priest but it is likewise based upon other and nobler representations. It premises the sympathetic relation of man to man, the presence of goodwill, gratitude, the hearing of pleaders, of treaties between enemies, the granting of pledges, and the claim to the protection of property. In very low stages of civilization, man does not stand in the relation of a helpless slave to nature. He is not, necessarily, its involuntary bondsman. In the Greek grade of religion, particularly in relation to the Olympian gods, there may even be imagined a common life between two castes, a nobler and more powerful one, and one less noble. But in their origin both belong to each other somehow, and are of one kind. They need not be ashamed of each other. That is the nobility of the Greek religion. 112. At the sight of certain antique sacrificial implements. The fact of how many feelings are lost to us may be seen, for instance, in the mingling of the droll, even of the obscene, with the religious feeling. The sensation of the possibility of this mixture vanishes. We only comprehend historically that it existed in the feats of Demeter and Dionysus, and the Christian Easter plays and mysteries. But we also know that which is noble in alliance with burlesque and such like, the touching mingling with the laughable which perhaps a later age will not be able to understand. 113. Christianity as Antiquity When on a Sunday morning we hear the old bells ring out, we ask ourselves, Is it possible? This is done on account of a Jew crucified 2,000 years ago who said he was the Son of God. The proof of such an assertion is wanting. Certainly in our times the Christian religion is an antiquity that dates from very early ages and the fact that its assertions are still believed, when otherwise all claims are subjected to such strict examination, is perhaps the oldest part of this heritage. A god who creates a son from a mortal woman, a sage who requires that man should no longer work, no longer judge, 
but should pay attention to the signs of the approaching end of the world. A justice that accepts an innocent being as a substitute and sacrifice. One who commands his disciples to drink his blood. Prayers for miraculous intervention. Sins committed against a god and atoned for through a god. The fear of a future to which death is the portal. The form of the cross in an age which no longer knows the signification of the shame of the cross. How terrible all this appears to us, as if risen from the grave of the ancient past. Is it credible that such things are still believed? 114. What is un-Greek in Christianity? The Greeks did not regard the Homeric gods as raised above them like masters, nor themselves as being under them like servants, as the Jews did. They only saw, as in a mirror, the most perfect examples of their own caste, an ideal, therefore, and not an opposite of their own nature. There is a feeling of relationship. A mutual interest arises, a kind of symmetry. Man thinks highly of himself when he gives himself such gods, and places himself in a relation like that of the lower nobility towards the higher, while the Italian nations hold a genuine peasant faith, with perpetual fear of evil and mischievous powers and tormenting spirits. Wherever the Olympian gods retreat into the background, Greek life was more somber and more anxious. Christianity, on the contrary, oppressed man and crushed him utterly, sinking him as if in deep mire, then into the feeling of absolute depravity it suddenly threw the light of divine mercy, so that the surprised man, dazzled by forgiveness, gave a cry of joy and for a moment believed that he bore all heaven within himself. All psychological feelings of Christianity work upon this unhealthy excess of sentiment, and upon the deep corruption of head and heart it necessitates. It desires to destroy, break, stupefy, confuse. Only one thing it does not desire, namely, moderation. And therefore, it is in the deepest sense barbaric, Asiatic, ignoble, and un-Greek. 115. To be religious with advantage. There are sober and industrious people on whom religion is embroidered like a hem of higher humanity. These do well to remain religious. It beautifies them. All people who do not understand some kind of trade in weapons, tongue and pen included as weapons, become servile. For such, the Christian religion is very useful, for then servility assumes the appearance of Christian virtues and is surprisingly beautified. People to whom their daily life appears too empty and monotonous easily grow religious. This is comprehensible and excusable, only they have no right to demand religious sentiments from those whose daily life is not empty and monotonous. 116. The Commonplace Christian If Christianity were right, with its theories of an avenging God, of general sinfulness, of redemption, and the danger of eternal damnation, it would be a sign of weak intellect and lack of character not to become a priest, apostle, or hermit, and to work only with fear and trembling for one's own salvation. It would be senseless, thus, to neglect eternal benefits for temporary comfort. Taking it for granted that there is belief, the commonplace Christian is a miserable figure, a man that really cannot add two and two together, and who, moreover, just because of his mental incapacity for responsibility, did not deserve to be so severely punished as Christianity has decreed. 117. Of the Wisdom of Christianity It is a clever stroke on the part of Christianity to teach the utter unworthiness, sinfulness, and despicableness of mankind so loudly that the disdain of their fellow men is no longer possible. He may sin as much as he likes. He is not essentially different from me. It is I who am unworthy and despicable in every way, says the Christian to himself. But even this feeling has lost its sharpest sting, because the Christian no longer believes in his individual despicableness. He is bad as men are generally, and comforts himself a little with the axiom, We are all of one kind. 118. Change of Front as soon as religion triumphs, it has for its enemies all those who could have been its first disciples. 119. The Fate of Christianity Christianity arose for the purpose of lightening the heart, but now it must first make the heart heavy in order afterwards to lighten it. Consequently, it will perish. 120. The Proof of Pleasure the agreeable opinion is accepted as true. 
This is the proof of the pleasure, or, as the church says, the proof of the strength, of which all religions are so proud when they ought to be ashamed of it. If faith did not make blessed, it would not be believed in. Of how little value must it be, then? 121. A Dangerous Game Whoever now allows scope to his religious feelings must also let them increase. He cannot do otherwise. His nature then gradually changes. It favors whatever is connected with and near to the religious element. The whole extent of judgment and feeling becomes clouded, overcast with religious shadows. Sensation cannot stand still. One must therefore take care. 122. The Blind Disciples So long as one knows well the strength and weaknesses of one's doctrine, one's art, one's religion, its power is still small. The disciple and apostle who has no eyes for the weaknesses of the doctrine, the religion, and so forth, dazzled by the aspect of the master and by his reverence for him, has on that account usually more power than the master himself. Without blind disciples, the influence of a man and his work has never yet become great. To help a doctrine to victory often means only so to mix it with stupidity that the weight of the latter carries off also the victory for the former. 123. Church Disestablishment There is not enough religion in the world even to destroy religions. 124. The Sinlessness of Man if it is understood how sin came into the world, namely through errors of reason by which men held each other, even the single individual held himself, to be much blacker and much worse than was actually the case, the whole sensation will be much lightened, and man in the world will appear in a blaze of innocence which it will do one good to contemplate. In the midst of nature man is always the child, per se. This child sometimes has a heavy and terrifying dream, but when it opens its eyes it always finds itself back again in paradise. 125. The Irreligiousness of Artists Homer is so much at home amongst his gods, and is so familiar with them as a poet, that he must have been deeply irreligious, that which the popular faith gave him, a meager, rude, partly terrible superstition. He treated as freely as the sculptor does his clay, with the same unconcern, therefore, which Aeschylus and Aristophanes possessed, and by which in later times the great artists of the Renaissance distinguished themselves as also did Shakespeare and Goethe. 126. The Art and Power of False Interpretations All the visions, terrors, torpors, and ecstasies of saints are well-known forms of disease, which are only, by reason of deep-rooted religious and psychological errors, differently explained by him, namely not as diseases. Thus, perhaps, the daimonion of Socrates was only an affection of the ear, which he, in accordance with his ruling moral mode of thought, expounded differently from what would be the case now. It is the same thing with the madness and ravings of the prophets and soothsayers. It is always the degree of knowledge, fantasy, effort, morality in the head and heart of the interpreters which has made so much of it. For the greatest achievements of the people who are called geniuses and saints, it is necessary that they should secure interpreters by force who misunderstand them for the good of mankind. 127. The Veneration of Insanity Because it was remarked that excitement frequently made the mind clear and produced happy inspirations, it was believed that the happiest inspirations and suggestions were called forth by the greatest excitement, and so the insane were revered as wise and oracular. This is based on a false conclusion. 128. The Promises of Science The aim of modern science is as little pain as possible, as long a life as possible, a kind of eternal blessedness, therefore, but certainly a very modest one as compared with the promises of religions. 129. Forbidden Generosity There is not sufficient love and goodness in the world to permit us to give some of it away to imaginary beings. 130. The Continuance of the Religious Cult in the Feelings the Roman Catholic Church, and before that all antique cults, dominated the entire range of means by which man was put into unaccustomed moods and rendered incapable of the cold calculation of judgment or the clear thinking of reason. A church quivering with deep tones, the dull, regular, arresting appeals of a priestly throng, 
unconsciously communicates its tension to the congregation and makes it listen almost fearfully, as if a miracle were in preparation. The influence of the architecture, which, as the dwelling of a godhead, extends into the uncertain and makes its apparition to be feared in all its somber spaces. Who would wish to bring such things back to mankind if the necessary suppositions are no longer believed? But the results of all this are not lost, nevertheless. The inner world of noble, emotional, deeply contrite dispositions, full of presentiments, blessed with hope, is inborn in mankind, mainly through this cult. What existed of it now in the soul was then cultivated on a large scale as it germinated, grew up, and blossomed. End of Third Division, The Religious Life, Part 1《Third Division》The Religious Life Part 2 of Human All Too Human A Book for Free Spirits by Friedrich Nietzsche Translated by Helen Zimmern, 1846-1934 This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Aaron Rivera《Third Division》The Religious Life Part 2 131 The Painful Consequences of Religion However much we may think we have weaned ourselves from religion, it has nevertheless not been done so thoroughly as to deprive us of pleasure in encountering religious sensations and moods in music, for instance. And if a philosophy shows us the justification of metaphysical hopes and the deep peace of soul to be thence acquired, and speaks, for instance, of the whole certain gospel in the gaze of Raphael's Madonnas, we receive such statements and expositions particularly warmly, here the philosopher finds it easier to prove that which he desires to give corresponds to a heart that desires to receive. Hence it may be observed how the less thoughtful free spirits really only take offense at the dogmas, but are well acquainted with the charm of religious sensations. They are sorry to lose hold of the latter for the sake of the former. Scientific philosophy must be very careful not to smuggle in errors on the ground of that need, a need which has grown up and is consequently temporary, even logicians speak of presentiments of truth in ethics and in art, for instance, of the suspicion that the nature of things is one, which should be forbidden to them between the carefully established truths and such presaged things, there remains the unbridged chasm that those are due to intellect and these to requirement. Hunger does not prove that food exists to satisfy it, but that it desires food. To presage does not mean the acknowledgement of the existence of a thing in any one degree, but its possibility, insofar as it is desired or feared. Presage does not advance one step into the land of certainty. We believe involuntarily that the portions of a philosophy which are tinged with religion are better proved than others, but actually it is the contrary. But we have the inward desire that it may be so, that that which makes blessed, therefore, may be also the true. This desire misleads us to accept bad reasons for good ones. 132. Of the Christian Need of Redemption With careful reflection it must be possible to obtain an explanation free from mythology of that process in the soul of a Christian which is called the need of redemption, consequently a purely psychological explanation. Up to the present, the psychological explanations of religious conditions and processes have certainly been held in some disrepute inasmuch as a theology which called itself free carried on its unprofitable practice in this domain. For here from the beginning, as the mind of its founder, Schleiermacher, gives us reason to suppose, the preservation of the Christian religion and the continuance of Christian theology was kept in view, a theology which was to find a new anchorage in the psychological analysis of religious facts, and above all, a new occupation. Unconcerned about such predecessors, we hazard the following interpretation of the phenomenon in question. Man is conscious of certain actions which stand far down in the customary rank of actions. He even discovers himself in a tendency towards similar actions, a tendency which appears to him almost as unchangeable as his whole nature. How willingly would he try himself in that other species of actions which in the general valuation are recognized as the loftiest and highest? How gladly would he feel himself to be full of the good consciousness that should follow an unselfish mode of thought? But unfortunately, he stops short at this wish, 
and the discontent at not being able to satisfy it is added to all the other discontents which his lot in life or the consequences of those above-mentioned evil actions have aroused in him. So that a deep ill-humor is the result, with the search for a physician who could remove this and all its causes. This condition would not be felt so bitterly if man would only compare himself frankly with other men. Then he would have no reason for being dissatisfied with himself to a particular extent. He would only bear his share of the common burden of human dissatisfaction and imperfection. But he compares himself with a being who is said to be capable only of those actions which are called unegoistic, and to live in the perpetual consciousness of an unselfish mode of thought, i.e. with God. It is because he gazes into this clear mirror that his image appears to him so dark, so unusually warped. Then he is alarmed by the thought of that same creature, insofar as it floats before his imagination as a retributive justice. In all possible small and great events, he thinks he recognizes its anger and menaces, that he even feels its scourged strokes as judge and executioner. Who will help him in this danger, which, by the prospect of an immeasurable duration of punishment, exceeds in horror all the other terrors of the idea? 133. Before we examine the further consequences of this mental state, let us acknowledge that it is not through his guilt and sin that man has gotten to this condition, but through a series of errors of reason. That it was the fault of the mirror if his image appeared so dark and hateful to him, and that that mirror was his work, the very imperfect work of human imagination and power of judgment. In the first place, a nature that is only capable of purely unegoistic actions is more fabulous than the phoenix. It cannot even be clearly imagined, just because, when closely examined, the whole idea, unegoistic action, vanishes into air. No man ever did a thing which was done only for others and without any personal motive. How should he be able to do anything which had no relation to himself, and therefore without inward obligation, which must always have its foundation in a personal need? How could the ego act without ego? A god who, on the contrary, is all love, as such a one is often represented, would not be capable of a single unegoistic action, whereby one is reminded of a saying of Lichtenberg, which is certainly taken from a lower sphere. We cannot possibly feel for others. As the saying is, we feel only for ourselves. This sounds hard, but it is not so really if it be rightly understood. We do not love father or mother or wife or child, but the pleasant sensations they cause for us. Or, as Rochefoucauld says, Si on croit aimer sa matrice pour l'amour d'elle, on est bien trompe. To know the reason why actions of love are valued more than others, not on account of their nature, namely, but of their usefulness, we should compare the examinations already mentioned, on the origin of moral sentiments. But should a man desire to be entirely like that god of love, to do and wish everything for others and nothing for himself? The latter is impossible for the reason that he must do very much for himself to be able to do something for the love of others. Then it is taken for granted that the other is sufficiently egoistic to accept that sacrifice again and again, that living for him, so that the people of love and sacrifice have an interest in the continuance of those who are loveless and incapable of sacrifice, and, in order to exist, the highest morality would be obliged positively to compel the existence of unmorality whereby it would certainly annihilate itself. Further, the conception of a god disturbs and humbles so long as it is believed in, but as to how it arose there can no longer be any doubt in the present state of the science of comparative ethnology, and with a comprehension of this origin all belief falls to the ground. The Christian who compares his nature with gods is like Don Quixote, who undervalued his own bravery because his head was full of the marvelous deeds of the heroes of the chivalric. Romances, the standard of measurement in both cases belong to the domain of fable. But if the idea of God is removed, so is also the feeling of sin as a trespass against divine laws, as a stain in a creature vowed to God. Then, perhaps, there still remains that dejection which is intergrown and connected with the fear of the punishment of worldly justice, or of the scorn of men. The dejection of the pricks of conscience, the sharpest thorn in the consciousness of sin, is always removed if we recognize that through our own deed we have sinned against human descent, human laws and ordinances, still that we have not imperiled the eternal salvation of the soul and its relation to the Godhead. 
And if man succeeds in gaining philosophic conviction of the absolute necessity of all actions and their entire irresponsibility, and absorbing this into his flesh and blood, even those remains of the pricks of conscience vanish. 131. Now if the Christian, as we have said, has fallen into the way of self-contempt and conscience of certain errors through a false, unscientific interpretation of his actions and sensations, he must notice with great surprise how that state of contempt, the pricks of conscience and displeasure generally, does not endure, how sometimes there come hours when all this is wafted away from the soul and he feels himself once more free and courageous. In truth, the pleasure in himself, the comfort of his own strength, together with the necessary weakening through time of every deep emotion, has usually been victorious. Man loves himself once again. He feels it. But precisely this new love, this self-esteem, seems to him incredible. He can only see in it the wholly undeserved descent of a stream of mercy from on high. If he formerly believed that in every event he could recognize warnings, menaces, punishments, and every kind of manifestation of divine anger, he now finds divine goodness in all his experiences. This event appears to him to be full of love. That one a helpful hint, a third, and, indeed, his whole happy mood, a proof that God is merciful. As formerly in his state of pain, he interpreted his actions falsely, so now he misinterprets his experiences. His mood of comfort, he believes, to be the working of a power operating outside of himself. The love with which he really loves himself seems to him to be divine love, that which he calls mercy, and the prologue to redemption, is actually self-forgiveness, self-redemption. 135. Therefore, a certain false psychology, a certain kind of imaginative interpretation of motives and experiences, is the necessary preliminary for one to become a Christian and to feel the need of redemption. When this error of reason and imagination is recognized, one ceases to be a Christian. 136. Of Christian Asceticism and Holiness As greatly as isolated thinkers have endeavored to depict as a miracle the rare manifestations of morality, which are generally called asceticism and holiness, miracles which it would be almost an outrage and sacrilege to explain by the light of common sense, as strong also in the inclination towards this outrage. A mighty impulse of nature has at all times led to a protest against those manifestations. Science, in so far as it is an imitation of nature, to the great joy of the above-mentioned worshippers of the morally marvelous. For, speaking generally, the unexplained must be absolutely inexplicable, the inexplicable absolutely unnatural, supernatural, wonderful. Thus runs the demand in the soul of all religious and metaphysical people, also of artists, if they should happen to be thinkers at the same time, whilst the scientist sees in this demand the evil principle in itself. The general, first probability upon which one lights in the contemplation of holiness and asceticism is this, that their nature is a complicated one, for almost everywhere, within the physical world as well as in the moral, the apparently marvelous has been successfully traced back to the complicated, the many conditioned. Let us venture, therefore, to isolate separate impulses from the soul of saints and ascetics, and finally to imagine them as intergrown. 137. There is a defiance of self to the sublimest manifestation of which belong many forms of asceticism. Certain individuals have such great need of exercising their power and love of ruling that, in default of other objects, or because they have never succeeded otherwise, they finally excogiate the idea of tyrannizing over certain parts of their own nature, portions or degrees of themselves. Thus many a thinker confesses to views which evidently do not serve either to increase or improve his reputation. Many a one deliberately calls down the scorn of others when by keeping silence he could easily have remained respected. Others contradict former opinions and do not hesitate to be called inconsistent. On the contrary, they strive after this, and behave like reckless riders who like a horse best when it has grown wild, unmanageable, and covered with sweat. Thus man climbs dangerous paths up the highest mountains in order that he may laugh to scorn his own fear and his trembling knees. Thus the philosopher owns to views on asceticism, humility, holiness, in the brightest of which his own picture shows to the worst possible disadvantage. This crushing of oneself, this scorn of one's own nature, this 
spernere se sperm, of which religion has made so much, is really a very high degree of vanity. The whole moral of the Sermon on the Mount belongs here. Man takes a genuine delight in doing violence to himself by these exaggerated claims, and afterward idolizing these tyrannical demands of his soul. In every ascetic morality, man worships one part of himself as a god, and is obliged, therefore, to diabolize the other parts. 138. Man is not equally moral at all hours. This is well known. If his morality is judged to be the capability for great self-sacrificing resolutions and self-denial, which, when continuous and grown habitual, are called holiness, he is most moral in the passions. The higher emotion provides him with entirely new motives, of which he, sober and cold as usual, perhaps does not even believe himself capable. How does this happen? Probably because of the proximity of everything great and highly exciting. If man is once wrought up to a state of extraordinary suspense, he is as capable of carrying out a terrible revenge as of a terrible crushing of his need for revenge. Under the influence of powerful emotion, he desires in any case the great, the powerful, the immense. And if he happens to notice that the sacrifice of himself satisfies him as well as, or better than, the sacrifice of others, he chooses that. Actually, therefore, he only cares about discharging his emotion. In order to ease his tension, he seizes the enemy's spears and buries them in his breast. That there was something great in self-denial and not in revenge had to be taught to mankind by long habit. A godhead that sacrificed itself was the strongest, most effective symbol of this kind of greatness. As the conquest of the most difficult enemy, the sudden mastering of an affection, thus this denial appears, and so far it passes for the summit of morality. In reality, it is a question of the confusion of one's idea with another, while the temperament maintains an equal height, an equal level. Temperate men who are resting from their passions no longer understand the morality of those moments, but the general admiration of those who had the same experiences uphold them. Pride is their consolation when affection and the understanding of their deed vanish. Therefore, at bottom, even those actions of self-denial are not moral, inasmuch as they are not done strictly with regard to others. Rather, the other only provides the highly strung temperament with an opportunity of relieving itself through that denial. 139. In many respects, the ascetic seeks to make life easy for himself, usually by complete subordination to a strange will or a comprehensive law and ritual. Something like the way a Brahmin leaves nothing whatever to his own decision, but refers every moment to holy precepts. This submission is a powerful means of attaining self-mastery. Man is occupied and is therefore not bored, and yet has no incitement to self-will or passion. After a completed deed, there is no feeling of responsibility, and with it no tortures of remorse. We have renounced our own will once and forever, and this is easier than only renouncing it occasionally, as it is also easier to give up a desire entirely than to keep it within bounds. When we remember the present relation of man to the state, we find that, even here, Unconditional obedience is more convenient than conditional. The saint, therefore, makes his life easier by absolute renunciation of his personality, and we are mistaken if in that phenomenon we admire the loftiest heroism of morality. In any case, it is more difficult to carry one's personality through without vacillation and unclearness than to liberate oneself from it in the above-mentioned manner. Moreover, it requires far more spirit and consideration. 140. After having found in many of the less easily explicable actions manifestations of that pleasure in emotion per se, I should like to recognize also in self-contempt, which is one of the signs of holiness, and likewise in the deeds of self-torture, through hunger and scourging, mutilation of limbs, feigning of madness, a means by which those natures fight against the general wariness of their life-will, their nerves. They employ the most painful irritants and cruelties in order to emerge for a time, at all events, from that dullness and boredom into which they so frequently sink through their great mental indolence and that submission to a strange will already described. 141. The commonest means which the ascetic and saint employs to render life still endurable and amusing consists in occasional warfare with alternate victory and defeat. For this he requires an opponent, and finds it in the so-called inward enemy. 
He principally makes use of this inclination to vanity, love of honor and rule, and of his sensual desires, that he may be permitted to regard his life as a perpetual battle and himself as a battlefield upon which good and evil spirits strive with alternating success. It is well known that sensual imagination is moderated, indeed almost dispelled, by regular sexual intercourse, whereas, on the contrary, it is rendered unfettered and wild by abstinence or irregularity. The imagination of many Christian saints was filthy to an extraordinary degree, by virtue of those theories that these desires were actual demons raging within them, they did not feel themselves to be too responsible. To this feeling we owe the very instructive frankness of their self-confessions. It was to their interest that this strife should always be maintained in one degree or another, because, as we have already said, their empty life was thereby entertained. But in order that the strife might seem sufficiently important and arouse the enduring sympathy and admiration of non-saints, it was necessary that sensuality should be ever more reviled and branded. The danger of eternal damnation was so tightly bound up with these things that it was highly probable that for whole centuries Christians generated children with a bad conscience, wherewith humanity has certainly suffered a great injury. And yet, here truth is all topsy-turvy, which is particularly unsuitable for truth. Certainly Christianity has said that every man is conceived and born in sin, and in the insupportable superlative Christianity of Calderon, this thought again appears, tied up and twisted, as the most distorted paradox there is, in the well-known lines, The greatest sin of man is that he was ever born. In all pessimistic religions, the act of generation was looked upon as evil in itself. This is by no means the verdict of all mankind, not even of all pessimists. For instance, Empedocles saw in all erotic things nothing shameful, diabolical, or sinful, but rather, in the great plain of disaster he saw only one hopeful and redeeming figure, that of Aphrodite. She appeared to him as a guarantee that the strife should not endure eternally, but that the specter should one day be given over to a gentler daemon. The actual Christian pessimist had, as has been said, an interest in the dominance of a diverse opinion. For the solitude and spiritual wilderness of their lives they required an ever-living enemy, and a generally recognized enemy, through whose fighting and overcoming they could constantly represent themselves to non-saints as incomprehensible, half-supernatural beings. But when at last this enemy took to flight forever in consequence of their mode of life and their impaired health, they immediately understood how to populate their interior with new daemons. The rising and falling of the scales of pride and humility sustain their brooding minds as well as the alterations of desire and peace of soul. At that time, psychology served not only to cast suspicion upon everything human, but to oppress, to scourge, to crucify. People wished to find themselves as bad and wicked as possible. They sought anxiety for the salvation of their souls, despair of their own strength. Everything natural with which man has connected the idea of evil and sin as, for instance, he is still accustomed to do with regard to the erotic, troubles and clouds the imagination, causes a frightened glance, makes man quarrel with himself and uncertain and distrustful of himself. Even his dreams have the flavor of a restless conscience. And yet in the reality of things, the suffering from what is natural is entirely without foundation. It is only the consequence of opinions about things. It is easily seen how men grow worse by considering the inevitably natural as bad, and afterwards always feeling themselves made thus. It is the trump card of religion and metaphysics, which wish to have man evil and sinful by nature, to cast suspicion on nature and thus really to make him bad. For he learns to feel himself evil since he cannot divest himself of the clothing of nature. After living for long a natural life, he gradually comes to feel himself weighed down by such a burden of sin that supernatural powers are necessary to lift this burden, and therewith arises the so-called need of redemption, which corresponds to no real but only to an imaginary sinfulness. If we survey the separate moral demands of the earliest times of Christianity, it will everywhere be found that requirements are exaggerated in order that man cannot satisfy them. The intention is not that he should become more moral, but that he should feel himself as sinful as possible. If man had not found this feeling agreeable, why would he have thought out such an idea and stuck to it for so long? As in the antique world an immeasurable power of intellect and invertiveness was expanded in multiplying the pleasure of life by festive cults, 
So also in the age of Christianity, an immeasurable amount of intellect has been sacrificed to another endeavor. Man must by all means be made to feel himself sinful, and thereby be excited, enlivened, ensouled. To excite, enliven, ensoul at all costs. Is not that the watchword of a relaxed, overripe, overcultured age? The range of all natural sensations has been gone over a hundred times. The soul had grown weary, whereupon the saint and the ascetic invited a new species of stimulants for life. They presented themselves before the public eye, not exactly as an example for the many, but as a terrible and yet ravishing spectacle which took place on that borderland between world and overworld, wherein at that time all people believed they saw now rays of heavenly light and now unholy tongues of flame glowing in the depths. The saint's eye, fixed upon the terrible meaning of this short earthly life, upon the nearness of that last decision concerning endless new spans of existence, this burning eye in a half-wasted body made men of the old world tremble to their very depths. To gaze, to turn shudderingly away, to feel anew the attraction of the spectacle and to give way to it, to drink deep of it till the soul quivered with fire and ague. That was the last pleasure that antiquity invented, after it had grown blunted even at the sight of beast-baiting and human combats. 142. Now to sum up. That condition of soul in which the saint or embryo saint rejoiced was composed of elements which we all know well, only that under the influence of other than religious conceptions they exhibit themselves in other colors and are then accustomed to encounter man's blame as fully as, with the decoration of religion and the ultimate meaning of existence, they may reckon on receiving admiration and even worship, might reckon, at least, in former ages. Sometimes the saint practices that defiance of himself which is a near relative of domination at any cost and gives a feeling of power even to the most lonely. Sometimes his swollen sensibility leaps from the desire to let his passions have full play into the desire to overthrow them like wild horses under the mighty pressure of a proud spirit. Sometimes he desires a complete cessation of all disturbing, tormenting, irritating sensations, a waking sleep, a lasting rest in the lap of a dull, animal, and plant-like indolence. Sometimes he seeks strife and arouses it within himself, because boredom has shown him its yawning countenance. He scourges his self-adoration with self-contempt and cruelty. He rejoices in the wild tumult of his desires and the sharp pain of sin, even in the idea of being lost. He understands how to lay a trap for his emotions, for instance, even for his keen love of ruling, so that he sinks into the most utter abasement and his tormented soul is thrown out of joint by this contrast. And finally, if he longs for visions, conversations with the dead or with divine beings, it is at bottom a rare kind of delight that he covets. Perhaps that delight in which all others are united. Novalis, an authority on questions of holiness through experience and instinct, tells the whole secret with naive joy. It is strange enough that the association of lust, religion, and cruelty did not long ago draw men's attention to their close relationship and common tendency. 143. That which gives the saint his historical value is not the thing he is, but the thing he represents in the eyes of the unsaintly. It was through the fact that errors were made about him, that the state of his soul was falsely interpreted, that men separated themselves from him as much as possible, as from something incomparable and strangely superhuman, that he acquired the extraordinary power which he exercised over the imagination of whole nations and whole ages. He did not know himself. He himself interpreted the writing of his moods, inclinations, and actions according to an art of interpretation which was as exaggerated and artificial as the spiritual interpretations of the Bible. The distorted and diseased in his nature, with its combination of intellectual poverty, evil knowledge, ruined health, and overexcited nerves, remained hidden from his own sight, as well as from that of his spectators. He was not a particularly good man, and still less was he a particularly wise one but he represented something that exceeded the human standard in goodness and wisdom. The belief in him supported the belief in the divine and miraculous, in a religious meaning of all existence, in an impeding day of judgment, in the evening glory of the world's sunset, which glowed over the Christian nations, the shadowy form of the saint grew to vast dimensions. It grew to such a height that even in our own age, which no longer believes in God, there are still thinkers who believe in the saint. 144. 
It need not be said that to this description of the saint which has been made from an average of the whole species, there may be opposed many a description which could give a more agreeable impression. Certain exceptions stand out from among this species. It may be through great mildness and philanthropy. It may be through the magic of unusual energy. Others are attractive in the highest degree, because certain wild ravings have poured streams of light on their whole being, as is the case, for instance, with the famous founder of Christianity, who thought he was the son of God and therefore felt himself sinless. So that through this idea, which we must not judge too hardly because the whole antique world swarms with sons of God, he reached that same goal, that feeling of complete sinlessness, complete irresponsibility, which everyone can now acquire by means of science. Neither have I mentioned the Indian saints, who stand midway between the Christian saint and the Greek philosopher, and insofar represent no pure type. Knowledge, science, such as existed then, the uplifting above other men through logical discipline and training of thought, were as much fostered by the Buddhists as distinguishing signs of holiness as the same quantity in the Christian world are repressed and branded as signs of unholiness. End of Third Division the religious life. Fourth Division, Concerning the Soul of Artists and Authors, Part 1 of Human All Too Human, a book for free spirits by Friedrich Nietzsche, translated by Helen Zimmern, 1846 through 1934. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Aaron Rivetta. Fourth Division, Concerning the Soul of Artists and Authors, Part 1. 145. The Perfect Should Not Have Grown With regard to everything that is perfect, we are accustomed to omit the question as to how perfection has been acquired, and how we only rejoice in the present as if it had sprung out of the ground by magic. Probably with regard to this matter, we are still under the effects of an ancient mythological feeling. It still almost seems to us, in such a Greek temple, for instance, as that of Paestum, as if one morning a god in sport had built his dwelling of such enormous masses. At other times it seems as if his spirit had suddenly entered into a stone and now desired to speak through it. The artist knows that his work is only fully effective if it arouses the belief in an improvisation, in a marvelous instantaneousness of origin. And thus he assists this illusion and introduces into art those elements of inspired unrest, of bloody groping disorder, of listening dreaming at the beginning of creation, as a means of deception, in order so to influence the soul of the spectator or hearer that it may believe in the sudden appearance of the perfect. It is the business of the science of art to contradict this illusion most decidedly, and show up the mistakes and pampering of the intellect, by means of which it falls into the artist's trap. 146. The Artist's Sense of Truth with regard to recognition of truths, the artist has a weaker morality than the thinker. He will on no account let himself be deprived of brilliant and profound interpretations of life, and defends himself against temperate and simple methods and results. He is apparently fighting for the higher worthiness and meaning of mankind. In reality, he will not renounce the most effective suppositions for his art, the fantastical, mythical, uncertain, extreme, the sense of the symbolical, the overvaluation of personality. The belief that genius is something miraculous. He considers, therefore, the continuance of his art of creation as more important than the scientific devotion to truth in every shape, however simple this may appear. 147. Art as Razor of the Dead Art also fulfills the task of preservation and even of brightening up extinguished and faded memories. When it accomplishes this task, it weaves a rope round the ages and causes their spirits to return. It is, certainly, only a phantom life that results therefrom, as out of graves, or like the return in dreams of our beloved dead. But for some moments, at least, the old sensation lives again, and the heart beats to an almost forgotten time. Hence, for the sake of the general usefulness of art, the artist himself must be excused if he does not stand in the front rank of the enlightenment and progressive civilization of humanity. All his life long he has remained a child or a youth, and has stood still at the point where he was overcome by his artistic impulse. The feelings of the first years of life, however, are acknowledged to be nearer to those of earlier times than to those of the present century. Unconsciously, it becomes his mission to make mankind more childlike. This is his glory and his limitation. 148. 
poets as the lighteners of life. Poets, inasmuch as they desire to lighten the life of man, either divert his gaze from the wearisome present, or assist the present to acquire new colors by means of a life which they cause to shine out of the past. To be able to do this, they must in many respects themselves be beings who are turned towards the past, so that they can be used as bridges to far distant times and ideas, to dying or dead religions and cultures. Actually, they are always and of necessity epigoni. There are, however, certain drawbacks to their means of lightening life. They appease and heal only temporarily, only for the moment. They even prevent men from laboring towards a genuine improvement in their conditions, inasmuch as they remove and apply palliatives to precisely that passion of discontent that induces to action. 149. The Slow Arrow of Beauty The noblest kind of beauty is that which does not transport us suddenly, which does not make stormy and intoxicating impressions. Such a kind easily arouses disgust but that which slowly filter into our minds, which we take away with us almost unnoticed, and which we encounter again in our dreams, but which, however, after having long lain modestly on our hearts, takes entire possession of us, fills our eyes with tears, and our hearts with longing. What is it that we long for at the sight of beauty? We long to be beautiful. We fancy it must bring much happiness with it. But that is a mistake. 150. The Animation of Art Art raises its head where creeds relax. It takes over many feelings and moods engendered by religion, lays them to its heart, and itself becomes deeper, more full of soul, so that it is capable of transmitting exultation and enthusiasm, which it previously was not able to do. The abundance of religious feelings which have grown into a stream are always breaking forth again, and desire to conquer new kingdoms, but the growing enlightenment has shaken the dogmas of religion and inspired a deep mistrust. Thus, the feeling, thrust by enlightenment, out of the religious sphere, throws itself upon art, in a few cases into political life, even straight into science. Everywhere where human endeavor wears a loftier, gloomier aspect, it may be assumed that the fear of spirits, incense, and church shadows have remained attached to it. 151 how rhythm beautifies. Rhythm casts a veil over reality. It causes various artificialities of speech and obscurities of thought. By the shadow it throws open upon it sometimes conceals it, and sometimes brings it into prominence. As shadow is necessary to beauty, so the dull is necessary to lucidity. Art makes the aspect of life endurable by throwing over it the veil of obscure thought. 152. The Art of the Ugly Soul Art is confined within two narrow limits if it be required that only the orderly, respectable, well-behaved soul should be allowed to express itself therein. As in the plastic arts, so also in music and poetry. There is an art of the ugly soul side by side with the art of the beautiful soul. And the mightiest effects of art, the crushing of souls, moving of stones, and humanizing of beasts, have perhaps been best achieved precisely by that art. 153. Art makes heavy the heart of the thinker. How strong metaphysical need is and how difficult nature renders our departure from it may be seen from the fact that even in the free spirit, when he has cast off everything metaphysical, the loftiest effects of art can easily produce a resounding of the long, silent, even broken, metaphysical string. It may be, for instance, that at a passage of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, he feels himself floating above the earth in a starry dome with a dream of immortality in his heart. All the stars seem to shine round him, and the earth to sink farther and farther away. If he becomes conscious of this state, he feels a deep pain at his heart, and sighs for the man who will lead back to him his lost darling, be it called religion or metaphysics. In such moments, his intellectual character is put to the test. 154. Playing with Life The lightness and frivolity of the Homeric imagination was necessary to calm and occasionally to raise the immoderately passionate temperament and acute intellect of the Greeks. If their intellect speaks, how harsh and cruel does life then appear? They do not deceive themselves, but they intentionally weave lies round life. Simonides advised his countrymen to look upon life as a game, 
earnestness was too well known to them as pain. The gods so gladly hear the misery of mankind made the theme of song. And they knew that through art alone misery might be turned into pleasure. As a punishment for this insight, however, they were so plagued with the love of romancing that it was difficult for them in everyday life to keep themselves free from falsehood and deceit. For all poetic nations have such a love of falsehood, and yet are innocent withal. Probably this occasionally drove the neighboring nations to desperation. 155. The Belief in Inspiration it is to the interest of the artist that there should be a belief in sudden suggestions, so-called inspirations, as if the idea of a work of art, of poetry, the fundamental thought of a philosophy shone down from heaven like a ray of grace. In reality, the imagination of the good artist or thinker constantly produces good, mediocre, and bad, but his judgment, most clear and practiced, rejects and chooses and joins together just as we now learn from Beethoven's notebooks that he gradually composed the most beautiful melodies and in a manner selected them from many different attempts. He who makes less severe distinctions and willingly abandons himself to imitative memories may under certain circumstances become a great improvisateur, but artistic improvisation ranks low in comparison with serious and laboriously chosen artistic thoughts. All great men were great workers unwearied not only in invention but also in rejection, reviewing, transforming, and arranging. 156. Inspiration Again If the productive power has been suspended for a length of time and has been hindered in its outflow by some obstacle, there comes at last a sudden outpouring, as if an immediate inspiration were taking place without previous inward working, consequently a miracle. This constitutes the familiar deception, in the continuance of which, as we have said, the interest of all artists is rather too much concerned. The capital is only accumulated, it has not suddenly fallen down from heaven. Moreover, such apparent inspirations are seen elsewhere, for instance, in the realm of goodness, of virtue, of vice. 157. The Suffering of Genius and Its Value the artistic genius desires to give pleasure, but if his mind is on a very high plane, he does not easily find anyone to share his pleasure. He offers entertainment, but nobody accepts it. This gives him, in certain circumstances, a comically touching pathos, for he has really no right to force pleasure on men. He pipes, but none will dance. Can that be tragic? Perhaps. As compensation for this deprivation, however, he finds more pleasure in creating than the rest of mankind experiences in all other species of activity. His sufferings are considered as exaggerated because the sound of his complaints is louder and his tongue is more eloquent. And yet sometimes his sufferings are really very great, but only because his ambition and his envy are so great. The learned genius, like Kepler and Spinoza, is usually not so covetous and does not make such an exhibition of his really greater sufferings and deprivations. He can reckon with greater certainty on future fame and can afford to do without the present, whilst an artist who does this always plays a desperate game that makes his heart ache. In very rare cases, when in one and the same individual are combined with genius of power and of knowledge and the moral genius, there is added to the above-mentioned pains that species of pain which must be regarded as the most curious exception in the world those extra and super-personal sensations which are experienced on behalf of a nation, of humanity, of all civilization, all suffering existence, which acquire their value through the connection with particularly difficult and remote perceptions. Pity in itself is worth but little. But what standard, what proof is there for its geniusness? Is it not almost imperative to be mistrustful of all who talk of feeling sensations of this kind? 158. The destiny of greatness. Every great phenomenon is followed by degeneration, especially in the world of art. The example of the great tempts vainer natures to superficial imitation or exaggeration. All great gifts have the fatality of crushing many weaker forces and germs, and of laying waste all nature around them. The happiest arrangement in the development of an art is for several geniuses mutually to hold one another within bounds. In this strife, it generally happens that light and air are also granted to the weaker and more delicate natures. 159. Art Dangerous for the Artist 
When art takes strong hold of an individual, it draws him back to the contemplation of those times when art flourished best, and it has then a retrograde effect. The artist grows more and more to reverence sudden inspirations. He believes in gods and daemons. He spiritualizes all nature, hates science, is changeable in his moods like the ancients, and longs for an overthrow of existing conditions which are not favorable to art, and does this with the impetuosity and unreasonableness of a child. Now, in himself, the artist is already a backward nature, because he halts at a game that belongs properly to youth and childhood. To this is added the fact that he is educated back into former times. Thus, there gradually arises a fierce antagonism between him and his contemporaries, and a sad ending. According to the counts of the ancients, Homer and Ashilu spent their last years and died in melancholy. 160. Created Individuals When it is said that the dramatist, and the artist above all, creates real characters. It is a fine deception and exaggeration, in the existence and propagation of which art celebrates one of its unconscious but at the same time abundant triumphs. As a matter of fact, we do not understand much about a real, living man, and we generalize very superficially when we ascribe to him this and that character. This very imperfect attitude of ours toward man is represented by the poet, inasmuch as he makes into men, in this sense creates, Outlines as superficial as our knowledge of man is superficial. There is a great deal of delusion about these created characters of artists. They are by no means living productions of nature, but are like painted men, somewhat too thin. They will not bear a close inspection. And when it is said that the character of the ordinary living being contradicts itself frequently, and that one created by the dramatist is the original model conceived by nature, this is quite wrong. A genuine man is something absolutely necessary, even in those so-called contradictions. But we do not always recognize this necessity. The imaginary man, the phantasm, signifies something necessary, but only to those who understand a real man only in a crude, unnatural simplification, so that a few strong, oft-repeated traits, with a great deal of light and shade and half-life about them, amplify, satisfy their notions. They are, therefore, ready to treat the phantasm as a genuine, necessary man, because with real men they are accustomed to regard a phantasm, an outline, an intentional abbreviation as the whole. That the painter and sculptor express the idea of man is a vain imagination and delusion. Whoever says this is in subjection to the eye, for this only sees the surface, the epidermis of the human body. The inward body, however, is equally a part of the idea. Plastic art wishes to make character visible on the surface, Histrionic art employs speech for the same purpose. It reflects character and sounds. Art stands from the natural ignorance of man about his interior condition, embodying character. It is not meant for philosophers or natural scientists. 161. The overvaluation of self in the belief in artists and philosophers. We are all prone to think that the excellence of a work of art or of an artist is proved when it moves and touches us. But there, our own excellence in judgment and sensibility must have been proved first, which is not the case. In all plastic art, who had greater power to effect a charm than Bernini? Who made a greater effect than the order that appeared after Demosthenes introduced the Asiatic style and gave it predominance which lasted throughout two centuries? This predominance during whole centuries is not a proof of the excellence and enduring validity of a style. Therefore, we must not be too certain in our good opinion of any artist. This is not only belief in the truthfulness of our sensations, but also in the infallibility of our judgment. Whereas judgment or sensation, or even both, may be too coarse or too fine, exaggerated or crude. Neither are the blessings and blissfulness of a philosophy or of a religion proof of its truth. Just as little as the happiness which an insane person derives from his fixed idea is a proof of the reasonableness of this idea. 162. The Cult of Genius for the Sake of Vanity Because we think well of ourselves, but nevertheless do not imagine that we are capable of the conception of one of Raphael's pictures, or of a scene such as those of one of Shakespeare's dramas, we persuade ourselves that the faculty for doing this is quite extraordinarily wonderful, a very rare case, or, if we are religiously inclined, a grace from above. Thus the cult of genius fosters our vanity, our self-love, 
for it is only when we think of it as very far removed from us, as a miraculum, that it does not wound us. Even Goethe, who is free from envy, called Shakespeare star of the furthest heavens, whereby we are reminded of the line, Die Sterne, die Begert, man nicht. Footnote. The allusion is to Goethe's lines, Die Sterne, die Begert, man nicht. Man frut, sieg iher, pracht. We do not want the stars themselves. Their brilliancy delights our hearts. J.M.K. End footnote. But apart from those suggestions of our vanity, the activity of genius does not seem so radically different from the activity of a mechanical inventor, of an astronomer or historian or strategist. All these forms of activity are explicable if we realize men whose minds are active in one special direction, who make use of everything as material, who always eagerly study their own inward life and that of others, who find types and incitements everywhere, who never weary on the employment of their means. Genius does nothing but learn how to lay stones, then to build, always to seek for material and always to work upon it. Every human activity is marvelously complicated and not only that of genius, but it is no miracle. Now whence comes the belief that genius is found only in artists, orators, and philosophers, that they alone have intuition, by which we credit them with a kind of magic glass by means of which they see straight into one's being. It is clear that men only speak of genius where the workings of a great intellect are most agreeable to them and have no desire to feel envious. To call anyone divine is as much as saying, Here we have no occasion for rivalry. Thus it is that everything completed and perfect is stared at, and everything incomplete is undervalued. Now nobody can see how the work of an artist has developed. That is its advantage, for everything of which the development is seen is looked on coldly. The perfected art of representation precludes all thought of its development. It tyrannizes as perfect perfection. For this reason, artists of representation are especially held to be possessors of genius, but not scientific men. In reality, however, the former valuation and the latter undervaluation are only puerilities of reason. 163. The Earnestness of Handicraft Do not talk of gifts, of inborn talents. We could mention great men of all kinds who were but little gifted, but they obtained greatness, became geniuses, as they are called, through qualities of the lack of which nobody who is conscious of them likes to speak. They all had that thorough earnestness for work which learns first how to form the different parts perfectly before it ventures to make a great whole. They gave themselves time for this because they took more pleasure in doing small, accessory things well than in the effect of a dazzling whole. For instance, the recipe for becoming a good novelist is easily given, but the carrying out of the recipe presupposes qualities which we are in the habit of overlooking when we say, I have not sufficient talent. Make a hundred or more sketches of novel plots, none more than two pages long, but of such clearness that every word in them is necessary. Write down anecdotes every day until you learn to find the most pregnant, most effective form. Never weary of collecting and delineating human types and characters. Above all, narrate things as often as possible, and listen to narrations with a sharp eye and ear for the effect upon other people present. Travel like a landscape painter and a designer of costumes. Take from different sciences everything that is artistically effective, if it be well represented. Finally, meditate on the motives for human actions, score not even the smallest point of instruction on the subject, and collect similar matters by day and night. Spend some ten years in these various exercises, then the creations of your study may be allowed to see the light of day. But what do most people do, on the contrary? They do not begin with the part, but with the whole. Perhaps they make one good stroke, excite attention, and even afterwards their work grows worse and worse, for good, natural reasons. But sometimes, when intellect and character are lacking for the formation of such an artistic career, fate and necessity take the place of these qualities and lead the future master step by step through all the phases of his craft. 164. The Danger and the Gain in the Cult of Genius the belief in great, superior, fertile minds is not necessarily, but still very frequently, 
connected with that holy or partially religious superstition that those spirits are of superhuman origin and possess certain marvelous faculties, by means of which they obtain their knowledge in ways quite different from the rest of mankind. They are credited with having an immediate insight into the nature of the world, through a peephole in the mantle of the phenomenon, as it were, and it is believed that, without the trouble and severity of science, by virtue of this marvelous prophetic sight, they could impart something final and decisive about mankind and the world. So long as there are still believers in miracles in the world of knowledge, it may perhaps be admitted that the believers themselves derive a benefit therefrom, inasmuch as by their absolute subjection to great minds they obtain the best discipline and schooling for their own minds during the period of development. On the other hand, it may at least be questioned whether the superstition of genius, of its privileges and special faculties, is useful for a genius himself when it implants itself in him. In any case, it is a dangerous sign when man shudders at his own self, be it that famous Caesarian shudder or the shudder of genius which applies to this case, when the incense of sacrifice, which by rights is offered to a god alone, penetrates into the brain of the genius, so that he begins to waver and to look upon himself as something superhuman. The slow consequences are the feeling of irresponsibility, the exceptional rights, the belief that mere intercourse with him confers a favor, and frantic rage at any attempt to compare him with others or even to place him below them and to bring into prominence whatever is unsuccessful in his work. Through the fact that he ceases to criticize himself, one pinion after another falls out of his plumage, that superstition undermines the foundation of his strength and even makes him a hypocrite after his powers failed him. For great minds it is, therefore, perhaps better when they come to an understanding about their strength and its source, when they comprehend what purely human qualities are mingled in them, what a combination they are of fortunate conditions. Thus, once it was continual energy, a decided application to individual aims, great personal courage, and then the good of fortune of an education, which at an early period provided the best teachers, examples, and methods. Assuredly, if its aim is to make the greatest possible effect, abstrusiveness has always done much for itself and that gift of partial insanity. For at all times that power has been admired and envied by means of which men were deprived of will and imbued with the fancy that they were preceded by supernatural leaders. Truly, men are exalted and inspired by the belief that someone among them is endowed with supernatural powers. And in this respect, insanity, as Pluto says, has brought the greatest blessings to mankind. In a few rare cases, this form of insanity may also have been the means by which an all-around exuberant nature was kept within bounds. In individual life, the imaginings of frenzy frequently exert the virtue of remedies which are poisons in themselves, but in every genius that believes in his own divinity, the poison shows itself at last in the same proportion as the genius grows old. We need but recollect the example of Napoleon, for it was almost assuredly through his faith in himself and his star, and through his scorn of mankind, that he grew to that mighty unity that distinguished him from all modern men, until at last, however, this faith developed into an almost insane fatalism, robbed him of his quickness of comprehension and penetration, and was the cause of his downfall. 165. Genius and Nullity it is precisely the original artists, those who create out of their own heads, who in certain circumstances can bring forth complete emptiness and husk, whilst the more dependent natures, the so-called talented ones, are full of memories of all manner of goodness, and even in a state of weakness produce something tolerable. But if the original ones are abandoned by themselves, memory renders them no assistance, they become empty. 166 the public. The people really demand nothing more from tragedy than to be deeply affected in order to have a good cry occasionally. The artist, on the contrary, who sees the new tragedy, takes pleasure in the clever technical inventions and tricks, in the management and distribution of the material, in the novel arrangement of old motives and old ideas. His attitude is the aesthetic attitude toward a work of art, that of the creator, the one first described, with regard solely to the material, is that of the people. Of the individual who stands between the two nothings need be said, he is neither people nor artist, 
and does not know what he wants. Therefore, his pleasure is also clouded and insignificant. 167. The Artistic Education of the Public If the same motif is not employed in a hundred ways by different masters, the public never learns to get beyond their interest in the subject. But at last, when it is well acquainted with the motif through countless different treatments and no longer finds in it any charm of novelty or excitement, it will then begin to grasp and enjoy the various shades and delicate new inventions in its treatment. 168. The artist and his followers must keep in step. The progress from one grade of style to another must be slow, that not only the artist but also the auditors and spectators can follow it and know exactly what is going on. Otherwise, there will suddenly appear that great chasm between the artist, who creates his work upon a height apart, and the public, who cannot rise up to that height and finally sinks discontentedly deeper. For when the artist no longer raises his public, it rapidly sinks downward, and its fall is the deeper and more dangerous in proportion to the height to which genius has carried it, like the eagle, out of whose talons a tortoise that has been borne up into the cloud falls to its destruction. 169. The Source of the Comic Element If we consider that for many thousands of years man was an animal that was susceptible in the highest degree to fear, and that everything sudden and unexpected had to find him ready for battle, perhaps even ready for death, that even later, in social relations, all security was based on the expected, on custom and thought and action, we need not be surprised that at everything sudden and unexpected in word and deed, if it occurs without danger or injury, man becomes exuberant and passes over into the very opposite of fear. That terrified, trembling, crouching being shoots upward, stretches itself. Man laughs. This transition from momentary fear into short-lived exhilaration is called the comic. On the other hand, in the tragic phenomenon, man passes quickly from great enduring exuberance into great fear. But as amongst mortals, great and lasting exuberance is much rarer than the cause for fear. There is far more comedy than tragedy in the world. We laugh much oftener than we are agitated. 170. The Artist's Ambition The Greek artists, the tragedarians for instance, composed in order to conquer. Their whole art cannot be imagined without rivalry. The good Hesedonian, Eris, Ambition, gave wings to their genius. This ambition further demands that their work should achieve the greatest excellence in their own eyes, as they understood excellence without any regard for the reigning taste and the general opinion about excellence in a work of art. And thus it was long before Aeschylus and Euripides achieved any success, until at last they educated judges of art, who valued their work according to the standards which they themselves appointed. Hence, they strove for victory over rivals according to their own valuation. They really wished to be more excellent. They demanded assent from without to this self-valuation, the confirmation of this verdict. To achieve honor means, in this case, to make oneself superior to others and to desire that this should be recognized publicly. Should the former condition be wanting and the latter nevertheless desired, it is then called vanity. Should the latter be lacking and not missed, then it is named pride. 171. What is needful to a work of art? Those who talk so much about the needful factors of a work of art exaggerate. If they are artists, they do so in majorum artis gloriam. If they are laymen, from ignorance. The form of a work of art, which gives speech to their thoughts and is, therefore, their mode of talking, is always somewhat uncertain like all kinds of speech. The sculptor can add or omit many little traits, as can also the exponent, be he an actor or, in music, a performer or conductor. These many little traits and finishing touches afford him pleasure one day and none the next. They exist more for the sake of the artist than the art, for he also has occasionally need of sweetmeats and playthings to prevent him from becoming morose with the severity and self-restraint which the representation of the dominant idea demands from him. 172. To cause the master to be forgotten. The pianoforte player who executes the work of a master will have played best if he has made his audience forget the master, and if it seemed as if he were relating a story from his own life or just passing through some experience. 
Assuredly, if he is of no importance, everyone will abhor the garrulity with which he talks about his own life. Therefore, he must know how to influence his hearer's imagination favorably toward himself. Hereby are explained all the weaknesses and follies of the virtuoso. 173. Corriger la Fortune There are unfortunate accidents in the lives of great artists, which compel the painter, for instance, to sketch out his most important picture only as a passing thought, or such as oblige Beethoven to leave behind him the only insufficient pianoforte score of many great sonatas, as in the great B-flat. In these cases, the artist of a later day must endeavor to fill out the life of the great man. Of all orchestral effects, would call into life that symphony which has fallen into the piano trance. 174. Reducing. Many things, events, or persons, cannot bear treatment on a small scale. The Laocoon group cannot be reduced to a knick-knack. Great size is necessary to it. But more seldom still does anything that is naturally small bear enlargement, for which reason biographers succeed far oftener in representing a great man as small than a small one as great. 175. Sensuousness in present-day art. Artists nowadays frequently miscalculate when they count on the sensuous effect of their works, for their spectators or hearers have no longer a fully sensuous nature, and quite contrary to the artist's intention, his work produces in them a holiness of feeling which is closely related to boredom. Their sensuousness begins, perhaps, just where that of the artist ceases. They meet, therefore, only at one point at the most. 176. Shakespeare as a Moralist Shakespeare meditated much on the passions, and on account of his temperament had probably a close acquaintance with many of them, dramatists are in general rather wicked men. He could, however, not talk on the subject, like Montaigne, but put his observations thereon into the mouths of impassioned figures, which is contrary to nature, certainly, but makes his drama so rich in thought that they cause all others to seem poor in comparison and readily arouse a general aversion to them. Schiller's reflections, which are almost always based on erroneous or trivial fancies, are just theatrical reflections, and as such are very effective, whereas Shakespeare's reflections do honor to his model, Montaigne, and contain quite serious thoughts in polished form, but on that account are too remote and refined for the eyes of the theatrical public, and are consequently ineffective. 177. Securing a Good Hearing It is not sufficient to know how to play well. One must also know how to secure a good hearing, a violin in the hand of the greatest master gives only a little squeak when the place where it is heard is too large. The master may then be mistaken for any bungler. 178. The incomplete as the effective. Just as figures in relief make such a strong impression on the imagination because they seem in the act of emerging from the wall and only stop by some sudden hindrance, so the relief-like incomplete representation of a thought, or a whole philosophy, is sometimes more effective than its exhaustive amplification. More is left for the investigation of the onlooker. He is incited to the further study of that which stands out before him in such strong light and shade. He is prompted to think out the subject, even to overcome the hindrance which hitherto prevented it from emerging clearly. 179. Against the Eccentric when art arrays itself in the most shabby material, it is most easily recognized as art. 180. Collective Intellect A good author possesses not only his own intellect, but also that of his friends. 181. Different Kinds of Mistakes the misfortune of acute and clear authors is that people consider them as shallow and therefore do not devote any effort to them, and the good fortune of obscure writers is that the reader makes an effort to understand them and places the delight in his own zeal to their credit. 182. Relation to Science None of the people have any real interest in a science who only begin to be enthusiastic about it when they themselves have made discoveries in it. 183. The Key 
The single thought on which an eminent man sets a great value, arousing the derision and laughter of the masses, is for him a key to hidden treasures. For them, however, it is nothing more than a piece of old iron. 184. Untranslatable. It is neither the best nor the worst parts of a book which are untranslatable. 185. Author's Paradoxes. The so-called paradoxes of an author to which a reader objects are often not in the author's book at all, but in the reader's head. 186. Wit. The wittiest authors produce a scarcely noticeable smile. 187. Antithesis. Antithesis is the narrow gate through which error is fondness of sneaking to the truth. 188. Thinkers as stylists. Most thinkers write badly because they communicate not only their thoughts, but also the thinking of them. 189. Thoughts in Poetry. The poet conveys his thoughts ceremoniously in the vehicle of rhythm, usually because they are not able to go on foot. 190. The Sin Against the Reader's Intellect. When an author renounces his talent in order merely to put himself on a level with the reader, he commits the only deadly sin which the latter will never forgive, should he notice anything of it. One may say everything that is bad about a person, but in the manner in which it is said, one must know how to revive his vanity anew. 191. The Limits of Uprightness Even the most upright author lets fall a word too much when he wishes to round off a period. 192. The Best Author The best author will be he who is ashamed to become one. 193. Draconian law against authors. One should regard authors as criminals who only obtain acquittal or mercy in the rarest cases. That would be a remedy for books becoming too rife. End of Fourth Division, Part 1. Fourth Division, Concerning the Soul of Artists and Authors, Part 2 of Human All Too Human, A Book for Free Spirits, by Friedrich Nietzsche, translated by Helen Zimmern. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 194. The Fools of Modern Culture The fools of medieval courts correspond to our Phaeton writers. They are the same kind of men, semi-rational, witty, extravagant, foolish, Sometimes they are only for the purpose of lessening the pathos of the outlook with fancies and chatter, and of drowning with their clamor the far too deep and solemn chimes of great events. They were formerly in the service of princes and nobles, now they are in the service of parties, since a large portion of the old obsequiousness in the intercourse of the people with their prince still survives in party feeling and party discipline. Modern literary men, however, are generally very similar to the Phaeton writers. They are the fools of modern culture whom one judges more leniently when one does not regard them as fully responsible beings. To look upon writing as a regular profession should justly be regarded as a form of madness. 195. After the example of the Greeks. It is a great hindrance to knowledge at present that, owing to centuries of exaggeration of feeling, all words have become vague and inflated. The higher stage of culture, which is under the sway, though not under the tyranny, of knowledge, requires great sobriety of feeling and thorough concentration of words, on which points the Greeks in the time of Demosthenes set an example to us. Exaggeration is a distinguished mark of all modern writings, and even when they are simply written the expressions therein are still felt as too eccentric. Careful reflection, conciseness, coldness, plainness, even carried intentionally to the farthest limits, in a word, suppression of feeling and taciturnity, these are the only remedies. For the rest, this cold manner of writing and feeling is now very attractive, as a contrast, and to be sure there is a new danger therein, for intense cold is as good as stimulus as a high degree of warmth. 196. Good narrators, bad explainers. 
In good narrators, there is often found an admirable psychological sureness and logicalness, as far as these qualities can be observed in the actions of their personages, in positively ludicrous contrast to their inexperienced psychological reasoning, so that their culture appears to be as extraordinarily high one moment as it seems regrettably defective in the next. It happens far too frequently that they give an evidently false explanation of their own heroes and their actions. Of this, there is no doubt, however improbable the thing may appear. It is quite likely that the greatest pianoforte player has thought but little about the technical conditions and the special virtues, drawbacks, usefulness, and tractability of each finger, dactylic ethics, and makes big mistakes whenever he speaks of such things. 197. The Writings of Acquaintances and Their Readers We read the writings of our acquaintances, friends and enemies, in a double sense, inasmuch as our perception constantly whispers, this is something of himself, a remembrance of his inward being, his experiences, his talents. And at the same time, another kind of perception endeavors to estimate the profit of the work in itself, what valuation it merits apart from its author, how far it will enrich knowledge. These two manners of reading and estimating interfere with each other, as may naturally be supposed. And a conversation with a friend will only bear good fruit of knowledge when both think only of the matter under consideration and forget they are friends. 198. Rhythmical Sacrifice Good writers alter the rhythm of many a period merely because they do not credit the general reader with the ability to comprehend the measure, followed by the period in its first version. Thus they make it easier for the reader by giving the preference to the better-known rhythms. This regard for the rhythmical incapacity of the modern reader has already called forth many a sigh, for much has been sacrificed to it. Does not the same thing happen to good musicians? 199. The incomplete as an artistic stimulus. The incomplete is often more effective than perfection, and this is the case with eulogies. To effect their purpose, a stimulating incompleteness is necessary, as an irrational element, which calls up a sea before the hearer's imagination and, like a mist, conceals the opposite coast, i.e. the limits of the object of praise. If the well-known merits of a person are referred to and described at length and in detail, it always gives rise to the suspicion that these are his only merits. The perfect eulogist takes his stand above the person praised. He appears to overlook him. Therefore, complete praise has a weakening effect. 200. Precautions in Writing and Teaching Whoever has once written and has been seized with the passion for writing learns from almost all that he does and experiences that which is literally communicable. He thinks no longer of himself, but of the author and his public. He desires insight into things, but not for his own use. He who teaches is mostly incapable of doing anything for his own good. He's always thinking of the good of his scholars, and all knowledge delights him only insofar as he is able to teach it. He comes at last to regard himself as a medium of knowledge, and above all, as a means thereto, so that he has lost all serious consideration for himself. 201. The Necessity for Bad Authors There will always be a need of bad authors, for they meet the taste of readers of an undeveloped, immature age. These have their requirements as well as mature readers. If human life were a greater length, the number of mature individuals would be greater than that of the immature, or at least equally great. But, as it is, by far the greater number die too young, i.e., there are always many more undeveloped intellects with bad taste. These demand, with the greater impetuosity of youth, the satisfaction of their needs, and they insist on having bad authors. 202. Too near and too far. The reader and the author very often do not understand each other, because the author knows his theme too well and finds it almost slow, so that he omits the examples, of which he knows hundreds, the reader, however, is interested in the subject and is liable to consider it as badly proved if examples are lacking. 203. A Vanished Preparation for Art Of everything that was practiced in public schools, the thing of greatest value was the exercise in Latin style. This was an exercise in art, whilst all other occupations aimed only at the acquirement of knowledge. It is a barbarism to put German composition before it, for there is no typical German style developed by public oratory. 
But if there is a desire to advance practice and thoughts by means of German composition, then it is certainly better for the time being to pay no attention to style, to separate the practice in thought, therefore, from the practice in reproduction. The latter should confine itself to the various modes of presenting a given subject, and should not concern itself with the independent finding of a subject. The mere presentment of given subject was the task of the Latin style, for which the old teachers possessed a long-vanished delicacy of ear. Formerly, whoever learned to write well in a modern language had to thank this practice for the acquirement. Now we are obliged to go to school to the older French writers. But yet more, he obtained an idea of the loftiness and difficulty of form, and was prepared for art in the only right way, by practice. 204. Darkness and Overbrightness Side by Side Authors who, in general, do not understand how to express their thoughts clearly are fond of choosing, in detail, the strongest, most exaggerated distinctions and superlatives. Thereby is produced an effect of light, which is like torchlight in intricate forest paths. 205. Literary Painting an important object will be best described if the colors for the painting are taken out of the object itself, as a chemist does, and then employed like an artist, so that the drawing develops from the outlines and transitions of the colors. Thus the painting acquires something of the enticing natural element which gives such importance to the object itself. 206. Books which teach how to dance. There are authors who, by representing the impossible as possible, and by talking of morality and cleverness, as if both were merely moods and humors assumed at will, produce a feeling of exuberant freedom, as if man stood on tiptoe and were compelled to dance from sheer inward delight. 207. Unfinished Thoughts Just as not only manhood, but also youth and childhood have a value per se, and are not to be looked upon merely as passages and bridges, so also unfinished thoughts have their value. For this reason we must not torment a poet with subtle explanations, but must take pleasure in the uncertainty of his horizon, as if the way to further thoughts were still open. We stand on the threshold, we wait as for the digging up of a treasure, it is as if a well of profundity were about to be discovered. The poet anticipates something of the thinker's pleasure in the discovery of a leading thought, and makes us covetous, so that we give chase to it, but it flutters past our head and exhibits the loveliest butterfly wings, and yet it escapes us. 208. The book grown almost into a human being. Every author is surprised anew at the way in which his book, as soon as he has sent it out, continues to live a life of its own. It seems to him as if one part of an insect had been cut off and now went on its own way. Perhaps he forgets it almost entirely. Perhaps he rises above the view expressed therein. Perhaps even he understands it no longer, and has lost that impulse upon which he soared at the time he conceived the book. Meanwhile, it seeks its readers, inflames life, pleases, horrifies, inspires new works, becomes the soul of design and actions. In short, it lives like a creature endowed with a mind and soul, and yet is no human being. The happiest fate is that of the author who, as an old man, is able to say that all there was in him of life-inspiring, strengthening, exalting, enlightening thoughts and feelings still lives on in his writings, and that he himself now only represents the gray ashes, whilst the fire has been kept alive and spread out. And if we consider that every human action, not only a book, is in some way or other the cause of other actions, decisions, and thoughts, that everything that happens is inseparably connected with everything that is going to happen, we recognize the real immorality, that of movement, that which has once moved is enclosed and immortalized in the general union of all existence, like an insect within a piece of amber. 209. Joy in Old Age The thinker, as likewise the artist, who has put his best self into his works, feels an almost malicious joy when he sees how mind and body are being slowly damaged and destroyed by time, as if from a dark corner he were spying a thief in his money chest, knowing all the time that it was empty and his treasures in safety. 210. Quiet Fruitfulness The born aristocrats of the mind are not in too much of a hurry. 
Their creations appear and fall from the tree on some quiet autumn evening, without being rashly desired, instigated, or pushed aside by the new matter. The unceasing desire to create is vulgar, and betrays envy, jealousy, and ambition. If a man is something, it is not really necessary for him to do anything, and yet he does a great deal. There is a human species higher even than we, productive man. 211. Achilles and Homer It is always like the case of Achilles and Homer, that one has the experiences and sensations, and the other describes them. A genuine author only puts into words the feelings and adventures of others. He is an artist, and divines much from the little he has experienced. Artists are by no means creatures of great passion, but they frequently represent themselves as such, with the unconscious feeling that their depicted passion will be better believed in if their own life gives credence to their experience in these affairs. They need only let themselves go, not control themselves, and give free play to their anger and their desires, and everyone will immediately cry out, how passionate he is! But the deeply stirring passion that consumes and often destroys the individual is another matter. Those who have already experienced it do not describe it in dramas, harmonies, or romances. Artists are frequently unbridled individuals, insofar as they are not artists, but that is a different thing. 2.12. Old Doubts About the Effect of Art should pity and fear really be unburdened through tragedy, as Aristotle would have it, so that the hearers return home colder and quieter? Should ghost stories really make us less fearful and superstitious? In the case of certain physical processes, in the satisfaction of love, for instance, it is true that with the fulfillment of a need there follows an alleviation and temporary decrease in the impulse. But fear and pity are not in this sense the needs of particular organs, which require to be relieved and in time every instinct is even strengthened by practice in its satisfaction, in spite of that periodical mitigation. It might be possible that in each single case pity and fear would be soothed and relieved by tragedy. Nonetheless, they might, on the whole, be increased by traffic influences, and Plato would be right in saying that tragedy makes us altogether more timid and susceptible. This tragic poet himself would then of necessity acquire a gloomy and fearful view of the world, and a yielding, irritable, tearful soul. It would also agree with Plato's view if the tragic poets, and likewise the entire part of the community that derive particular pleasure from them, degenerated into even greater licentiousness and intemperance. But what right, indeed, has our age to give an answer to that great question of Plato's as to the moral influence of art? If we even had art, where have we an influence, any kind of an art influence? 213. Pleasure in Nonsense. How can we take pleasure in nonsense? But wherever there is laughter in the world, this is the case. It may even be said that almost everywhere where there is happiness, there is found pleasure in nonsense. The transformation of experience into its opposite, of the suitable into the unsuitable, the obligatory into the optional, but in such a manner that this process produces no injury and is only imagined in jest. It is a pleasure for it temporarily liberates us from the yoke of the obligatory, suitable, and experienced in which we usually find our pitiless masters. We play and laugh when the expected, which generally causes fear and expectancy, happens without bringing any injury. It is the pleasure felt by slaves in the Saturnalian feasts. 214. The Ennobling of Reality through the fact that in the aphrodisiac impulse men discerned a godhead and with adoring gratitude felt it working within themselves, this emotion has in the course of time become imbued with higher conceptions and has thereby been materially ennobled. Thus certain nations, by virtue of this art of idealization, have created great aids to culture out of diseases. The Greeks, for instance, who in earlier centuries suffered from great nervous epidemics, like epilepsy and St. Vitus' dance, and developed out of them the splendid type of the Bacchant. The Greeks, however, enjoyed an astonishingly high degree of health. Their secret was to revere even disease as a god, if it only possessed power. 215. Music. Music by and for itself is not so portentous for our inward nature, so deeply moving, that it ought to be looked upon as the direct language of the feelings, 
but its ancient union with poetry has infused so much symbolism into rhythmical movement, into loudness and softness of tone, that we now imagine it speaks directly to and comes from the inward nature. Dramatic music is only possible when the art of harmony has acquired an immense range of symbolical means, through song, opera, and a hundred attempts at description by sound. Absolute magic is either form per se in the rude condition of music when playing in time and with various degrees of strength gives pleasure, or the symbolism of form which speaks to the understanding even without poetry. After the two arts were joined finally together after long development and the musical form had been woven about with threads of meaning and feeling. People who are backward in musical development can appreciate a piece of harmony merely as execution, whilst those who are advanced will comprehend it symbolically. No music is deep and full of meaning in itself. It does not speak of will, of the thing in itself. That could be imagined by the intellect only in an age which had conquered for musical symbolism the entire range of inner life. It was the intellect itself that first gave this meaning to sound, just as it also gave meaning to the relation between lines and masses in architecture, but which in itself is quite foreign to mechanical laws. 216. Gesture and Speech Older than speech is the imitation of gestures, which is carried on unconsciously and which, in the general repression of the language of gesture and trained control of the muscles, is still so great that we cannot look at a face moved by emotion without feeling an agitation of our own face. It may be remarked that feigned yawnings excites real yawning in anyone who sees it. The imitated gesture leads the one who imitates back to the sensation it expressed in the face or body of the one imitated. Thus, men learn to understand one another. Thus, the child still learns to understand the mother. Generally speaking, painful sensations may also have been expressed by gestures, and the pain which caused them, for instance, tearing the hair, beating the breast, forcible distortion and straining of the muscles of the face. On the other hand, gestures of joy were themselves joyful and lent themselves easily to the communication of the understanding. Laughter, as the expression of the feeling when being tickled, serves also for the expression of the other pleasurable sensations. As soon as men understand each other by gestures, there could be established a symbolism of gesture. I mean, an understanding could be arrived at respecting the language of accents, so that first accent and gesture, to which it was symbolically added, were produced, and later on the accent alone. In former times there happened very frequently that which now happens in the development of music, especially of dramatic musics. While music, without explanatory dance and pantomime, language of gesture, is at first only empty sound, but by long familiarity with that combination of music and movement, the ear becomes schooled into instant interpretation of the figures of sound, and finally attains a height of quick understanding, where it has no longer any need of visible movement, and understands the sound poet without it. It is then called absolute music, that is music in which, without further help, everything is symbolically understood. 217. The Spiritualizing of Higher Art By virtue of extraordinary intellectual exercise through the art development of the new music, our ears have been growing more intellectual. For this reason we can now endure a much greater volume of sound, much more noise, because we are far better practiced in listening for the sense in it than were our ancestors. As a matter of fact, all our senses have been somewhat blunted because they immediately look for the sense, that is, they ask what it means, and not what it is. Such a blunting betrays itself, for instance, in the absolute dominion of the temperature of sounds. For ears, which still make their finer distinctions between eyes and des, for instance, are now amongst the exceptions. In this respect, our ear has grown coarser, and then the ugly side of the world, the one originally hostile to the senses, has been conquered for music. Its power has been immensely widened, especially in the expression of the noble, the terrible, and the mysterious. Our music now gives utterance to things which had formerly no tongue. In the same way, certain painters have rendered the eye more intellectual and have gone far beyond that which was formerly called pleasure in color and form. Here, too, that side of the world originally considered as ugly has been conquered by the artistic intellect. What results from all this? The more capable of thought that eye and ear become, the more they approach the limit where they become senseless. The seed of pleasures moved into the brain. The organ of the senses themselves become dulled and weak. The symbolical takes more and more place of the actual, 
and thus we arrive at barbarism in this way as surely as in any other. In the meantime, we may say, the world is uglier than ever, but it represents a more beautiful world than has ever existed. But the more the amber scent of meaning is dispersed and evaporated, the rarer becomes those who perceive it, and the remainder halt at what is ugly and endeavor to enjoy it direct, an aim, however, which they never succeed in attaining. Thus, in Germany there is a twofold direction of musical development. Here a throng of 10,000 with even higher, finer demands, ever listening more and more for the it means, and there the immense countless mass which yearly grows more incapable of understanding what is important even in the form of sensual ugliness, and which therefore turns ever more willingly to what in music is ugly and foul in itself, that is, to the basely sensual. 218. A stone is more of a stone than formerly. As a general rule, we no longer understand architecture, at least by no means in the same way as we understand music. We have outgrown the symbolism of lines and figures, just as we are no longer accustomed to the sound effects of rhetoric, and have not absorbed this kind of mother's milk of culture since our first moment of life. Everything in a Greek or Christian building originally had a meaning, and referred to a higher order of things. This feeling of inexhaustible meaning enveloped the edifice like a mystic veil. Beauty was only a secondary consideration in the system, without in any way materially injuring the fundamental sentiment of the mysteriously exalted, the divinely and magically consecrated. At the most, beauty tempered horror, but this horror was everywhere presupposed. What is the beauty of a building now? The same thing as the beautiful face of a stupid woman, a kind of mask. 219. The Religious Source of the Newer Music Soulful music arose out of the Catholicism re-established after the Council of Trent, through Palestrina, who endowed the newly awakened, earnest, and deeply moved spirit with sound. Later on, in Bach, it appeared also in Protestantism. As far as this had been deepened by the Pietist and released from its originally dogmatic character, the supposition and necessary preparation for both origins is the familiarity with music, which existed during and before the Renaissance, namely, that learned occupation with music, which was really scientific pleasure in the masterpieces of harmony and voice training. On the other hand, the opera must have preceded it, wherein the layman made his protest against a music that had grown too learned and cold, and endeavored to re-endow polyhymnia with a soul. Without the change to that deeply religious sentiment, without the dying away of the inwardly moved temperament, music would have remained learned or operatic. The spirit of the Counter-Reformation is the spirit of modern music, for that pietism in box music is also a kind of Counter-Reformation. So deeply are we indebted to this religious life. Music was the Counter-Reformation in the field of art. To this belongs also the later painting of the Carsi and Caravaggi, perhaps also the Baroque style in any case more than the architecture of the Renaissance or of antiquity. And we might still ask, if our newer music could move stones, would it build them up into antique architecture? I very much doubt it. For that which predominates in this music, affections, pleasure and exalted, highly strained sentiments, the desire to be alive at any cost, the quick change of feeling, the strong relief effects of light and shade, the combination in the ecstatic and naive, all this has already reigned in the plastic arts and created new laws of style, but it was neither in the time of antiquity nor of the Renaissance. 220. The Beyond in Art It is not without deep pain that we acknowledge the fact that in their loftiest soarings, artists of all ages have exalted and divinely transfigured precisely those ideas which we now recognize as false. They are the glorifiers of humanity's religious and philosophical errors, and they could not have been this without belief in the absolute truth of these errors. But if the belief in such truth diminishes at all, if the rainbow colors at the furthest end of human knowledge and imagination fade, then this kind of art can never reflourish, for, like the Divina Commedia, Raphael's paintings, Michelangelo's frescoes, and Gothic cathedrals, they indicate not only a cosmic, but also metaphysical meaning in the work of art. Out of all this will grow a touching legend that such an art, and such an artistic faith, once existed. 221. Revolution in Poetry 
The strict limit which the French dramatists marked out with regard to unity of action, time and place, construction of style, verse and sentence, selection of words and ideas, was a school as important as that of counterpoint and fugue in the development of modern music or that of the Gorgiatic figures in Greek oratory. Such a restriction may appear absurd. Nevertheless, there is no means of getting out of naturalism except by confining ourselves at first to the strongest, perhaps most arbitrary, means. Thus we gradually learn to walk gracefully on the narrow paths that bridge giddy abysses, and acquire great suppleness of movement as a result, as the history of music proves to our living eyes. Here we see how, step by step, the fetters get looser, until at last they may appear to be altogether thrown off. This appearance is the highest achievement of a necessary development in art. In the art of modern poetry there existed no such fortunate, gradual emerging from self-imposed fetters. Lessing held up to scorn in Germany the French form, the only modern form of art, and pointed to Shakespeare. And thus the steadiness of that unfettering was lost, and a spring was made into naturalism, that is, back into the beginnings of art. From this Goethe endeavored to save himself, by always trying to limit himself anew in different ways. But even the most gifted only succeeds by continuously experimenting. If the thread of development has once been broken, it is to the unconsciously revered, if also repudiated, model of French tragedy that Schiller owes his comparative sureness of form, and he remained fairly independent of Lessing, whose dramatic attempts he is well known to have rejected. But after Voltaire, the French themselves suddenly lacked the great talents which would have led the development of tragedy out of constraint to that apparent freedom. Later on, they followed the German example and made a spring into a sort of Rousseau-like state of nature and experiments. It is only necessary to read Voltaire's Mahomet from time to time in order to perceive clearly what European culture has lost through that breaking down of tradition. Once for all, Voltaire was the last of the great dramatists who with Greek proportion controlled his manifold soul, equal even to the greatest storms of tragedy. He was able to do what no German could, because the French nature is much nearer akin to the Greek than is the German. He was also the last great writer who in the wielding of prose possessed the Greek ear. Greek artistic conscientiousness, and Greek simplicity and grace. He was, also, one of the last men able to combine in himself the greatest freedom of mind and an absolutely unrevolutionary way of thinking without being inconsistent and cowardly. Since that time, the modern spirit, with its restlessness and its hatred of moderation and restrictions, has obtained the mastery on all sides, let loose at first by the fever of revolution and then once more putting a bridle on itself when it became filled with fear and horror at itself. But it was the bridle of rigid logic, no longer that of artistic moderation. It is true that through that unfettering for a time we are able to enjoy the poetry of all nations. Everything that has sprung up in hidden places, original, wild, wonderfully beautiful and gigantically irregular, from folk songs up to the great barbarian, Shakespeare. We taste the joys of local color and costume, hitherto unknown to all artistic nations, we make liberal use of the barbaric advantages of our time, which Goethe accentuated against Schiller in order to place the formulousness of his Faust in the most favorable light. But for how much longer? The encroaching flood of poetry of all styles and all nations must gradually sweep away that magic garden upon which a quiet and hidden growth would still have been possible. All poets must become experimenting imitators, daring copyists, however great their primary strength may be. Eventually, the public, which has lost the habit of seeing the actual artistic fact in the controlling of depicting power, in the organizing mastery over all art means, must come ever more and more to value power for power's sake, color for color's sake, idea for idea's sake, inspiration for inspiration's sake. Accordingly, it will not enjoy the elements and conditions of the work of art unless isolated, and finally will make the very natural demand that the artist must deliver it to them isolated. True, the senseless fetters of Franco-Greek art have been thrown off, but unconsciously we have grown accustomed to consider all fetters, all restrictions as senseless. And so art moves towards its liberation, but, in doing so, it touches, which is certainly highly edifying, Upon all the phases of its beginning, its childhood, its incompleteness, its sometime boldness and excesses, in perishing it interprets its origin and growth. One of the great ones, 
whose instinct may be relied on and whose theory lacked nothing but thirty years more of practice, Lord Byron once said, that with regard to poetry in general, the more he thought about it, the more convinced he was that one and all we are entirely on a wrong track, that we are following an inwardly false revolutionary system, and that either our own generation or the next will yet arrive at the same conviction. It is the same Lord Byron who said that he looked upon Shakespeare as the very worst model, although the most extraordinary poet. And does not Goethe's mature artistic insight in the second half of his life say practically the same thing? That insight by means of which he made such a bound in advance of whole generations that, generally speaking, it may be said that Goethe's influence has not yet begun, that his time has still to come. Just because his nature held him fast for a long time in the path of the poetical revolution, just because he drank to the dregs of whatsoever new sources, views, and expedients had been indirectly discovered through that breaking down of tradition, of all that had been unearthed from under the ruins of art, his later transformation and conversion carries so much weight. It shows that he felt the deepest longing to win back the traditions of art, and to give in fancy the ancient perfection and completeness to the abandoned ruins and colonnades of the temple with the imagination of the eye at least, should the strength of the arm be found too weak to build where such tremendous powers were needed even to destroy. Thus he lived in art as the remembrance of the true art. His poetry had become an aid to remembrance, to the understanding of old and long-departed ages of art. With respect to the strength of the new age, his demand could not be satisfied, but the pain this occasioned was amply balanced by the joy that they have been satisfied once, and that we ourselves can still participate in this satisfaction. Not individuals, but more or less ideal masks. No reality, but an allegorical generality. Topical characters, local colors toned down and rendered mythical almost to the point of invisibility. Contemporary feeling and the problems of contemporary society reduced to the simplest forms, stripped of their attractive, interesting pathological qualities, made ineffective in every other but the artistic sense. No new materials and characters, but the old, long-accustomed ones in constant new animation and transformation. That is art, as Goethe understood it later, as the Greeks and even the French practiced it. 222. What Remains of Art It is true that art has a much greater value in the case of certain metaphysical hypotheses. For instance, when the belief obtains that the character is unchangeable and that the essence of the world manifests itself continually in all character and action, thus the artist's work becomes the symbol of the eternally constant, while according to our views, the artist can only endow his picture with temporary value because man on the whole has developed and is mutable, and even the individual man has nothing fixed and constant. The same thing holds good with another metaphysical hypothesis. Assuming that our visible world were only a delusion, as metaphysicians declare, then art would come very near to the real world, for there would then be far too much similarity between the world of appearance and the dream world of the artist, and the remaining difference would place the meaning of art higher even than the meaning of nature, because art would represent the same forms, the types and models of nature. But these suppositions are false, and what position does art retain after this acknowledgement? Above all, for centuries it has taught us to look upon life in every shape with interest and pleasure, and to carry our feelings so far that at last we exclaim, Whatever it may be, life is good. This teaching of art, to take pleasure in existence and to regard human life as a piece of nature, without too vigorous movement, as an object of regular development, this teaching has grown into us. It reappears as an all-powerful need of knowledge. We could renounce art but we should not therewith forfeit the ability it has taught us, just as we have given up religion, but not the exalting and intensifying of temperament acquired through religion. As the plastic arts and music are the standards of that wealth of feeling really acquired and obtained through religion, so also, after a disappearance of art, the intensity and multiplicity of the joys of life which it had implanted in us would still demand satisfaction. The scientific man is the further development of the artistic man. 23. The Afterglow of Art Just as in old age we remember our youth and celebrate festivals of memory, so in a short time mankind will stand towards art. Its relation will be that of a touching memory of the joys of youth. Never, 
perhaps, in former ages was art dealt with so seriously and thoughtfully as now when it appears to be surrounded by the magic influence of death. We call to mind that Greek city in southern Italy, which once a year still celebrates its Greek feasts, amidst tears and mourning, that foreign barbarism triumphs ever more and more over the customs its people brought with them into the land. And never has Hellenism been so much appreciated. Nowhere has this golden nectar been drunk with so great delight as amongst these fast-disappearing Hellenes. The artist will soon come to be regarded as a splendid relic, and to him, as to a wonderful stranger on whose power and beauty depended the happiness of former ages, there will be paid such honor as is not often enjoyed by one of our race. The best in us is perhaps inherited from the sentiments of former times, to which it is hardly possible for us now to return by direct ways. The sun has already disappeared, but the heavens of our life are still glowing and illumined by it, although we can behold it no longer. End of Fourth Division Concerning the Soul of Artists and Authors Fifth Division, Part 1 of Human all too human a book for free spirits by frederick nietzsche translated by helen zimmern eighteen forty six to nineteen thirty four this librivox recording is in the public domain the signs of higher and lower culture part one two twenty four ennoblement through degeneration history teaches that a race of people is best preserved where the greater number hold one common spirit in consequence of the similarity of their accustomed and indisputable principles in consequence therefore of their common faith thus strength is afforded by good and thorough customs thus is learnt the subjection of the individual and strenuousness of character becomes a birth gift and afterwards is fostered as a habit the danger to these communities founded on individuals of strong and similar character is that gradually increasing stupidity through transmission which follows all stability like its shadow it is on the more unrestricted more uncertain and morally weaker individuals that depends the intellectual progress of such communities it is they who attempt all that is new and manifold numbers of these perish on account of their weakness without having achieved any specially visible effect but generally particularly when they have descendants they flare up and from time to time inflict a wound on the stable element of the community precisely in this sore and weakened place the community is inoculated with something new but its general strength must be great enough to absorb and assimilate this new thing into its blood deviating natures are of the utmost importance wherever there is to be progress every wholesale progress must be preceded by a partial weakening the strongest natures retain the type the weaker ones help it to develop something similar happens in the case of individuals a deterioration a mutilation even a vice and above all a physical or moral loss is seldom without its advantage for instance a sickly man in the midst of a warlike and restless race will perhaps have more chance of being alone and thereby growing quieter and wiser the one-eyed man will possess a stronger eye the blind man will have a deeper inward sight and will certainly have a keener sense of hearing in so far it appears to me that the famous struggle for existence is not the only point of view from which an explanation can be given of the progress or strengthening of an individual or a race rather must two different things converge firstly the multiplying of stable strength through mental binding in faith and common feeling secondly the possibility of attaining to higher aims through the fact that there are deviating natures 
and in consequence partial weakening and wounding of the stable strength it is precisely the weaker nature as the more delicate and free that makes all progress at all possible a people that is crumbling and weak in any one part but as a whole still strong and healthy is able to absorb the infection of what is new and incorporate it to its advantage the task of education in a single individual is this to plant him so firmly and surely that as a whole he can no longer be diverted from his path then however the educator must wound him or else make use of the wounds which fate inflicts and when pain and need have thus arisen something new and noble can be inoculated into the wounded places with regard to the state machiavelli says that the form of government is of very small importance although half-educated people think otherwise the great aim of statecraft should be duration which outweighs all else inasmuch as it is more valuable than liberty it is only with securely founded and guaranteed duration that continual development and ennobling inoculation are at all possible as a rule however authority the dangerous companion of all duration will rise in opposition to this two twenty five free thinker a relative term we call that man a free thinker who thinks otherwise than is expected of him in consideration of his origin surroundings position and office or by reason of the prevailing contemporary views he is the exception fettered minds are the rule these latter reproach him saying that his free principles either have their origin in a desire to be remarkable or else cause free actions to to be inferred that is to say actions which are not compatible with fettered morality sometimes it is also said that the cause of such and such free principles may be traced to mental perversity and extravagance but only malice speaks thus nor does it believe what it says but wishes thereby to do an injury for the free thinker usually bears the proof of his greater goodness and keenness of intellect written in his face so plainly that the fettered spirits understand it well enough but the two other derivations of free thought are honestly intended as a matter of fact many free thinkers are created in one or other of these ways for this reason however the tenets to which they attain in this manner might be truer and more reliable than those of the fettered spirits in the knowledge of truth what really matters is the possession of it not the impulse under which it was sought the way in which it was found if the free thinkers are right then the fettered spirits are wrong and it is a matter of indifference whether the former have reached truth through immorality or the latter hitherto retained hold of untruths through morality moreover it is not essential to the freethinker that he should hold more correct views but that he should have liberated himself from what was customary be it successfully or disastrously as a rule however he will have truth or at least the spirit of truth investigation on his side he demands reasons the others demand faith two twenty six the origin of faith the fettered spirit does not take up his position from conviction but from habit he is a christian for instance not because he had a comprehension of different creeds and could take his choice he is an englishman not because he decided for england but he found christianity and england ready-made and accepted them without any reason just as one who is born in a wine country becomes a wine drinker later on perhaps as he was a christian and an englishman he discovered a few reasons in favour of his habit these reasons may be upset but he is not therefore upset in his whole position for instance let a fettered spirit be obliged to bring forward his reasons against bigamy and then it will be seen whether his holy zeal in favour of monogamy is based upon reason or upon custom the adoption of guiding principles without reasons is called faith two twenty seven 
conclusions drawn from the consequences and traced back to reason and unreason all states and orders of society professions matrimony education law all these find strength and duration only in the faith which the fettered spirits repose in them that is in the absence of reasons or at least in the averting of inquiries as to reasons the restricted spirits do not willingly acknowledge this and feel that it is a pudendum christianity however which was very simple in its intellectual ideas remarked nothing of this pudendum required faith and nothing but faith and passionately repulsed the demand for reasons it pointed to the success of faith you will soon feel the advantages of faith it suggested and through faith shall ye be saved as an actual fact the state pursues the same course and every father brings up his son in the same way only believe this he says and you will soon feel the good it does this implies however that the truth of an opinion is proved by its personal usefulness the wholesomeness of a doctrine must be a guarantee for its intellectual surety and solidity it is exactly as if an accused person in a court of law were to say my counsel speaks the whole truth for only see what is the result of his speech i shall be acquitted because the fettered spirits retain their principles on account of their usefulness they suppose that the free spirit also seeks his own advantage in his views and only holds that to be true which is profitable to him but as he appears to find profitable just the contrary of that which his compatriots or equals find profitable these latter assume that his principles are dangerous to them they say or feel he must not be right for he is injurious to us two twenty eight the strong good character the restriction of views which habit has made instinct leads to what is called strength of character when any one acts from few but always from the same motives his actions acquire great energy if these actions accord with the principles of the fettered spirits they are recognized and they produce moreover in those who perform them the sensation of a good conscience few motives energetic action and a good conscience compose what is called strength of character the man of strong character lacks a knowledge of the many possibilities and directions of action his intellect is fettered and restricted because in a given case it shows him perhaps only two possibilities between these two he must now of necessity choose in accordance with his whole nature and he does this easily and quickly because he has not to choose between fifty possibilities the educating surroundings aim at fettering every individual by always placing before him the smallest number of possibilities the individual is always treated by his educators as if he were indeed something new but should become a duplicate if he makes his first appearance as something unknown unprecedented he must be turned into something known and precedented in a child the familiar manifestation of restriction is called a good character in placing itself on the side of the fettered spirits the child first discloses its awakening common feeling with this foundation of common sentiment he will eventually become useful to his state or rank two twenty nine the standards and values of the fettered spirits there are four species of things concerning which the restricted spirits say they are in the right firstly all things that last are right secondly all things that are not burdens to us are right thirdly all things that are advantageous for us are right fourthly all things for which we have made sacrifices are right the last sentence for instance explains why a war that was begun in opposition to popular feeling is carried on with enthusiasm directly a sacrifice has been made for it the free spirits who bring their case before the form of the fettered spirits must prove that free spirits always existed that free spiritism is therefore enduring that it will not become a burden and finally that on the whole they are an advantage to the fettered spirits it is because they cannot convince the restricted spirits on this last point that they profit nothing by having proved the first and second propositions two thirty 
esprit fort compared with him who has tradition on his side and requires no reasons for his actions the free spirit is always weak especially in action for he is acquainted with too many motives and points of view and has therefore an uncertain and unpractised hand what means exist of making him strong in spite of this so that he will at least manage to survive and will not perish ineffectually what is the source of the strong spirit esprit for this is especially the question as to the production of genius whence comes the energy the unbending strength the endurance with which the one in opposition to accepted ideas endeavours to obtain an entirely individual knowledge of the world two thirty one the rise of genius the ingenuity with which a prisoner seeks the means of freedom the most cold-blooded and patient employment of every smallest advantage can teach us of what tools nature sometimes makes use in order to produce genius a word which i beg will be understood without any mythological and religious flavour she nature begins it in a dungeon and excites to the utmost its desire to free itself or to give another picture some one who has completely lost his way in a wood but who with unusual energy strives to reach the open in one direction or another will sometimes discover a new path which nobody knew previously thus arise geniuses who are credited with originality it has already been said that mutilation crippling or the loss of some important organ is frequently the cause of the unusual development of another organ because this one has to fulfil its own and also another function this explains the source of many a brilliant talent these general remarks on the origin of genius may be applied to the special case the origin of the perfect free spirit two thirty two conjecture as to the origin of free spiritism just as the glaciers increase when in equatorial regions the sun shines upon the seas with greater force than hitherto so may a very strong and spreading free spiritism be a proof that somewhere or other the force of feeling has grown extraordinarily two thirty three the voice of history in general history appears to teach the following about the production of genius it ill-treats and torments mankind calls to the passions of envy hatred and rivalry drives them to desperation people against people throughout whole centuries then perhaps like a stray spark from the terrible energy thereby aroused there flames up suddenly the light of genius the will like a horse maddened by the rider's spur thereupon breaks out and leaps over into another domain he who could attain to a comprehension of the production of genius and desires to carry out practically the manner in which nature usually goes to work would have to be just as evil and regardless as nature itself but perhaps we have not heard rightly two thirty four the value of the middle of the road it is possible that the production of genius is reserved to a limited period of mankind's history for we must not expect from the future everything that very defined conditions were able to produce for instance not the astounding effects of religious feeling this has had its day and much that is very question mark good can never grow again because it could grow out of that alone there will never again be a horizon of life and culture that is bounded by religion perhaps even the type of the saint is only possible with that certain narrowness of intellect which apparently has completely disappeared and thus the greatest height of intelligence has perhaps been reserved for a single age it appeared and appears for we are still in that age when an extraordinary long accumulated energy of will concentrates itself as an exceptional case upon intellectual aims that height will no longer exist when this wildness and energy cease to be cultivated mankind probably approaches nearer to its actual aim in the middle of its road in the middle time of its existence than at the end it may be that powers with which for instance art is a condition die out altogether the pleasure in lying 
in the undefined the symbolical in intoxication in ecstasy might fall into disrepute for certainly when life is ordered in the perfect state the present will provide no more motive for poetry and it would only be those persons who had remained behind who would ask for poetical unreality these then would assuredly look longingly backwards to the times of the imperfect state of half barbaric society to our times two thirty five genius and the ideal state in conflict the socialists demand a comfortable life for the greatest possible number if the lasting house of this life of comfort the perfect state had really been attained then this life of comfort would have destroyed the ground out of which grow the great intellect and the mighty individual generally i mean powerful energy were this state reached mankind would have grown too weary to be still capable of producing genius must we not hence wish that life should retain its forcible character and that wild forces and energies should continue to be called forth afresh but warm and sympathetic hearts desire precisely the removal of that wild and forcible character and the warmest hearts we can imagine desire it the most passionately of all whilst all the time its passion derived its fire its warmth its very existence precisely from that wild and forcible character the warmest heart therefore desires the removal of its own foundation the destruction of itself that is it desires something illogical it is not intelligent the highest intelligence and the warmest heart cannot exist together in one person and the wise man who passes judgment upon life looks beyond goodness and only regards it as something which is not without value in the general summing up of life the wise man must oppose those digressive wishes of unintelligent goodness because he has an interest in the continuance of his type and in the eventual appearance of the highest intellect at least and in the eventual appearance of the highest intellect at least he will not advance the founding of the perfect state inasmuch as there is only room in it for wearied individuals christ on the contrary he whom we may consider to have had the warmest heart advanced the process of making man stupid placed himself on the side of the intellectually poor and retarded the production of the greatest intellect and this was consistent his opposite the man of perfect wisdom this may be safely prophesied will just as necessarily hinder the production of a christ the state is a wise arrangement for the protection of one individual against another if its ennobling is exaggerated the individual will at last be weakened by it even effaced thus the original purpose of the state will be most completely frustrated two thirty six the zones of culture it may be figuratively said that the ages of culture correspond to the zones of the various climates only that they lie one behind another and not beside each other like their geographical zones in comparison with the temperate zone of culture which it is our object to enter the past speaking generally gives the impression of a tropical climate violent contrasts sudden changes between day and night heat and colour splendour the reverence of all that was sudden mysterious terrible the rapidity with which storms broke everywhere that lavish abundance of the provisions of nature and opposed to this in our culture a clear but by no means bright sky pure but fairly unchanging air sharpness even cold at times thus the two zones are contrasts to each other when we see how in that former zone the most raging passions are suppressed and broken down with mysterious force by metaphysical representations we feel as if wild tigers were being crushed before our very eyes in the coils of mighty serpents our mental climate lacks such episodes our imagination is temperate even in dreams there does not happen to us what former people saw waking but should we not rejoice at this change even granted that artists are essentially spoiled by the disappearance of the tropical culture and find us non-artists a little too timid in so far artists are certainly right to deny progress for indeed it is doubtful whether the last three thousand years show an advance in the arts in the same way a metaphysical philosopher like schopenhauer would have no cause to acknowledge progress with a regard 
to metaphysical philosophy and religion if he glanced back over the last four thousand years for us however the existence even of the temperate zones of culture is progress two thirty seven renaissance and reformation the italian renaissance contained within itself all the positive forces to which we owe modern culture such were the liberation of thought the disregard of authorities the triumph of education over the darkness of tradition enthusiasm for science and the scientific past of mankind the unfettering of the individual an ardor for truthfulness and a dislike of delusion and mere effect which ardor blazed forth in an entire company of artistic characters who with the greatest moral purity required from themselves perfection in their works and nothing but perfection yes the renaissance had positive forces which have as yet never become so mighty again in our modern culture it was the golden age of the last thousand years in spite of all its blemishes and vices on the other hand the german reformation stands out as an energetic protest of antiquated spirits who were by no means tired of mediaeval views of life and who received the signs of its dissolution the extraordinary flatness and alienation of the religious life with deep dejection instead of with the rejoicing that would have been seemly with their northern strength and stiff neckedness they threw mankind back again brought about the counter-reformation that is a catholic christianity of self-defence with all the violences of a state of siege and delayed for two or three centuries the complete awakening and mastery of the sciences just as they probably made for ever impossible the complete intergrowth of the antique and the modern spirit the great task of the renaissance could not be brought to a termination this was prevented by the protest of the contemporary backward german spirit which for its salvation had had sufficient sense in the middle ages to cross the alps again and again it was the chance of an extraordinary constellation of politics that luther was preserved and that his protest gained strength for the emperor protected him in order to employ him as a weapon against the pope and in the same way he was secretly favoured by the pope in order to use the protestant princes as a counterweight against the emperor without this curious counterplay of intentions luther would have been burnt like huss and the morning sun of enlightenment would probably have risen somewhat earlier and with a splendour more beauteous than we can now imagine two thirty eight justice against the becoming god when the entire history of culture unfolds itself to our gaze as a confusion of evil and noble of true and false ideas and we feel almost seasick at the sight of these tumultuous waves we then understand what comfort resides in the conception of a becoming god this deity is unveiled ever more and more throughout the changes and fortunes of mankind it is not all blind mechanism a senseless and aimless confusion of forces the deification of the process of being is a metaphysical outlook seen as from a lighthouse overlooking the sea of history in which a far too historical generation of scholars found their comfort this must not arouse anger however erroneous the view may be only those who like schopenhauer deny development also feel none of the misery of this historical wave and therefore because they know nothing of that becoming god and the need of his supposition they should in justice withhold their scorn two thirty nine the fruits according to their seasons every better future that is desired for mankind is necessarily in many respects also a worse future for it is foolishness to suppose that a new higher grade of humanity will combine in itself all the good points of former grades and must produce for instance the highest form of art rather has every season its own advantages and charms which exclude those of the other seasons that which has grown out of religion and in its neighbourhood cannot grow again if this has been destroyed at the most straggling and belated offshoots may lead to deception on that point like the occasional outbreaks of remembrance of the old art a condition that probably betrays the feeling of loss and deprivation but which is no proof of the power from which a new art might be born two forty the increasing severity of the world the higher culture an individual attains the less field there is left for mockery and scorn 
voltaire thanked heaven from his heart for the invention of marriage and the church by which it had so well provided for our cheer but he and his time and before him the sixteenth century had exhausted their ridicule on this theme everything that is now made fun of on this theme is out of date and above all too cheap to tempt a purchaser causes are now inquired after ours is an age of seriousness who cares now to discern laughingly the difference between reality and pretentious sham between that which man is and that which he wishes to represent the feeling of this contrast has quite a different effect if we seek reasons the more thoroughly any one understands life the less he will mock though finally perhaps he will mock at the thoroughness of his understanding two forty one the genius of culture if any one wished to imagine a genius of culture what would it be like it handles as its tools falsehood force and thoughtless selfishness so surely that i could only be called an evil demoniacal being but its aims which are occasionally transparent are great and good it is a centaur half beast half man and in addition has angels wings upon its head two forty two the miracle education interest in education will acquire great strength only from the moment when belief in a god and his care is renounced just as the art of healing you only flourish when the belief in miracle cures ceased so far however there is universal belief in the miracle education out of the greatest disorder and confusion of aims and unfavourableness of conditions the most fertile and mighty men have been seen to grow could this happen naturally soon these cases will be more closely looked into more carefully examined but miracles will never be discovered in similar circumstances countless persons perish constantly the few saved have therefore usually grown stronger because they endured these bad conditions by virtue of an inexhaustible inborn strength and this strength they had also exercised and increased by fighting against these circumstances thus the miracle is explained an education that no longer believes in miracles must pay attention to three things first how much energy is inherited secondly by what means can new energy be aroused thirdly how can the individual be adapted to so many and manifold claims of culture without being disquieted and destroying his personality in short how can the individual be initiated into the counterpoint of private and public culture how can he lead the melody and at the same time accompany it two forty three the future of the physician there is now no profession which would admit of such an enhancement as that of the physician that is after the spiritual physicians the so-called pastors are no longer allowed to practise their conjuring tricks to public applause and a cultured person gets out of their way the highest mental development of a physician has not yet been reached even if he understands the best and newest methods is practised in them and knows how to draw those rapid conclusions from effects to causes for which the diagnostics are celebrated besides this he must possess a gift of eloquence that adapts itself to every individual and draws his heart out of his body a manliness the sight of which alone drives away all despondency the canker of all sick people the tact and softness of a diplomatist in negotiations between such as have need of joy for their recovery and such as for reasons of health must and can give joy the acuteness of a detective and an attorney to divine the secrets of a soul without betraying them in short a good physician now has need of all the artifices and artistic privileges of every other professional class thus equipped he is then ready to be a benefactor to the whole of society by increasing good works mental joys and fertility by preventing evil thoughts projects and villainies the evil source of which is so often the belly by the restoration of a mental and physical aristocracy as a maker and hinderer of marriages by judiciously checking all so-called soul torments and pricks of conscience thus from a medicine man he becomes a saviour and yet need work no miracle neither is he obliged to let himself be crucified two forty four in the neighbourhood of insanity 
the sum of sensations knowledge and experiences the whole burden of culture therefore has become so great that an overstraining of nerves and powers of thought is a common danger indeed the cultivated classes of european countries are throughout neurotic and almost every one of their great families is on the verge of insanity in one of their branches true health is now sought in every possible way but in the main a diminution of that tension of feeling of that oppressive burden of culture is needful which even though it might be bought at a heavy sacrifice would at least give us room for the great hope of a new renaissance to christianity to the philosophers poets and musicians we owe an abundance of deeply emotional sensations in order that these may not get beyond our control we must invoke the spirit of science which on the whole makes us somewhat colder and more sceptical and in particular cools the faith in final and absolute truths it is chiefly through christianity that it has grown so wild two forty five the bell founding of culture culture has been made like a bell within a covering of coarser commoner material falsehood violence the boundless extension of every individual eye of every separate people this was the covering is it time to take it off has the liquid set have the good and useful impulses the habits of the nobler nature become so certain and so general that they no longer require to lean on metaphysics and the errors of religion no longer have need of hardnesses and violence as powerful bonds between man and man people and people no sign from any god can any longer help us to answer this question our own insight must decide the earthly rule of man must be taken in hand by man himself his omniscience must watch over the further fate of culture with a sharp eye two forty six the cyclops of culture whoever has seen those furrowed basins which once contained glaciers will hardly deem it possible that a time will come when the same spot will be a valley of woods and meadows and streams it is the same in the history of mankind the wildest forces break the way destructively at first but their activity was nevertheless necessary in order that later on a milder civilization might build up its house these terrible energies that which is called evil are the cyclopic architects and road-makers of humanity two forty seven the circulation of humanity it is possible that all humanity is only a phase of development of a certain species of animal of limited duration men may have grown out of the ape and will return to the ape again without anybody taking an interest in the ending of this curious comedy just as with the decline of roman civilization and its most important cause the spread of christianity there was a general uglification of man within the roman empire so through the eventual decline of general culture there might result a far greater uglification and finally an animalizing of man till he reached the ape but just because we are able to face this prospect we shall perhaps be able to avert such an end two forty eight the consoling speech of a desperate advance our age gives the impression of an intermediate condition the old ways of regarding the world the old cultures still partially exist the new are not yet sure and customary and hence are without decision and consistency it appears as if everything would become chaotic as if the old were being lost the new worthless and ever becoming weaker but this is what the soldier feels who is learning to march for a time he is more uncertain and awkward because his muscles are moved sometimes according to the old system and sometimes according to the new and neither gains a decisive victory we waver but it is necessary not to lose courage and give up what we have newly gained moreover we cannot go back to the old we have burnt our boats there remains nothing but to be brave whatever happens march ahead only get forward perhaps our behaviour looks like progress but if not then the words of frederick the great may also be applied to us and indeed as a consolation ah mon cher souce vous ne connaissez pas assez cette phrase maudite à laquelle nous appartenons two forty nine suffering from past culture whoever has solved the problem of culture suffers from a feeling similar to that of one who has inherited unjustly gotten riches or of a prince who reigns thanks to the violence of his ancestors he thinks of their origin with grief and is often ashamed often irritable 
the whole sum of strength joy vigor which he devotes to his possessions is often balanced by a deep weariness he cannot forget their origin he looks despondingly at the future he knows well that his successors will suffer from the past as he does two fifty manners good manners disappear in proportion as the influence of a court and an exclusive aristocracy lessens this decrease can be plainly observed from decade to decade by those who have an eye for public behaviour which grows visibly more vulgar no one any longer knows how to court and flatter intelligently hence arises the ludicrous fact that in cases where we must render actual homage to a great statesman or artist for instance the words of deepest feeling of simple peasant-like honesty have to be borrowed owing to the embarrassment resulting from the lack of grace and wit thus the public ceremonious meeting of men appears ever more clumsy but more full of feeling and honesty without really being so but must there always be a decline in manners it appears to me rather that manners take a deep curve and that we are approaching their lowest point when society has become sure of its intentions and principles so that they have a moulding effect the manners we have learnt from former moulding conditions are now inherited and always more weakly learnt there will then be company manners gestures and social expressions which must appear as necessary and simply natural because they are intentions and principles the better division of time and work the gymnastic exercise transformed into the accompaniment of all beautiful leisure increased and severe meditation which brings wisdom and suppleness even to the body will bring all this in its train here indeed we might think with a smile of our scholars and consider whether as a matter of fact they who wish to be regarded as the forerunners of that new culture are distinguished by their better manners this is hardly the case although their spirit may be willing enough their flesh is weak the past of culture is still too powerful in their muscles they still stand in a fettered position and are half worldly priests and half dependent educators of the upper classes and besides this they have been rendered crippled and lifeless by the pedantry of science and by antiquated spiritless methods in any case therefore they are physically and often three-fourths mentally still the courtiers of an old even antiquated culture and as such are themselves antiquated the new spirit that occasionally inhabits these old dwellings often serves only to make them more uncertain and frightened in them there dwell the ghosts of the past as well as the ghosts of the future what wonder if they do not wear the best expression or show the most pleasing behaviour two fifty one the future of science to him who works and seeks in her science gives much pleasure to him who learns her facts very little but as all important truths of science must gradually become commonplace and everyday matters even this small amount of pleasure ceases just as we have long ceased to take pleasure in learning the admirable multiplication table nor if science goes on giving less pleasure in herself and always takes more pleasure in throwing suspicion on the constellations of metaphysics religion and art that greatest of all sources of pleasure to which mankind owes almost its whole humanity becomes impoverished therefore a higher culture must give man a double brain two brain chambers so to speak one to feel science and the other to feel non-science which can lie side by side without confusion divisible exclusive this is a necessity of health in one part lies the source of strength in the other lies the regulator it must be heated with illusions one-sidednesses passions and the malicious and dangerous consequences of overheating must be averted by the help of conscious science if this necessity of the higher culture is not satisfied the further course of human development can almost certainly be foretold the interest in what is true ceases as it guarantees less pleasure illusion error and imagination reconquer step by step the ancient territory because they are united to pleasure the ruin of science the relapse into barbarism is the next result mankind must begin to weave its web afresh after having like penelope destroyed it during the night but who will assure us that it will always find the necessary strength for this two fifty two the pleasure in discernment why is discernment that essence of the searcher and the philosopher connected with pleasure firstly and above all because thereby we become conscious of our strength for the same reason that gymnastic exercises even without spectators are enjoyable secondly because in the course of knowledge we surpass older ideas and their representatives and become or believe ourselves to be conquerors thirdly because even a very little new knowledge exalts us above every one 
it makes us feel we are the only ones who know the subject aright these are the three most important reasons of the pleasure but there are many others according to the nature of the discerner a not inconsiderable index of such is given where no one would look for it in a passage of my paranetic work on schopenhauer with the arrangement of which every experienced servant of knowledge may be satisfied even though he might wish to dispense with the ironical touch that seems to pervade those pages for if it be true that for the making of a scholar a number of very human impulses and desires must be thrown together that the scholar is indeed a very noble but not a pure metal and consists of a confused blending of very different impulses and attractions the same thing may be said equally of the making and nature of the artist the philosopher and the moral genius and whatever glorified great names there may be in that list everything human deserves ironical consideration with respect to its origin therefore irony is so superfluous in the world two fifty three fidelity is a proof of validity it is a perfect sign of a sound theory if during forty years its originator does not mistrust it but i maintain that there has never yet been a philosopher who has not eventually deprecated the philosophy of his youth perhaps however he has not spoken publicly of this change of opinion for reasons of ambition or what is more probable in noble natures out of delicate consideration for his adherents two fifty four the increase of what is interesting in the course of higher education everything becomes interesting to man he knows how to find the instructive side of a thing quickly and to put his finger on the place where it can fill up a gap in his ideas or where it may verify a thought through this boredom disappears more and more and so does excessive excitability of temperament finally he moves among men like a botanist among plants and looks upon himself as a phenomenon which only greatly excites his discerning instinct two fifty five the superstition of the simultaneous simultaneous things hold together it is said a relative dies far away and at the same time we dream about him consequently but countless relatives die and we do not dream about them it is like shipwrecked people who make vows afterwards in the temples we do not see the votive tablets of those who perish a man dies and owl hoots a clock stops all at one hour of the night must there not be some connection such an intimacy with nature as this supposition implies is flattering to mankind this species of superstition is found again in a refined form in historians and delineators of culture who usually have a kind of hydrophobic horror of all that senseless mixture in which individual and national life is so rich end of fifth division part one fifth division of human all too human a book for free spirits by frederick nietzsche translated by helen zimmern this librivox recording is in the public domain fifth division the signs of higher and lower culture part two two fifty six action and not knowledge exercised by science the value of strictly pursuing science for a time does not lie precisely in its results for these in proportion to the ocean of what is worth knowing are but an infinitesimally small drop but it gives an additional energy decisiveness and toughness of endurance it teaches how to attain an aim suitably in so far it is very valuable with a view to all that is done later on to have once been a scientific man two fifty seven the youthful charm of science the search for truth still retains the charm of being in strong contrast to grey and now tiresome error but this charm is gradually disappearing it is true we still live in the youthful age of science and are accustomed to follow truth as a lovely girl but how will it be when one day she becomes an elderly ill-tempered-looking woman in almost all sciences the fundamental knowledge is either found in earliest times or is still being sought what a different attraction this exerts compared to that time when everything essential has been found and there only remains for the seeker a scanty gleaning which sensation may be learnt in several historical disciplines two fifty eight the statue of humanity the genius of culture fares as did cellini 
when his statue of perseus was being cast the molten mass threatened to run short but it had to suffice so he flung in his plates and dishes and whatever else his hands fell upon in the same way genius flings in errors vices hopes ravings and other things of baser as well as of nobler metal for the statue of humanity must emerge and be finished what does it matter if commoner material is used here and there two fifty nine a male culture the greek culture of the classic age is a male culture as far as women are concerned pericles expresses everything in the funeral speech they are best when they are as little spoken of as possible amongst men the erotic relation of men to youths was the necessary and sole preparation to a degree unattainable to our comprehension of all manly education pretty much as for a long time all higher education of women was only attainable through love and marriage all idealism of the strength of the greek nature threw itself into that relation and it is probable that never since have young men been treated so attentively so lovingly so entirely with a view to their welfare whereas as in the fifth and sixth centuries b c according to the beautiful saying of hurldrlin den liebend gibt der sterblicke vom besten the higher the light in which this relation was regarded the lower sank intercourse with woman nothing else was taken into consideration than the production of children and lust there was no intellectual intercourse not even real love-making if it be further remembered that women were even excluded from contests and spectacles of every description there only remained the religious cults as their sole higher occupation for although in the tragedies electra and antigone were represented this was only tolerated in art but not liked in real life just as now we cannot endure anything pathetic in life but like it in art the women had no other mission than to produce beautiful strong bodies in which the father's character lived on as unbrokenly as possible and therewith to counteract the increasing nerve tension of such a highly developed culture this kept the greek culture young for a relatively long time for in the greek mothers the greek genius always returned to nature two sixty the prejudice in favour of greatness it is clear that men overvalue everything great and prominent this arises from the conscious or unconscious idea that they deem it very useful when one person throws all his strength into one thing and makes himself into a monstrous organ assuredly an equal development of all his powers is more useful and happier for man for every talent is a vampire which sucks blood and strength from other powers and an exaggerated production can drive the most gifted almost to madness within the circle of the arts too extreme natures excite far too much attention but a much lower culture is necessary to be captivated by them men submit from habit to everything that seeks power two sixty one the tyrants of the mind it is only where the ray of myth falls that the life of the greeks shines otherwise it is gloomy the greek philosophers are now robbing themselves of this myth is it not as if they wished to quit the sunshine for shadow and gloom yet no plant avoids the light and as a matter of fact those philosophers were only seeking a brighter sun the myth was not pure enough not shining enough for them they found this light in their knowledge in that which each of them called his truth but in those times knowledge shone with a greater glory it was still young and knew but little of all the difficulties and dangers of its path it could still hope to reach in one single bound the central point of all being and from thence to solve the riddle of the world these philosophers had a firm belief in themselves and their truth and with it they overthrew all their neighbours and predecessors each one was a warlike violent tyrant the happiness in believing themselves the possessors of truth was perhaps never greater in the world but neither were the hardness the arrogance and the tyranny and evil of such a belief they were tyrants they were that therefore which every greek wanted to be and which every one was if he was able perhaps solon alone is an exception he tells in his poems how he disdained personal tyranny but he did it for love of his works of his law-giving and to be a lawgiver is a sublimated form of tyranny parmenides also made laws pythagoras and empedocles probably did the same 
anaximander founded a city plato was the incarnate wish to become the greatest philosophic lawgiver and founder of states he appears to have suffered terribly over the non-fulfilment of his nature and towards his end his soul was filled with the bitterest gall the more the greek philosophers lost in power the more they suffered inwardly from this bitterness and malice when the various sects fought for their truths in the street then first were the souls of these wooers of truth completely clogged through envy and spleen the tyrannical element then raged like poison within their bodies these many petty tyrants would have liked to devour each other there survived not a single spark of love and very little joy in their own knowledge the saying that tyrants are generally murdered and that their descendants are short-lived is true also of the tyrants of the mind their history is short and violent and their after-effects break off suddenly it may be said of almost all great hellenes that they appear to have come too late it was thus with aeschylus with pindar with demosthenes with thucydides one generation and then it is past for ever that is the stormy and dismal element in greek history we now it is true admire the gospel of the tortoises to think historically is almost the same thing now as if in all ages history had been made according to the theory the smallest possible amount in the longest possible time oh how quickly greek history runs on since then life has never been so extravagant so unbounded i cannot persuade myself that the history of the greeks followed that natural course for which it is so celebrated they were much too variously gifted to be gradual the orderly manner of the tortoise when running a race with achilles and that is called natural development the greeks went rapidly forward but equally rapidly downwards the movement of the whole machine is so intensified that a single stone thrown amid its wheels was sufficient to break it such a stone for instance was socrates the hitherto so wonderfully regular although certainly too rapid development of the philosophical science was destroyed in one night it is no idle question whether plato had he remained free from the socratic charm would not have discovered a still higher type of the philosophic man which type is for ever lost to us we look into the ages before him as into a sculptor's workshop of such types the fifth and sixth centuries b c seem to promise something more and higher even than they produced they stopped short at promising and announcing and yet there is hardly a greater loss than the loss of a type of a new hitherto undiscovered highest possibility of the philosophic life even of the older type the greater number are badly transmitted it seems to me that all philosophers from thales to democritus are remarkably difficult to recognize but whoever succeeds in imitating these figures walks amongst specimens of the mightiest and purest type this ability is certainly rare it was even absent in those later greeks who occupied themselves with the knowledge of the older philosophy aristotle especially hardly seems to have had eyes in his head when he stands before these great ones and thus it appears as if these splendid philosophers had lived in vain or as if they had only been intended to prepare the quarrelsome and talkative followers of the socratic schools as i have said here is a gap a break in development some great misfortune must have happened and the only statue which might have revealed the meaning and purpose of that great artistic training was either broken or unsuccessful what actually happened has remained for ever a secret of the workshop that which happened amongst the greeks namely that every great thinker who believed himself to be in possession of the absolute truth became a tyrant so that even the mental history of the greeks acquired that violent hasty and dangerous character shown by their political history this type of event was not therewith exhausted much that is similar has happened even in more modern times although gradually becoming rarer and now but seldom showing the pure naive conscience of the greek philosophers for on the whole opposition doctrines and scepticism now speak too powerfully too loudly the period of mental tyranny is past it is true that in the spheres of higher culture there must always be a supremacy but henceforth this supremacy lies in the hands of the oligarchs of the mind in spite of local and political separation they form a cohesive society whose members recognize and acknowledge each other whatever public opinion and the verdicts of review and newspaper writers who influence the masses may circulate in favor of or against them mental superiority which formerly divided and embittered nowadays generally unites 
how could the separate individuals assert themselves and swim through life on their own course against all currents if they did not see others like them living here and there under similar conditions and grasp their hands in the struggle as much against the ochlocratic character of the half mind and half culture as against the occasional attempts to establish a tyranny with the help of the masses oligarchs are necessary to each other they are each other's best joy they understand their signs but each is nevertheless free he fights and conquers in his place and perishes rather than submit two sixty two homer the greatest fact in greek culture remains this that homer became so early pan-hellenic all mental and human freedom to which the greeks attained is traceable to this fact at the same time it has actually been fatal to greek culture for homer levelled inasmuch as he centralized and dissolved the more serious instincts of independence from time to time there arose from the depths of hellenism an opposition to homer but he always remained victorious all great mental powers have an oppressing effect as well as a liberating one but it certainly makes a difference whether it is homer or the bible or science that tyrannizes over mankind two sixty three talents in such a highly developed humanity as the present each individual naturally has access to many talents each has an inborn talent but only in a few is that degree of toughness endurance and energy born and trained that he really becomes a talent becomes what he is that is that he discharges it in works and actions two sixty four the witty person either overvalued or undervalued unscientific but talented people value every mark of intelligence whether it be on a true or a false track above all they want the person with whom they have intercourse to entertain them with his wit to spur them on to inflame them to carry them away in seriousness and play and in any case to be a powerful amulet to protect them against boredom scientific natures on the other hand know that the gift of possessing all manner of notions should be strictly controlled by the scientific spirit it is not that which shines deludes and excites but the often insignificant truth that is the fruit which he knows how to shake down from the tree of knowledge like aristotle he is not permitted to make any distinction between the boars and the wits his daemon leads him through the desert as well as through tropical vegetation in order that he may only take pleasure in the really actual tangible truth in insignificant scholars this produces a general disdain and suspicion of cleverness and on the other hand clever people frequently have an aversion to science as have for instance almost all artists two sixty five cents in school school has no task more important than to teach strict thought cautious judgment and logical conclusions hence it must pay no attention to what hinders these operations such as religion for instance it can count on the fact that human vagueness custom and need will later on unstring the bow of all too severe thought but so long as its influence lasts it should enforce that which is the essential and distinguishing point in man sense and science the very highest power of man as goethe judges the great natural philosopher von baer thinks that the superiority of all europeans when compared to asiatics lies in the trained capability of giving reasons for that which they believe of which the latter are utterly incapable europe went to the school of logical and critical thought asia still fails to know how to distinguish between truth and fiction and is not conscious whether its convictions spring from individual observation and systematic thought or from imagination sense in the school has made europe what it is in the middle ages it was on the road to become once more a part and dependent of asia forfeiting therefore the scientific mind which it owed to the greeks two sixty six the undervalued effect of public school teaching the value of a public school is seldom sought in those things which are really learnt there and are carried away never to be lost but in those things which are learnt and which the pupil only acquires against his will in order to get rid of them again as soon as possible every educated person acknowledges that the reading of the classics as now practised 
is monstrous proceeding carried on before you people are ripe enough for it by teachers who with every word often by their appearance alone throw a mildew on a good author but therein lies the value generally unrecognized of these teachers who speak the abstract language of the higher culture which though dry and difficult to understand is yet a sort of higher gymnastics of the brain and there is value in the constant recurrence in their language of ideas artistic expressions methods and delusions which the young people hardly ever hear in the conversations of their relatives and in the street even if the pupils only hear their intellect is involuntarily trained to a scientific mode of regarding things it is not possible to emerge from this discipline entirely untouched by its abstract character and to remain a simple child of nature two sixty seven learning many languages the learning of many languages fills the memory with words instead of with facts and thoughts and this is a vessel which with every person can only contain a certain limited amount of contents therefore the learning of many languages is injurious inasmuch as it arouses a belief in possessing dexterity and as a matter of fact it lends a kind of delusive importance to social intercourse it is also indirectly injurious in that it opposes the acquirement of solid knowledge and the intention to win the respect of men in an honest way finally it is the axe which is laid to the root of a delicate sense of language in our mother tongue which thereby is incurably injured and destroyed the two nations which produce the greatest stylists the greeks and the french learn no foreign languages but as human intercourse must always grow more cosmopolitan and as for instance a good merchant in london must now be able to read and write eight languages the learning of many tongues has certainly become a necessary evil but which when finally carried to an extreme will compel mankind to find a remedy and in some far-off future there will be a new language used at first as a language of commerce then as a language of intellectual intercourse generally then for all as surely as some time or other there will be aviation why else should philology have studied the laws of languages for a whole century and have estimated the necessary the valuable and the successful portion of each separate language two sixty eight the war history of the individual in a single human life that passes through many styles of culture we find that struggle condense which would otherwise have been played out between two generations between father and son the closeness of the relationship sharpens this struggle because each party ruthlessly drags in the familiar inward nature of the other party and thus the struggle in the single individual becomes most embittered here every new phase disregards the earlier ones with cruel injustice and misunderstanding of their means and aims two sixty nine a quarter of an hour earlier a mark is found occasionally whose views are beyond his time but only to such an extent that he anticipates the common views of the next decade he possesses public opinion before it is public that is he has fallen into the arms of a view that deserves to be trivial a quarter of an hour sooner than other people but his fame is usually far noisier than the fame of those who are really great and prominent two seventy the art of reading every strong tendency is one-sided it approaches the aim of the straight line and like this is exclusive that is it does not touch many other aims as do weak parties and natures in their wave-like rolling to and fro it must also be forgiven to philologists that they are one-sided the restoration and keeping pure of texts besides their explanation carried on in common for hundreds of years has finally enabled the right methods to be found the whole of the middle ages was absolutely incapable of a strictly philological explanation that is of the simple desire to comprehend what an author says it was an achievement finding these methods let it not be undervalued through this all science first acquired continuity and steadiness so that the art of reading rightly which is called philology attained its summit two seventy one the art of reasoning the greatest advance that men have made lies in their acquisition of the art to reason rightly it is not so very natural as schopenhauer supposes when he says all are capable of reasoning but few of judging it is learnt late and has not yet attained supremacy false conclusion are the rule in older ages and the mythologies of all peoples their magic and their superstition their religious cult and their law are the inexhaustible sources 
of proof of this theory two seventy two phases of individual culture the strength and weakness of mental productiveness depend far less on inherited talents than on the accompanying amount of elasticity most educated young people of thirty turn round at this solstice of their lives and are afterwards disinclined for new mental turnings therefore for the salvation of a constantly increasing culture a new generation is immediately necessary which will not do very much either for in order to come up with the father's culture the son must exhaust almost all the inherited energy which the father himself possessed at that stage of life when his son was born with the little addition he gets further on for as here the road is being traversed for the second time progress is a little quicker in order to learn that which the father knew the son does not consume quite so much strength men of great elasticity like goethe for instance get through almost more than four generations in succession would be capable of but then they advance too quickly so that the rest of mankind only comes up with them in the next century and even then perhaps not completely because the exclusiveness of culture and the consecutiveness of development have been weakened by the frequent interruptions men catch up more quickly with the ordinary phases of intellectual culture which has been acquired in the course of history nowadays they begin to acquire culture as religiously inclined children and perhaps about their tenth year these sentiments attain to their highest point and are then changed into weakened forms pantheism whilst they draw near to science they entirely pass by god immortality and such like things but are overcome by the witchcraft of a metaphysical philosophy eventually they find even this unworthy of belief art on the contrary seems to vouchsafe more and more so that for a time metaphysics is metamorphosed and continues to exist either as a transition to art or as an artistically transfiguring temperament but the scientific sense grows more imperious and conducts man to natural sciences and history and particularly to the severest methods of knowledge whilst art has always a milder and less exacting meaning all this usually happens within the first thirty years of a man's life it is the recapitulation of a pensum for which humanity had laboured perhaps thirty thousand years two seventy three retrograded not left behind whoever in the present day still derives his development from religious sentiments and perhaps lives for some length of time afterwards in metaphysics and art has assuredly gone back a considerable distance and begins his race with other modern men under unfavourable conditions he apparently loses time and space but because he stays in those domains where ardour and energy are liberated and force flows continuously as a volcanic stream out of an inexhaustible source he goes forward all the more quickly as soon as he has freed himself at the right moment from those dominators his feet are winged his breast has learned quieter longer and more enduring breathing he has only retreated in order to have sufficient room to leap thus something terrible and threatening may lie in this retrograde movement two seventy four a portion of our ego as an artistic object it is a sign of superior culture consciously to retain and present a true picture of certain phases of development which common men live through almost thoughtlessly and then efface from the tablets of their souls this is a higher species of the painter's art which only the few understand for this it is necessary to isolate those phases artificially historical studies form the qualification for this painting for they constantly incite us in regard to a portion of history a people or a human life to imagine for ourselves a quite distinct horizon of thoughts a certain strength of feelings the prominence of this or the obscurity of that herein consists the historic sense that out of given instances we can quickly reconstruct such systems of thoughts and feelings just as we can mentally reconstruct a temple out of a few pillars and remains of walls accidentally left standing the next result is that we understand our fellow-men as belonging to distinct systems and representatives of different cultures that is as necessary but as changeable and again that we can separate portions of our own development and put them down independently two seventy five cynics and epicureans the cynic recognizes the connection between the multiplied and stronger pains of the more highly cultivated man and the abundance of requirements he comprehends therefore that the multitude of opinions about what is beautiful suitable seemly and pleasing must also produce very rich sources of enjoyment but also of displeasure 
in accordance with this view he educates himself backwards by giving up many of these opinions and withdrawing from certain demands of culture he thereby gains a feeling of freedom and strength and gradually when habit has made his manner of life endurable his sensations of displeasure are as a matter of fact rarer and weaker than those of cultivated people and approach those of the domestic animal moreover he experiences everything with the charm of contrast and he can also scold to his heart's content so that thereby he again rises high above the sensation range of the animal the epicurean has the same point of view as the cynic there is usually only a difference of temperament between them then the epicurean makes use of his higher culture to render himself independent of prevailing opinions he raises himself above them whilst the cynic only remains negative he walks as it were in wind protected well sheltered half dark paths whilst over him in the wind the tops of the trees rustle and show him how violently agitated is the world out there the cynic on the contrary goes as it were naked into the rushing of the wind and hardens himself to the point of insensibility two seventy six microcosm and macrocosm of culture the best discoveries about culture man makes within himself when he finds two heterogeneous powers ruling therein supposing some one were living as much in love for the plastic arts or for music as he was carried away by the spirit of science and that he were to regard it as impossible for him to end this contradiction by the destruction of one and complete liberation of the other power there would therefore remain nothing for him to do but to erect around himself such a large edifice of culture that those two powers might both dwell within it although at different ends whilst between them there dwelt reconciling intermediary powers with predominant strength to quell in case of need the rising conflict but such an edifice of culture in the single individual will bear a great resemblance to the culture of entire periods and will afford consecutive analogical teaching concerning it for wherever the great architecture of culture manifested itself it was its mission to compel opposing powers to agree by means of an overwhelming accumulation of other less unbearable powers without thereby oppressing and fettering them two seventy seven happiness and culture we are moved at the sight of our childhood's surroundings the arbour the church with its graves the pond and the wood all this we see again with pain we are seized with pity for ourselves for what have we not passed through since then and everything here is so silent so eternal only we are so changed so moved we even find a few human beings on whom time has sharpened his teeth no more than on an oak tree peasants fishermen woodmen they are unchanged emotion and self-pity at the sight of lower culture is the sign of higher culture from which the conclusion may be drawn that happiness has certainly not been increased by it whoever wishes to reap happiness and comfort in life should always avoid higher culture two seventy eight the simile of the dance it must now be regarded as a decisive sign of great culture if some one possesses sufficient strength and flexibility to be as pure and strict in discernment as in other moments to be capable of giving poetry religion and metaphysics a hundred paces start and then feeling their force and beauty such a position amid two such different demands is very difficult for science urges the absolute supremacy of its methods and if this insistence is not yielded to there arises the other danger of a weak wavering between different impulses meanwhile to cast a glance in simile at least on a solution of this difficulty it may be remembered that dancing is not the same as a dull reeling to and fro between different impulses high culture will resemble a bold dance wherefore as has been said there is need of much strength and suppleness two seventy nine of the relieving of life a primary way of lightening life is the idealization of all its occurrences and with the help of painting we should make it quite clear to ourselves what idealizing means the painter requires that the spectator should not observe too closely or too sharply he forces him back to a certain distance from whence to make his observations he is obliged to take for granted a fixed distance of the spectator from the picture he must even suppose an equally certain amount of sharpness of eye in his spectator in such things he must on no account waver every one therefore who desires to idealize his life must not look at it too closely and must always keep his gaze at a certain distance this was a trick that goethe for instance understood two eighty aggravation as relief and vice versa 
much that makes life more difficult in certain grades of mankind serves to lighten it in a higher grade because such people have become familiar with greater aggravations of life the contrary also happens for instance religion has a double face according to whether a man looks up to it to relieve him of his burden and need or looks down upon it as upon fetters laid on him to prevent him from soaring too high into the air two eighty one the higher culture is necessarily misunderstood he who has strung his instrument with only two strings like the scholars who besides the instinct of knowledge possess only an acquired religious instinct does not understand people who can play upon more strings it lies in the nature of the higher many stringed culture that it should always be falsely interpreted by the lower an example of this is when art appears as a disguised form of the religious people who are only religious understand even science as a searching after the religious sentiment just as deaf mutes do not know what music is unless it be visible movement two eighty two lamentation it is perhaps the advantages of our epoch that bring with them a backward movement and an occasional undervaluing of the vita contemplativa but it must be acknowledged that our time is poor in the matter of great moralists that pascal epictetus seneca and plutarch are now but little read that work and industry formerly in the following of the great goddess health sometimes appear to rage like a disease because time to think and tranquillity in thought are lacking we no longer ponder over different views but content ourselves with hating them with the enormous acceleration of life mind and eye grow accustomed to a partial and false sight and judgment and all people are like travellers whose only acquaintance with countries and nations is derived from the railway an independent and cautious attitude of knowledge is looked upon almost as a kind of madness the free spirit is brought into disrepute chiefly through scholars who miss their thoroughness and ant-like industry in his art of regarding things and would gladly banish him into one single corner of science while it has the different and higher mission of commanding the battalion rearguard of scientific and learned men from an isolated position and showing them the ways and aims of culture a song of lamentation such as that which has just been sung will probably have its own period and will cease of its own accord on a forcible return of the genius of meditation two eighty three the chief deficiency of active people active people are usually deficient in the higher activity i mean individual activity they are active as officials merchants scholars that is as a species but not as quite distinct separate and single individuals in this respect they are idle it is the misfortune of the active that their activity is almost always a little senseless for instance we must not ask the money-making banker the reason of his restless activity it is foolish the active roll as the stone rolls according to the stupidity of mechanics all mankind is divided as it was at all times and is still into slaves and freemen for whoever has not two-thirds of his day for himself is a slave be he otherwise whatever he likes statesman merchant official or scholar two eighty four in favour of the idol as a sign that the value of a contemplative life has decreased scholars now vie with active people in a sort of hurried enjoyment so that they appear to value this mode of enjoying more than that which really pertains to them and which as a matter of fact is a far greater enjoyment scholars are ashamed of otium but there is one noble thing about idleness and idlers if idleness is really the beginning of all vice it finds itself therefore at least in near neighbourhood of all the virtues the idle man is still a better man than the active you do not suppose that in speaking of idleness and idlers i am alluding to you you sluggards two eighty five modern unrest modern restlessness increases towards the west 
so that americans look upon the inhabitants of europe as altogether peace-loving and enjoying beings whilst in reality they swarm about like wasps and bees this restlessness is so great that the higher culture cannot mature its fruits it is as if the seasons followed each other too quickly for lack of rest our civilization is turning into a new barbarism at no period have the active that is the restless been of more importance one of the necessary corrections therefore which must be undertaken in the character of humanity is to strengthen the contemplative element on a large scale but every individual who is quiet and steady in heart and head already has the right to believe that he possesses not only a good temperament but also a generally useful virtue and even fulfils a higher mission by the preservation of this virtue two eighty six to what extent the active man is lazy i believe that every one must have his own opinion about everything concerning which opinions are possible because he himself is a peculiar unique thing which assumes towards all other things a new and never hitherto existing attitude but idleness which lies at the bottom of the active man's soul prevents him from drawing water out of his own well freedom of opinion is like health both are individual and no good general conception can be set up of either of them that which is necessary for the health of one individual is the cause of disease in another and many means and ways to the freedom of the spirit are for more highly developed natures the ways and means to confinement two eighty seven censor vitae alternations of love and hatred for a long period distinguish the inward condition of a man who desires to be free in his judgment of life he does not forget and bears everything a grudge for good and evil at last when the whole tablet of his soul is written full of experiences he will not hate and despise existence neither will he love it but will regard it sometimes with a joyful sometimes with a sorrowful eye and like nature will be now in a summer and now in an autumn mood two eighty eight the secondary result whoever earnestly desires to be free will therewith and without any compulsion lose all inclination for faults and vices he will also be more rarely overcome by anger and vexation his will desires nothing more urgently than to discern and the means to do this that is the permanent condition in which he is best able to discern two eighty nine the value of disease the man who is bedridden often perceives that he is usually ill of his position business or society and through them has lost all self-possession he gains this piece of knowledge from the idleness to which his illness condemns him two ninety sensitiveness in the country if there are no firm quiet lines on the horizon of his life a species of mountain and forest line man's inmost will itself becomes restless inattentive and covetous as is the nature of a dweller in towns he has no happiness and confers no happiness two ninety one prudence of the free spirits free thinkers those who live by knowledge alone will soon attain the supreme aim of their life and their ultimate position towards society and state and will gladly content themselves for instance with a small post or an income that is just sufficient to enable them to live for they will arrange to live in such a manner that a great change of outward prosperity even an overthrow of the political order would not cause an overthrow of their life to all these things they devote as little energy as possible in order that with their whole accumulated strength and with a long breath they may dive into the element of knowledge thus they can hope to dive deep and be able to see the bottom such a spirit seizes only the point of an event he does not care for things in the whole breadth and prolixity of their folds for he does not wish to entangle himself in them he too knows the weekdays of restraint of dependence and servitude 
but from time to time there must dawn for him a sunday of liberty otherwise he could not endure life it is probable that even his love for humanity will be prudent and somewhat short-winded for he desires to meddle with the world of inclinations and of blindness only as far as is necessary for the purpose of knowledge he must trust that the genius of justice will say something for its disciple and protege if accusing voices were to call him poor in love in his mode of life and thought there is a refined heroism which scorns to offer itself to the great mob reverence as its coarser brother does and passes quietly through and out of the world whatever labyrinths it traverses beneath whatever rocks its stream has occasionally worked its way when it reaches the light it goes clearly easily and almost noiselessly on its way and lets the sunshine strike down to its very bottom two ninety two forward and thus forward upon the path of wisdom with a firm step and good confidence however you may be situated serve yourself as a source of experience throw off the displeasure at your nature forgive yourself your own individuality for in any case you have in yourself a ladder with a hundred steps upon which you can mount to knowledge the age into which with grief you feel yourself thrown thinks you happy because of this good fortune it calls out to you that you shall still have experiences which men of later ages will perhaps be obliged to forego do not despise the fact of having been religious consider fully how you have had a genuine access to art can you not with the help of these experiences follow immense stretches of former humanity with a clearer understanding is not that ground which sometimes displeases you so greatly that ground of clouded thought precisely the one upon which have grown many of the most glorious fruits of older civilizations you must have loved religion and art as you loved mother and nurse otherwise you cannot be wise but you must be able to see beyond them to outgrow them if you remain under their ban you do not understand them you must also be familiar with history and that cautious play with the balances on the one hand on the other hand go back treading in the footsteps made by mankind in its great and painful journey through the desert of the past and you will learn most surely whither it is that all later humanity never can or may go again and inasmuch as you wish with all your strength to see in advance how the knots of the future are tied your own life acquires the value of an instrument and means of knowledge it is within your power to see that all you have experienced trials errors faults deceptions passions your love and your hope shall be merged wholly in your aim this aim is to become a necessary chain of culture links yourself and from this necessity to draw a conclusion as to the necessity in the progress of general culture when your sight has become strong enough to see to the bottom of the dark well of your nature and your knowledge it is possible that in its mirror you may also behold the far-away visions of future civilizations do you think that such a life with such an aim is too wearisome too empty of all that is agreeable then you have still to learn that no honey is sweeter than that of knowledge and that the overhanging clouds of trouble must be to you as an udder from which you shall draw milk for your refreshment and only when old age approaches will you rightly perceive how you listen to the voice of nature that nature which rules the whole world through pleasure the same life which has its zenith in age has also its zenith in wisdom in that mild sunshine of a constant mental joyfulness you meet them both old age and wisdom upon one ridge of life it was thus intended by nature then it is time and no cause for anger that the mists of death approach towards the light is your last movement a joyful cry of knowledge is your last sound end of fifth division part two division six of human all too human a book for free spirits by friedrich nietzsche translated by helen zimmern 
this librivox recording is in the public domain man in society two ninety three well meant dissimulation in intercourse with men a well-meant dissimulation is often necessary as if we did not see through the motives of their actions two ninety four copies we not unfrequently meet with copies of prominent persons and as in the case of pictures so also here the copies please more than the originals two ninety five the public speaker one may speak with the greatest appropriateness and yet so that everybody cries out to the contrary that is to say when one does not speak to everybody two ninety six want of confidence want of confidence among friends is a fault that cannot be censured without becoming incurable two ninety seven the art of giving to have to refuse a gift merely because it has not been offered in the right way provokes animosity against the giver two ninety eight the most dangerous partisan in every party there is one who by his far too dogmatic expression of the party principles excites defection among the others two ninety nine advisers of the sick whoever gives advice to a sick person acquires a feeling of superiority over him whether the advice be accepted or rejected hence proud and sensitive sick persons hate advisers more than their sickness three zero zero double nature of equality the rage for equality may so manifest itself that we seek either to draw all others down to ourselves by belittling disregarding and tripping up or ourselves and all others upwards by recognition assistance and congratulation three o one against embarrassment the best way to relieve and calm very embarrassed people is to give them decided praise three o two preference for certain virtues we set no special value on the possession of a virtue until we perceive that it is entirely lacking in our adversary three o three why we contradict we often contradict an opinion when it is really only the tone in which it is expressed that is unsympathetic to us three o four confidence and intimacy whoever proposes to command the intimacy of a person is usually uncertain of possessing his confidence whoever is sure of a person's confidence attaches little value to intimacy with him three o five the equilibrium of friendship the right equilibrium of friendship in our relation to other men is sometimes restored when we put a few grains of wrong on our side of the scales three o six the most dangerous physicians the most dangerous physicians are those who like born actors imitate the born physician with the perfect art of imposture three o seven when paradoxes are permissible in order to interest clever persons in a theory it is sometimes only necessary to put it before them in the form of a prodigious paradox three o eight how courageous people are won over courageous people are persuaded to a course of action by representing it as more dangerous than it really is three o nine courtesies we regard the courtesies show us by unpopular persons as offences three ten keeping people waiting a sure way of exasperating people and of putting bad thoughts into their heads is to keep them waiting long that makes them immoral three eleven against the confidential persons who give us their full confidence think they have thereby a right to ours that is a mistake people acquire no rights through gifts three twelve a mode of settlement it often suffices to give a person whom we have injured 
an opportunity to make a joke about us to give him personal satisfaction and even to make him favourably disposed to us three thirteen the vanity of the tongue whether man conceals his bad qualities and vices or frankly acknowledges them his vanity in either case seeks its advantage thereby only let it be observed how nicely he distinguishes those from whom he conceals such qualities from those with whom he is frank and honest three fourteen considerate to have no wish to offend or injure any one may as well be the sign of a just as of a timid nature three fifteen requisite for disputation he who cannot put his thoughts on ice should not enter into the heat of dispute three sixteen intercourse and pretension we forget our pretensions when we are always conscious of being amongst meritorious people being alone implants presumption in us the young are pretentious for they associate with their equals who are all ciphers but would fain have a great significance three seventeen motives of an attack one does not attack a person merely to hurt and conquer him but perhaps merely to become conscious of one's own strength three eighteen flattery persons who try by means of flattery to put us off our guard in intercourse with them employ a dangerous expedient like a sleeping draught which when it does not send the patient to sleep keeps him all the wider awake three nineteen a good letter writer a person who does not write books thinks much and lives in unsatisfying society will usually be a good letter writer three twenty the ugliest of all it may be doubted whether a person who has travelled much has found anywhere in the world uglier places than those to be met with in the human face three twenty one the sympathetic ones sympathetic natures ever ready to help in misfortune are seldom those that participate in joy in the happiness of others they have nothing to occupy them they are superfluous they do not feel themselves in possession of their superiority and hence readily show their displeasure three twenty two the relatives of a suicide the relatives of a suicide take it in ill part that he did not remain alive out of consideration for their reputation three twenty three ingratitude foreseen he who makes a large gift gets no gratitude for the recipient is already overburdened by the acceptance of the gift three twenty four in dull society nobody thanks a witty man for politeness when he puts himself on a par with a society in which it would not be polite to show one's wit three twenty five the presence of witnesses we are doubly willing to jump into the water after some one who has fallen in if there are people present who have not the courage to do so three twenty six being silent for both parties in a controversy the most disagreeable way of retaliating is to be vexed and silent for the aggressor usually regards the silence as a sign of contempt three twenty seven friends secrets few people will not expose the private affairs of their friends when at a loss for a subject of conversation three twenty eight humanity the humanity of intellectual celebrities consists in courteously submitting to unfairness in intercourse with those who are not celebrated three twenty nine the embarrassed people who do not feel sure of themselves in society seize every opportunity of publicly showing their superiority to close friends for instance by teasing them three thirty thanks a refined nature is vexed by knowing that someone owes it thanks a coarse nature by knowing that it owes thanks to someone three thirty one a sign of estrangement the surest sign of the estrangement of the opinions of two persons is when they both say something ironical to each other and neither of them feels the irony 
three thirty two presumption in connection with merit presumption in connection with merit offends us even more than presumption in persons devoid of merit for merit in itself offends us three thirty three danger in the voice in conversation we are sometimes confused by the tone of our own voice and misled to make assertions that do not at all correspond to our opinions three thirty four in conversation whether in conversation with others we mostly agree or mostly disagree with them is a matter of habit there is sense in both cases three thirty five fear of our neighbour we are afraid of the animosity of our neighbour because we are apprehensive that he may thereby discover our secrets three thirty six distinguishing by blaming highly respected persons distribute even their blame in such fashion that they try to distinguish us therewith it is intended to remind us of their serious interest in us we misunderstand them entirely when we take their blame literally and protest against it we thereby offend them and estrange ourselves from them three thirty seven indignation at the good will of others we are mistaken as to the extent to which we think we are hated or feared because though we ourselves know very well the extent of our divergence from a person tendency or party those others know us only superficially and can therefore only hate us superficially we often meet with good will which is inexplicable to us but when we comprehend it it shocks us because it shows that we are not considered with sufficient seriousness or importance three thirty eight thwarting vanities when two persons meet whose vanity is equally great they have afterwards a bad impression of each other because each has been so occupied with the impression he wished to produce on the other that the other has made no impression upon him at last it becomes clear to them both that their efforts have been in vain and each puts the blame on the other three thirty nine improper behaviour as a good sign a superior mind takes pleasure in the tactlessness pretentiousness and even hostility of ambitious youths it is the vicious habit of fiery horses which have not yet carried a rider but in a short time will be so proud to carry one three forty when it is advisable to suffer wrong it is well to put up with accusations without refutation even when they injure us when the accuser would see a still greater fault on our part if we contradicted and perhaps even refuted him in this way certainly a person may always be wronged and always have right on his side and may eventually with the best conscience in the world become the most intolerable tyrant and tormentor and what happens in the individual may also take place in whole classes of society three forty one too little honoured very conceited persons who have received less consideration than they expected attempt for a long time to deceive themselves and others with regard to it and become subtle psychologists in order to make out that they have been amply honoured should they not attain their aim should the veil of deception be torn they give way to all the greater fury three forty two primitive conditions re-echoing in speech by the manner in which people make assertions in their intercourse we often recognize an echo of the times when they were more conversant with weapons than anything else sometimes they handle their assertions like sharpshooters using their arms sometimes we think we hear the whiz and clash of swords and with some men an assertion crashes down like a stout cudgel women on the contrary speak like beings who for thousands of years have sat at the loom plied the needle or played the child with children three forty three the narrator he who gives an account of something readily betrays whether it is because the fact interests him or because he wishes to excite interest by the narration in the latter case he will exaggerate employ superlatives and such like he then does not usually tell his story so well because he does not think so much about his subject as about himself three forty four the reciter he who recites dramatic works makes discoveries about his own character he finds his voice more natural in certain moods and scenes than in others say in the pathetic or in the scurrilous 
while in ordinary life perhaps he has not had the opportunity to exhibit pathos or scurrility three forty five a comedy scene in real life some one conceives an ingenious idea on a theme in order to express it in society now in a comedy we should hear and see how he sets all sail for that point and tries to land the company at the place where he can make his remark how he continuously pushes the conversation towards the one goal sometimes losing the way finding it again and finally arriving at the moment he is almost breathless and then one of the company takes the remark itself out of his mouth what will he do oppose his own opinion three forty six unintentionally discourteous when a person treats another with unintentional discourtesy for instance not greeting him because not recognizing him he is vexed by it although he cannot reproach his own sentiments he is hurt by the bad opinion which he has produced in the other person or fears the consequences of his bad humour or is pained by the thought of having injured him vanity fear or pity may therefore be aroused perhaps all three together three forty seven a masterpiece of treachery to express a tantalizing distrust of a fellow-conspirator lest he should betray one and this at the very moment when one is practising treachery oneself is a masterpiece of wickedness because it absorbs the other's attention and compels him for a time to act very unsuspiciously and openly so that the real traitor has thus acquired a free hand three forty eight to injure and to be injured it is far pleasanter to injure and afterwards beg for forgiveness than to be injured and grant forgiveness he who does the former gives evidence of power and afterwards of kindness of character the person injured however if he does not wish to be considered inhuman must forgive his enjoyment of the other's humiliation is insignificant on account of this constraint three forty nine in a dispute when we contradict another's opinion and at the same time develop our own the constant consideration of the other opinion usually disturbs the natural attitude of our own which appears more intentional more distinct and perhaps somewhat exaggerated three fifty an artifice he who wants to get another to do something difficult must on no account treat the matter as a problem but must set forth his plan plainly as the only one possible and when the adversary's eye betrays objection and opposition he must understand how to break off quickly and allow him no time to put in a word three fifty one pricks of conscience after social gatherings why does our conscience prick us after ordinary social gatherings because we have treated serious things lightly because in talking of persons we have not spoken of quite justly or have been silent when we should have spoken because sometimes we have not jumped up and run away in short because we have behaved in society as if we belonged to it three fifty two we are misjudged he who always listens to hear how he is judged is always vexed for we are misjudged even by those who are nearest to us who know us best even good friends sometimes vent their ill-humour in a spiteful word and would they be our friends if they knew us rightly the judgments of the indifferent wound us deeply because they sound so impartial so objective almost but when we see that some one hostile to us knows us in a concealed point as well as we know ourselves how great is then our vexation three fifty three the tyranny of the portrait artists and statesmen who out of particular features quickly construct the whole picture of a man or an event are mostly unjust in demanding that the event or person should afterwards be actually as they have painted it they demand straightway that a man should be just as gifted cunning and unjust as he is in their representation of him three fifty four relatives as the best friends the greeks who knew so well what a friend was they alone of all peoples have a profound and largely philosophical discussion of friendship so that it is by them firstly and as yet lastly that the problem of the friend has been recognized as worthy of solution these same greeks have designated relatives by an expression which is the superlative of the word friend this is inexplicable to me three fifty five misunderstood honesty when any one quotes himself in conversation i then said i am accustomed to say it gives the impression of presumption whereas it often proceeds from quite an opposite source or at least from honesty which does not wish to deck and adorn the present moment with wit which belongs to an earlier moment 
three fifty six the parasite it denotes entire absence of a noble disposition when a person prefers to live in dependence at the expense of others usually with a secret bitterness against them in order only that he may not be obliged to work such a disposition is far more frequent in women than in men also far more pardonable for historical reasons three fifty seven on the altar of reconciliation there are circumstances under which one can only gain a point from a person by wounding him and becoming hostile the feeling of having a foe torments him so much that he gladly seizes the first indication of a milder disposition to effect a reconciliation and offers on the altar of this reconciliation what was formerly of such importance to him that he would not give it up at any price three fifty eight presumption in demanding pity there are people who when they have been in a rage and have insulted others demand firstly that it shall all be taken in good part and secondly that they shall be pitied because they are subject to such violent paroxysms so far does human presumption extend three fifty nine bait every man has his price that is not true but perhaps every one can be found a bait of one kind or other at which he will snap thus in order to gain some supporters for a cause it is only necessary to give it the glamour of being philanthropic noble charitable and self-denying and to what cause could this glamour not be given it is the sweet meat and dainty of their soul others have different ones three sixty the attitude in praising when good friends praise a gifted person he often appears to be delighted with them out of politeness and good will but in reality he feels indifferent his real nature is quite unmoved towards them and will not budge a step on that account out of the sun or shade in which it lies but people wish to please by praise and it would grieve them if one did not rejoice when they praise a person three sixty one the experience of socrates if one has become a master in one thing one has generally remained precisely thereby a complete dunce in most other things but one forms the very reverse opinion as was already experienced by socrates this is the annoyance which makes association with masters disagreeable three sixty two a means of defence in warring against stupidity the most just and gentle of men at last become brutal they are thereby perhaps taking the proper course for defence for the most appropriate argument for a stupid brain is the clenched fist but because as has been said their character is just and gentle they suffer more by this means of protection than they injure their opponents by it three sixty three curiosity if curiosity did not exist very little would be done for the good of our neighbour but curiosity creeps into the houses of the unfortunate and the needy under the name of duty or of pity perhaps there is a good deal of curiosity even in the much vaunted maternal love three sixty four disappointment in society one man wishes to be interesting for his opinions another for his likes and dislikes a third for his acquaintances and a fourth for his solitariness and they all meet with disappointment for he before whom the play is performed thinks himself the only play that is to be taken into account three sixty five the duel it may be said in favour of duels and all affairs of honour that if a man has such susceptible feelings that he does not care to live when so-and-so says or thinks this or that about him he has a right to make it a question of the death of the one or the other with regard to the fact that he is so susceptible it is not at all to be remonstrated with in that matter we are the heirs of the past of its greatness as well as of its exaggerations without which no greatness ever existed so when there exists a code of honour which lets blood stand in place of death so that the mind is relieved after a regular duel it is a great blessing because otherwise many human lives would be in danger such an institution moreover teaches men to be cautious in their utterances and makes intercourse with them possible three sixty six nobleness and gratitude a noble soul will be pleased to owe gratitude and will not anxiously avoid opportunities of coming under obligation it will also be moderate afterwards in the expression of its gratitude baser souls on the other hand are unwilling to be under any obligation or are afterwards immoderate in their expressions of thanks and altogether too devoted the latter is moreover also the case with persons of mean origin or depressed circumstances to show them a favour seems to them a miracle of grace three sixty seven occasions of eloquence in order to talk well one man needs a person who is decidedly and avowedly his superior to talk to while another can only find absolute freedom of speech and happy turns of eloquence before one who is his inferior in both cases the cause is the same each of them talks well only when he talks sans genre 
the one because in the presence of something higher he does not feel the impulse of rivalry and competition the other because he also lacks the same impulse in the presence of something lower now there is quite another type of men who talk well only when debating with the intention of conquering which of the two types is the more aspiring the one that talks well from excited ambition or the one that talks badly or not at all from precisely the same motive three sixty eight the talent for friendship two types are distinguished amongst people who have a special faculty for friendship the one is ever on the ascent and for every phase of his development he finds a friend exactly suited to him the series of friends which he thus acquires is seldom a consistent one and is sometimes at variance and in contradiction entirely in accordance with the fact that the later phases of his development neutralize or prejudice the earlier phases such a man may jestingly be called a ladder the other type is represented by him who exercises an attractive influence on very different characters and endowments so that he wins a whole circle of friends these however are thereby brought voluntarily into friendly relations with one another in spite of all differences such a man may be called a circle for this homogeneousness of such different temperaments and natures must somehow be typified in him furthermore the faculty for having good friends is greater in many people than the faculty for being a good friend three sixty nine tactics in conversation after a conversation with a person one is best pleased with him when one has had an opportunity of exhibiting one's intelligence and amiability in all its glory shrewd people who wish to impress a person favorably make use of this circumstance they provide him with the best opportunities for making a good joke and so on in conversation an amusing conversation might be imagined between two very shrewd persons each wishing to impress the other favorably and therefore each throwing to the other the finest chances in conversation which neither of them accepted so that the conversation on the whole might turn out spiritless and unattractive because each assigned to the other the opportunity of being witty and charming three seventy discharge of indignation the man who meets with a failure attributes this failure rather to the ill-will of another than to fate his irritated feelings are alleviated by thinking that a person and not a thing is the cause of his failure for he can revenge himself on persons but is obliged to swallow down the injuries of fate therefore when anything has miscarried with a prince those about him are accustomed to point out some individual as the ostensible cause who is sacrificed in the interests of all the courtiers for otherwise the prince's indignation would vent itself on them all as he can take no revenge on the goddess of destiny herself three seventy one assuming the colors of the environment why are likes and dislikes so contagious that we can hardly live near a very sensitive person without being filled like a hogshead with his fors and againsts in the first place complete forbearance of judgment is very difficult and sometimes absolutely intolerable to our vanity it has the same appearance as poverty of thought and sentiment or as timidity and unmanliness and so we are at least driven on to take a side perhaps contrary to our environment if this attitude gives greater pleasure to our pride as a rule however and this is the second point we are not conscious of the transition from indifference to liking or disliking but we gradually accustom ourselves to the sentiments of our environment and because sympathetic agreement and acquiescence are so agreeable we soon wear all the signs and party colors of our surroundings three seventy two irony irony is only permissible as a pedagogic expedient on the part of a teacher when dealing with his pupils its purpose is to humble and to shame but in the wholesome way that causes good resolutions to spring up and teaches people to show honor and gratitude as they would to a doctor to him who has so treated them the ironical man pretends to be ignorant and does it so well that the pupils conversing with him are deceived and in their firm belief in their own superior knowledge they grow bold and expose all their weak points they lose their cautiousness and reveal themselves as they are until all of a sudden the light which they have held up to the teacher's face casts its rays back very humiliatingly upon themselves where such a relation as that between teacher and pupil does not exist irony is a rudeness and a vulgar conceit all ironical writers count on the silly species of human beings who like to feel themselves superior to all others in common with the author himself whom they look upon as the mouthpiece of their arrogance moreover the habit of irony like that of sarcasm spoils the character it gradually fosters the quality of a malicious superiority one finally grows like a snappy dog that has learnt to laugh as well as to bite 
three seventy three arrogance there is nothing one should so guard against as the growth of the weed called arrogance which spoils all one's good harvest for there is arrogance in cordiality in showing honour in kindly familiarity in caressing and friendly counsel in acknowledgment of faults in sympathy for others and all these fine things arouse aversion when the weed in question grows up among them the arrogant man that is to say he who desires to appear more than he is or passes for always miscalculates it is true that he obtains a momentary success inasmuch as those with whom he is arrogant generally give him the amount of honour that he demands owing to fear or for the sake of convenience but they take a bad revenge for it inasmuch as they subtract from the value which they hitherto attach to him just as much as he demands above that amount there is nothing for which men ask to be paid dearer than for humiliation the arrogant man can make his really great merits so suspicious and small in the eyes of others that they tread on it with dusty feet if at all we should only allow ourselves a proud manner where we are quite sure of not being misunderstood and considered as arrogant as for instance with friends and wives for in social intercourse there is no greater folly than to acquire a reputation for arrogance it is still worse than not having learnt to deceive politely three seventy four tete a tete private conversation is the perfect conversation because everything the one person says receives its particular colouring its tone and its accompanying gestures out of strict consideration for the other person engaged in the conversation it therefore corresponds to what takes place in intercourse by letter viz that one and the same person exhibits ten kinds of psychical expression according as he writes now to this individual and now to that one in duologue there is only a single refraction of thought the person conversed with produces it as the mirror in whom we want to behold our thoughts anew in their finest form but how is it when there are two or three or even more persons conversing with one conversation then necessarily loses something of its individualizing subtlety different considerations thwart and neutralize each other the style which pleases one does not suit the taste of another in intercourse with several individuals a person has therefore to withdraw within himself and represent facts as they are but he has also to remove from the subjects the pulsating ether of humanity which makes conversation one of the pleasantest things in the world listen only to the tone in which those who mingle with whole groups of men are in the habit of speaking it is as if the fundamental base of all speech were it is myself i say this so make what you will of it that is the reason why clever ladies usually leave a singular painful and forbidding impression on those who have met them in society it is the talking to many people before many people that robs them of all intellectual amiability and shows only their conscious dependence on themselves their tactics and their intention of gaining a public victory in full light whilst in a private conversation the same ladies become womanly again and recover their intellectual grace and charm three seventy five posthumous fame there is sense in hoping for recognition in a distant future only when we take it for granted that mankind will remain essentially unchanged and that whatever is great is not for one age only but will be looked upon as great for all time but this is an error in all their sentiments and judgments concerning what is good and beautiful mankind have greatly changed it is mere fantasy to imagine oneself to be a mile ahead and that the whole of mankind is coming our way besides a scholar who is misjudged may at present reckon with certainty that his discovery will be made by others and that at best it will be allowed to him later on by some historian that he also already knew this or that but was not in a position to secure the recognition of his knowledge not to be recognized is always interpreted by posterity as lack of power in short one should not so readily speak in favour of haughty solitude there are however exceptional cases but it is chiefly our faults weakness and follies that hinder the recognition of our great qualities three seventy six of friends just consider with thyself how different are the feelings how divided are the opinions of even the nearest acquaintances how even the same opinions in thy friend's mind have quite a different aspect and strength from what they have in thine own and how manifold are the occasions which arise from misunderstanding and hostile severance after all this thou wilt say to thyself how insecure is the ground upon which all our alliances and friendships rest how liable to cold downpours and bad weather how lonely is every creature when a person recognizes this fact and in addition that all opinions and the nature and strength of them in his fellow-men are just as necessary and 
irresponsible as their actions when his eye learns to see this internal necessity of opinions owing to the indissoluble interweaving of character occupation talent and environment he will perhaps get rid of the bitterness and sharpness of the feeling with which the sage exclaims friends there are no friends much rather will he make the confession to himself yes there are friends but they were drawn towards thee by error and deception concerning thy character and they must have learnt to be silent in order to remain thy friends for such human relationships almost always rest on the fact that some few things are never said are never indeed alluded to but if these pebbles are set rolling friendship follows afterwards and is broken are there any who would not be mortally injured if they were to learn what their most intimate friends really knew about them by getting a knowledge of ourselves and by looking upon our nature as a changing sphere of opinions and moods and thereby learning to despise ourselves a little we recover once more our equilibrium with the rest of mankind it is true that we have good reason to despise each of our acquaintances even the greatest of them but just as good reason to turn this feeling against ourselves and so we will bear with each other since we bear with ourselves and perhaps there will come to each a happier hour when he will exclaim friends there are really no friends thus cried the expiring old sophist foes there is really no foe thus shout i the incarnate fool End of division six